Convocation will now come to order. Roll call. Hansen? Here. Meek? Here. Myers? Here. Peterson? Here. Ray, I believe, is on a flight. Correct by Mr. Blair Williams? Here. Weininger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving right into item number three or excuse me, item number four, acceptance of agenda, and the recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Williams. Second. Second by Myers. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. aye. Uh, Myers was an aye with her mic off. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Passed six to zero. And over to Superintendent Kane for our DCSD spotlight. Okay, good evening, everyone. We have a lot to celebrate tonight um, and so many reasons to be proud here in Douglas County School District. So tonight we are honoring both uh, amazing students and staff. So let's start with our two students who were named the 2023 Daniels Fund Scholarship recipients. This is a very big deal. The Daniels Fund Scholarship provides a four-year college scholarship to students who demonstrate a strength of character, leadership potential, a commitment to serving their communities, academic performance or promise, a well-rounded personality, and emotional maturity and stability. Will our 2023 Daniel Scholars and their school leaders please join me up front and I'm going to call your names. From Legend High School, we have Sienna Rojas. Come on up, Sienna. Let's give her a round of applause. Hi, Sienna. She will be joined by Principal Jason Jacob. Um, is Kristen Jury here? Yep, and Kristen, there you are. Don't have my glasses on, sorry about that. And Kristen Jury from the Parker Region. First of all, congratulations. That is really, really exciting, Sienna. Tell us a little bit about what that means for you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'm really excited about it. It will allow me to have a lot of money towards my education um, so that I will be able to get my major and uh, have a lot of opportunities that I'm really grateful for. So I'm definitely very excited about it. Yes. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Jason and Kristen. Well, she, she forgot a few things. So. so. <laughs> Other than being an amazing young lady, she's a quite the actress who just got done with Mamma Mia, and she was a part of that, and every single show was sold out, and Cena was a part of that, but just also just the, what she brings to our school through the hallways with our student population, she's uh, amazing. Uh, but you forgot to say where you're going, so tell everybody where you're going, because it's quite a feat in itself. Uh, I'm going to Stanford University. So Stanford. I, I can't pronounce specifically what she wants to study. We're talking about it a little bit. So what are you going to major in or what do you want to do? Um, it's called biomedical computation. <laughs> All right. So just a, a brilliant young lady that is going to change the world with um, just obviously her smarts, her intelligence, but most impersonal, her personality and who she is as a person. So I don't know, Kristen, if there's anything you want to add. Yeah. You know, at Sienna, from pioneer to Cimarron to legend, you have wowed us the entire way. We can't see what, what you do in your future. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to have you stay up here. And we are going to have, from Mountain Vista High School, we're going to have Talia Reading join us, along with her principal, Rob Segley and Danny Windsor, assistant superintendent. So come on up. <laughs> Talia, congratulations. All right, your turn, Talia. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what this means for you? Um, it's an unbelievable blessing and honor to be recognized by the Douglas, I mean, by uh, the Daniels Fund. Um, I'm super excited for it and just super blessed that they have invested in my future. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about what this means for you and for Mountain Vista and most importantly, how proud you are of this young lady. Sure. Uh, Talia's an amazing kid. She's, I've known her for four years uh, and her family for even longer. She's super involved. Uh, she's one of the few rare three-sport varsity athletes. 
uh, in our building still. She's been a leadership kid for fall, uh, four years and uh, just fen a phenomenal person in our community. So uh, we're very proud of her. Uh, we're proud of all you do. Uh, we had prom on Friday and Talia is in our uh, criminal justice and forensics programs in Douglas County. She had to get up the day after prom at 5 a.m. to go on a ride along. Uh, prom hair fully intact, I heard along the way. So uh, what a great, well-rounded kid and we're so proud of her. Well, as you can tell within the, the first five seconds you meet these two, I do not know them, but your humility is just contagious. Obviously, this is very little to do as far as of wanting the attention, but about the impact you're going to have on this world. And so just seeing you um, understanding what the Daniel Scholarship truly represents, this is for folks to understand, this is not a, a likely thing that happens for students. And so to talk about the scale of this, I do want to really highlight the amazing efforts you put in, the service you put in. This isn't just about academics. This is about how you serve your community and your leadership as well, too. Thank you for serving our community. Thank you for your humility. And we can't wait to follow your story. Truly a special congratulations to both of you ladies. You are amazing. President Peterson and Director Hansen are here with your certificates. And we'll do a quick photo. Absolutely. Parents, come on up and get a really good photo. Yeah. Be, don't be shy. And congratulations to you, too, for raising such amazing young ladies. Okay, well, we're going to stay for parents. There we go. <laughs> Congratulations Thank again, you. ladies. Congratulations. So exciting. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next, we want to celebrate a huge achievement for one of our middle schools. Would the following people please join me up front? Sagewood Middle School Principal, Ben Dardan, come on up here. Suzette Remy, Janelle Winders, and Kim Wu, who are Sagewood Middle School counselors. Ladies, come on up. Renee Cauley, Team Lead, Health and Wellness and Prevention. And Kristen Dury from the Parker, the Executive Director of Schools for the Parker Region. So, Sagewood Middle School received the 2022 Recognized Ask a Model Program or RAMP designation from the American School Counselor Association. Now, as a, as a former school leader myself, I know what a big deal this is, as our school worked for years to continue and is still working towards this designation. It takes a lot of work by a lot of people. Sagewood had previously received the RAMP designation and was one of only 15 schools across the country to receive the re-RAMP designation in 2022, meaning Sagewood will maintain its RAMP designation for another five years. Again, one of only 15 schools across our entire country. Sagewood, overall, Sagewood is one of 101 schools across 21 states to receive a 2022 uh, ramp designation at all and only one of three schools in the state of Colorado. Congratulations. I know this is a huge accomplishment for all of you, but most importantly, it is your kids that are impacted by this designation and by all of the work that goes behind it with your counseling team. So Ben, why don't you tell us a little bit about this, what this means to you and we will pass the microphone on down. Absolutely. I'm just so proud of my team here. We, I started at Sagewood five years ago and when I got to Sagewood, they quickly told me what, what it meant to be a school counselor because I honestly had no idea what they did and they showed me the Sagewood way, uh, which is, we take care of our kids, we keep all kids safe, but we're not just about that. We're about improving academic goals for kids, behavior, attendance goals, keeping kids in school, and data drives all their work. Uh, and so it has been an amazing thing to watch them uh, shape our, our counseling program through the Ask a National Model. It's something that I think all schools should be looking at because it, it's best for every single kid in my building uh, because of the work that they do. So I'm so proud of them. 
I'm going to pass yeah. it down. Oh, goodness. No. He covered it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Renee Cullen, come on. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. Um, besides, as you can tell, um, this is more than a team. It's a family. And being able to work with them and see them grow, including Ben, um, <laughs> has been quite the feat. Um, and so it it is really spectacular to be standing with them again here this year. So thank you. Great. You all have worked so hard for such a long time. And I just want to thank you for your passion for doing what's right for kids. Incredible. Thank you. All right. A huge congratulations once again to Sagewood. And ladies, thank you so much for the work that you do for every individual student at Sagewood. Thank you so much. Um, Director Williams is here with your certificate. All right, and we'll do a picture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations to Sagewood. Okay. Finally, we are so proud to have Dr. Chris Page come up here. Dr. Page, come on up. I'm going to talk about you when you get here. Come on up. Dr. Page here has been selected as the high school principal of the year for the entire state of Colorado by the Colorado Association of School Executives. Now, as many of you know, Dr. Page has a really long history in our district, um, but I want to tell a couple of little stories. So I'm out in the community a lot, of course, over the last several years, but a lot over the last year. And I can't tell you how many random people I have run into who have said, oh my goodness, Douglas County Schools, let me tell you about Chris Page and how much Chris Page changed my kid's life, whether it was how much you were paying attention to a student when you were an assistant principal, a dean, I even heard about you as a teacher. Like, I have heard it all. Um, it is amazing how many kids Chris Page has really impacted their lives. And of course, his amazing work at the Highlands Ranch High, Sch Highlands Ranch High School of which has its own tie. Wow, that is awesome. Um, we are just incredibly proud of Dr. Page and how he represents our school district. And to win High School Principal of the Year is just an enormous honor for Dr. Page. It's an enormous honor for Douglas County Schools to have Dr. Page in our district. Thank you so much, Dr. Page, for everything that you do. And I, I want to give you a chance to talk as well. But please know that we are incredibly proud of you. And I'm actually going to have Assistant Superintendent Danny Windsor come up here because he has a lot to say as well. But Dr. Page, why don't you tell me what this means for you? I can't believe you gave me a mic to talk as much as I want to. So, uh, <laughs> I know. Um, you know, th there's a number of things that have been rattling through my brain since this happened. Um, first and foremost, when they let us know that I had won, I thought, man, there's no possible way. I mean, I think when you think about the Colorado Principal of the Year, Principal of the Year in general, I think it's someone who's like curing cancer while they're running an assembly. Um, and I'm just like, I don't know how in the world I even got selected. And one of my friends pointed out there are over 640 high school principals in the state of Colorado and what what an honor it is and what a time to, to really soak that in. For me, it is just such a representation of all of us. Um, and when I say all of us, I mean, you know, the people at Highlands Ranch High School, my community, my staff, my kids, and all the people throughout Douglas County. I mean, I had the chance to be raised here basically as an educator. Um, my student taught here and my entire career has been in Douglas County. Um, and all the people around me um, from the board through all of the different uh, struggles we've had um, for all things that are DCSD, it, it has been amazing. And I just hope that I can continue to represent our district, um, our work, and the good work we've done through the years, whether it be equity or anything else, and continue to move that stuff forward so that Douglas County shines above all others. So thank you guys so much for this honor. And don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. 
I know Assistant Superintendent Windsor, as well as Executive Director of Schools, John Gutierrez, have a lot to say about you as well. So I want to give them a chance to hold the mic and talk about you as well. Um, John, why don't you go first? Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Congratulations, Dr. Page. It's so well-deserved. Uh, you're a tremendous leader in Douglas County uh, at Highlands Ranch High School. It's been fantastic to work with you. A uh, little story, we were together for a long time in the Highlands Ranch feeder. Uh, what I really come to appreciate about you is your passion for kids, for families, for students. You care about what they learn and who they become. You make Douglas County a great place to work and learn. Thank you and congratulations. We're very proud of you. you bet. Well, I'm not sure Chris wants me to have the mic talking about him. Um, we've known each other for obviously a very long time. I think first thing that comes to mind about Chris Page, Dr. Page, um, he's an advocate for kids. He's an advocate for his teachers. Um, and the one thing that you will always find is he's really low energy, doesn't like to run around the hall, doesn't care about relationships, any of that stuff at all. Um, with all sincerity, the one thing you find about Dr. Page is um, he wants to get to know you and he wants to get to know your story and he wants to see you be successful more than anything. And so what I've appreciated about, about Chris, my friend for a long time here, is about how much um, he wants this community to be a better place and, and to make sure that just doesn't happen while he's there, but for generations to come. And so thank you for your commitment to our students of today and for our students of tomorrow. We greatly appreciate it. How about a, a huge round of applause for Dr. Page? And Director Meek would love to give you your certificate. Yes, it's not customary, but I just want to say congratulations to Dr. Page. And we, on, on behalf of the board, I just want to tell you what an honor it is to have you representing the state of Colorado as you go out and maybe the national principal of the year. Who knows? We're rooting for you. Me too. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thank you. We're, yes, absolutely. Where's Dr. Page's wife and daughter? Please come on up and join us for pictures. Why don't you introduce your beautiful wife? Oh, uh, as, as you guys know, uh, we're, we're only as strong as the people who support us at, and every single day, my wife and my daughter. My wife is Kelly Page. She works at base um, at Redstone Elementary, and she does an amazing job of supporting our family, supporting our district, supporting kids. Um, and then my daughter, Celie Page, um, she goes to the Highland Ranch High School, which is fantastic. Um, and she is uh, arguably one of my biggest supporters every single day in and out of the halls, and just um, they make my life better. And so I know. Sometimes uh, they make my life better, and uh, and hopefully I help make our community and your kids' lives better. You sure do, Dr. Page. All right. All right, one last round of applause for all of our awardees. Thanks. And that concludes our recognitions. Thank you. And we will move right into superintendent reports, uh, superintendent's update. All right, um, I do have some superintendent updates tonight, so um, in no particular order. Uh, last week, we um, the Douglas County Special Education Council, or DCCAC, handed out their Shining Stars baskets. They had over 400 nominations for Shining Stars, and Shining Stars um, indicates anyone who has had a positive impact on a student with a disability in our system. The DCCAC randomly drew 22 um, from the 400 nominations and delivered baskets. Um, 
As staff, we greatly appreciate the DC SEAC for honoring those that have had a positive impact. And 400 nominations, as I understand it, is the most that they have ever received. And so fantastic job to our entire special education community. Um, Let's see, last week we had the English language development celebration. I think I talked about it at the last board meeting that I was that we were about to attend. Over 700 attended the um, English language development celebration. I am not sure anything in our district has ever been attended by 700 people in person. Absolutely amazing. There was a lot to do for the families in attendance. Um, there were a lot of performances by our students, a lot of activities, translators on hand for our families that needed some translation. It was just a fantastic way for our community to come together. Um, and I wanna give a huge shout out to Remy Rummel, uh, Becky Core, and their entire team for all the incredible work that they did to put together the ELD celebration. Um, we had a reunification exercise yesterday. Um, we had a reunification exercise from Chaparral High School to Southeast Christian, as well as Highlands Ranch High School to Cherry Hills um, Church. We want to thank both Southeast Christian and Cherry Hills for volunteering their facilities to help us with potential reunification. We definitely want to thank our law enforcement partners. All of our law enforcement partners participated in the reunification exercise along with DCSD, safety and security, district staff, community partners, um, and our SRO supervisors. And the reunification went um, really well. And we continue to work with our law enforcement partners on all kinds of safety exercises to make sure that um, we maintain a level of readiness here in Douglas County Schools to keep our kids safe. Um, on the transportation side, we're, we continue to be really proud of our transportation department for bending over backwards to minimize the number of cancellations um, for our routes. This uh, last couple of weeks, we were able to make some upgrades to our transportation staff break rooms where they now have um, some games and nice tables and even massage chair inserts available to them um, as we work to retain our amazing transportation staff and be able to continue to attract new staff. It is prom season in Douglas County, so um, congratulations to all of our kids and families participating in prom. Everybody be careful out there. The Douglas County Youth Initiative um, hosted their annual DC Outstanding Youth Awards um, this last week. They honored youth throughout the county. The award recognized students who are between 13 and 19 and have made a really big difference and have overcome um, challenging issues. Um, following the awards, there was a dessert reception held complete with celebration cakes, which with each um, youth's name listed in icing. So they had their cake and they got to eat it too. Um, and then also last Saturday, almost 70 students in grades four through eight participated in a full day of art workshops with local art teachers and artists. Students had an opportunity to create art, dialogue with one another and art experts in an interview process and showcase their art for students, staff and families. Um, as part of our commitment to surfacing and nurturing potential in each of our students, artists and art teachers from across our community were invited to recommend up to three young artists to participate. Each artist will receive a written review of their art form from a local art expert. Uh, many of them are in the final stages of the gifted identification project uh, process, and for some, this opportunity will initiate that process, thanks to Advanced Academics for hosting this amazing opportunity. Um, we did have our big professional development day yesterday. Um, so staff, uh, licensed teachers across our district participated in professional development to further the education of all of our students here in Douglas County. I had the opportunity to um, present to 3,400 staff in one day by going through eight of our feeder areas, um, one was combined, and presenting um, about the state of our district, some of the amazing things our district has accomplished, as well as how funding works for Douglas County Schools to just kind of get um, a common message across all of our staff. I also really wanna thank the board members who um, were able to participate yesterday 
It really makes a difference when our staff sees you in person and knows how much each and every one of you are fighting for them. Thank you so much for participating. Um, we have our retirement ceremony next Wednesday at the Legacy Campus at 5.30 p.m. We will be celebrating just over 130 retirees. Um, so we're excited to celebrate them and their long careers, mostly here in Douglas County. And finally, I had the opportunity to speak to the student advisory group this last week um, about funding. In addition to getting feedback um, around the um, educational equity work, I was able to speak to the student advisory group all about how the taxes work and how our schools were funded. And they were just amazing. They were so engaged. And afterwards, I had a line of students um, wanting to come up and talk to me about taxes and about funding and, and share their creative ideas. Um, it was really, really amazing and I could not possibly have enjoyed it more. That concludes superintendent updates. Okay, thank you, Superintendent Kane. Next, we'll move on to item number nine, which is public comment. The purpose of public comment is to balance the ability to hear diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout the district while allowing our Board of Education to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. Time has been adjusted to allow all speakers the opportunity to speak during the allotted time for public comment. This evening, two minutes will be allotted for each speaker. When speaking, please remain respectful and address the board rather than the guests or staff in the room. To respect a speaker's free speech, please do not interrupt them while they are at the podium providing comments. You will have a 15 second notice prior to the end of your time so you can wrap up comments. When your time's up, please leave the podium. If the audience wants to react between speakers, feel free to do so while being respectful and honoring the next speaker's time to speak. Please do not engage speakers or other audience members in a disruptive manner. Attendees who create a disturbance or disrupt speakers will be asked to leave the room after a prior warning. With that, we will start with our students. And we have uh, Nevea Granzi, followed by Jeremiah Granzi, followed by Ella Ditzler. Our students here. here. Thank you so much. <coughs> Hi, my name is Nevea Ganzi and I have attended four different Douglas County schools and the same problem remains with racial discrimination and I was told that adults, students, and the schooling environment is supposed to be a safe place where students should feel like they can be themselves, but being myself has not only brought me racial discrimination, but it has put me in a position where I was being targeted for something I simply can't control. While attending Mesa Middle School, a child, a child of a teacher that works for this district, I'm gonna excuse my language because this is very vulgar, but I feel it needs to be said. I was called um, a nigger on the bus by multiple different students. And I informed the bus driver and no punishment was given. In fact, it continued from all of his friends. And while attending Cast Rock Middle School, I not only got this discrimination from students, but from staff as well. I, w I went to the principal and any adult that I can help, uh, that can help me give these students the needed guidance. I was told that these students would have consequences and they were never given, but rather brushed under the rug. While attending Douglas County High School, I was put in a debate by a teacher discussing whether you are for the Jim Crow laws or against the Jim Crow laws. I was put on the side that was for the Jim Crow laws. I informed the teacher that I was uncomfortable with this multiple times. And until the debate actually happened and I discussed that I was no longer going to be debating unless I was put to the other side was when she put me to the other side. In conclusion, I hope my sister's story, my brother's story, and my story is enough to alarm every single one of you. And I think I speak for every student who has faced racial discrimination and hate crime when I say I'm devastated that this, is, that this district has yet to do anything about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Grancy. Now Jeremiah Grancy, Ella Ditzler, followed by Lacey Grancy. Is Jeremiah here. Hi, my name is Jeremiah Ganzi. I'm a resident in Castle Rock and a student in Castle Rock Middle School. 
And I'm standing here speaking with you today to shed some light on a problem that's been spreading throughout Douglas County Schools, and that is racism. It's beginning to spread across our community, affecting many people of African American descent, including me. Rather than being a stable and respectful learning environment, schools are beginning to become places of hate, and the use of derogatory slurs, stereotypes, and terms are rising among the students. We are very disappointed with this behavior in our town's people and schools. I've heard too much racial discrimination online in schools and across town from multiple people, and this needs to come to light and be treated as more than a joke. This shouldn't be treated as a normal situation, and everyone, no matter their looks, opinions, or differences, should be treated with respect, especially in schools. I feel that, our, I feel that my school, Castle Rock Middle School, along with many others, should have some redirection on how we treat fellow students. I'm just disappointed that this happens so often, and if it keeps coming from students, it's paving a pathway for younger students, and it'll become a norm, and it should not be treated as a normal situation. I just ask that hate speech be taken more seriously in our district to make the environment more welcoming for students now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Francie. <laughs> Student Ella Ditzler, followed by Lacey Granzi, and then Lacey Ditzler. Is Ella here? Hi, my name is Ella Ditzler and I am a sophomore at Legend High School and I'm here to voice my concerns on the proposed revisions to the policy JLDA student mental health services in the school setting and JLDAR. We all know that adolescents and children go through lots of struggles in their school years, whether it be academics, social difficulties, family problems, or mental health problems. It's not always easy for teenagers or children to go to their parents or guardians for ask for help. This could lead them to feel alone and that there's nowhere to turn to and in turn take them out on themselves. I'm not going to go through my whole story, but I've had a lot of struggles this year with my mental health and it has led me to be hospitalized twice. I've grown up in a household that I know I could talk to, but I've always had trouble opening up in fear of being judged, a burden, or something else. My school counselor, Libby Gleason, is one of the people who, has always been oh my God. who I've always been comfortable to reaching out to. Ms. Gleason was one of the first people I, that I told about my struggles and she helped guide me to the right way to tell my mom about things and the next steps for when I really felt unsafe. I can honestly say that she's a big part of why I'm alive right now. I know I'm fortunate enough to have a household behind me that I know I, uh, but I know a lot of people don't. Having parents give written consent for the counselor to provide assistance to the student turns a huge support system away from them that they should have easy access to otherwise. Struggling for mental health, with mental health shouldn't be a crime, and students should have the opportunity to go ask for help. The school counselors don't groom us, they, they just help us. I go in there every day, and they don't have the time to groom us or do anything to help us, or do anything other than help us. They help with school advice, they help with personal advice, they help us advocate for ourselves when we don't have the voice to. So in conclusion, in conclusion, see, oh, you got it. You're okay. You're okay. Just take a breath. You got it. You're okay. It's okay. You did great. Thank you, Ms. Ditzler. Lacey Grancy, Lacey Ditzler, followed by Barbara Lochran. Good evening. Uh, you have already heard two of my children speak with one more to come. And I stand before this school district for what I am hoping is the very last time. As a mother of three amazing children that who unfortunately have been all a victim of what I thought I was bringing them to this town to protect them from. I am native to Castle Rock, also a graduate of class of 2001, where I saw this in my lifetime at Douglas County High School as well. On April 20th, 2023, my life as a mother in this town changed forever. My son fell victim to a heinous hate crime, one that I was not even prepared to go into. 
I wish I was sharing this as my only experience with DCSD and having to seek administration, but over the course of five years, I've seen this far too often. This time it became criminal, and my, so, my son no longer has a safe place to go to school. He is a brilliant student in the AP program. He is unable to return to school five days later while his assailant is still in school. Five days, Douglas County, and still no resolution. When does my son, the victim's education, become important? So I ask for what I hope is the very last time. When is enough enough? When will this community recognize there is no clear definition between bullying and a hate crime in your handbook? When I sit before the administrators and they talk about bullying, 15 seconds remaining, it is not clear that a hate crime is going to be convicted. Douglas County, how do children have empathy for something they are not educated on? Every victim should have access to a victim advocate that is educated in this specialty. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Nancy. Next is Lacey Ditzler, followed by Barbara Lochran, followed by Amity Wicks. Ms. Ditzler. Thank you. I'm here to voice my concerns about the proposed changes to the policy JICB Prevention of Bullying. I'm a mother who has sat with my daughter twice in an ER watching her struggle with mental health. Through that journey, I have seen that our story, unfortunately, is not unique, and each story contains at least one or more accounts of bullying. I have two concerns with these changes that seem to be taken directly from outside interest groups. My first and biggest concern is lumping the victims of bullying into the same disciplinary track as their aggressors. I would like to know your justification and statistics that show how many cases of, quote, retaliation against an aggressor have occurred. And that's what bullying is. It is trauma. And no matter how the victim reacts, it should be treated as such. My second concern is that bullying often comes from somewhere and can be a sign of deeper issues for the one committing the act. Your proposed changes have made a very detailed policy vague, and the only actions you make clear are suspension, expulsion, and law enforcement. The rest you are leaving once again to the superintendent to figure out, but are asking these huge changes to be made without getting any, giving any information. Not to mention your other proposed changes to policies tonight seem to signal you are not interested in the true case, true cause and effect of bullying, and that is mental health. Your changes will make it harder to prove there is an issue, increase the amount of time the bully has access to their victim, victim shame, and with such extreme forms of discipline with no other options having been made clear, you will only make life worse for all involved and never get to the heart remaining. of what the issue is. And more mothers and caregivers will be sitting in cold waiting rooms in hard plastic chairs bolted to the floor, watching their child just a shell of themselves fading, all the while praying that a place will be available soon to keep their child safe from themselves. Because these are students, not political pawns. These are children, not criminals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Barbara Lochran, Amity Wicks, then Karen Pennington. Ms. Lochran. Hello, Superintendent Kane and Board of Directors. I want to address the new step in lane schedule. While I applaud the district for the hard work done to improve pay for all staff and to have pay be more equitable, I have a dichotomy. When I entered the district in 2011, I was a 19 year veteran school psychologist who was granted 12 years on the step in lane schedule. Although it was a big pay cut, I accepted the offer as I was excited to work in DCSD and I knew I would build my steps back up. However, with the new salary schedule, I am being told that the 12 years I originally given were given are no longer counted as the district is now only granting seven years of external experience. This feels like an arbitrary and punitive rule that should not apply to employees like myself who are hired before this new practice and before the market pay system. When I first heard about this aspect of the new pay system, I was worried as an employee, as a parent, as a homeowner, that it would be a poor recruitment tool for veteran quality educators to transfer into DCSD. However, it never entered my mind that it would subtract years from employees hired years earlier. I did not get the, my full credit when I was hired at 19 years, but I agreed to that. But I am not sure why the years I was originally granted 
are now being further reduced by five years. I've been a public educator for 31 years, and I just want to be paid for the years I was originally granted by DCSD. I want to be valued like my district colleagues, very needed mental health providers, as we see, with whom I was pacing along for over a decade, but who are now several steps ahead of, ahead of me. I wonder how the board and the community view this. I am close to retirement, and as an educator, remaining. every salary increase or decrease greatly impacts my final outcome. I was so excited for the big salary improvement, and yet I now feel that I'm left out of fully realizing the financial benefits of our new system. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lochran. <laughs> Amity Wicks, Karen Pennington, followed by Kevin Lung. Ms. Wicks. True respect of diversity focuses on different aspects of every walk of life. It doesn't systematically demean based on immutable characteristics. I am in support of some of the changes made to the equity policy, but concerned about that autonomy of each school could still do damage to our children. Case in point, last week, Thunder Ridge High School hosted an event focusing on so-called diversity. We witnessed incredibly divisive and this, uh, content and the singling out and demeaning of one race, villainization of one gender, and criticism of one religion. In the, um, is the point of celebrating diversity to have a true exchange and examination of ideas and to create unity? I ask this because this kind of presentation was none of those things. It's not only to divide and foster animosity, resentment, and hostility toward others who may not share similar, review, similar views. The message that was delivered was in no way unifying the student body. This is not a freedom of speech issue. We all respect that, right? But when you examine how this event was brought together, you see that it was actually school sponsored and its administration, staff, and faculty were all involved in planning and incentivizing participation. In fact, the students were bribed by a graduation requirement of service hours and offered five hours when it was planned for three, communicating both a lack of respect for that requirement by usurping the standards, communicating bias and special value for this event over others, and dishonesty because no service was actually performed formed by students who were not presenting. Diversity is an important part of the fabric of this country, and our differences are something that should be indeed celebrated, but that is not what some of these activists are striving for. The Thunder Ridge event and the approach of many activists focused on the persecution and demonization of one group in an effort to build up another. That's not what this country is about, and it shouldn't be found in education either. Thank you, Ms. Wicks. Karen Pennington, Kevin Lung, followed by Tina De Los Santos. Board members, Superintendent Kane, thank you for your service. I'm Karen Pennington. I'm a nurse educator and grandparent to five children in the district. I am not in favor of the ADB policy adopted in March of 21, and I'm asking that it be rewritten for the following reasons. ADB appears to be a Trojan horse to introduce critical race theory into the district. The wording under inclusion is very CRT. Welcome all individuals and groups of individuals with different identities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The possibility of grouping children based on these arbitrary, mostly involuntary characteristics is a huge concern. In the past, grouping of people has proven disastrous and encourages racism. Think of hideous slavery grouping blacks along color, Holocaust grouping Jews along religion. Children are more than a single characteristic. They are the sum of their parts, not defined by one part. ADB appears to be a, pol a policing of bad behaviors, is very broad and open to personal bias and interpretation based on these characteristics. It offers an equity advisory council with minimal oversight and much power. This council is itself open to bias and a power grab. Will parents see or vote on recommendations of this council? If not, ADB would be undermining the parents that overwhelmingly said no to CRT for Douglas County Schools. Equity is about same outcomes. We cannot ensure outcomes. Equality is same access. Mentioned only once remaining. and not defined. Your definition of equity reads as equality. Please clarify. We state we want our children to reach their potential. Then children should be known for content of character, not color of skin or religion or gender. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Pennington, Kevin Lung, Tina De Los Santos, 
and Nancy KT. Well, presidents, I hear the ping of some of the students' voice because when I went for elections in 2021, your supporters call me unqualified because I don't speak English. The board set the tone. By holding the equity policy hostage for the past 70 months that you're in power, you tell people that is special ed, minority, economic disadvantaged student or English learner that they don't matter. I don't need you to be in the same level as the rest of the students. 50 principals and 14 central administrators signed a letter on January 25th, 2022 to support the equity policy. You pay hand over $125,000 and they, we saw, draw the same conclusions that there's no major dissatisfactions with the equity policy. Your campaign promise in 2021 also said that you support the equity policy. You handpick superintendents recommend no changes. You fire superintendent wise with no cost and resulted in $832,000 settlement because Corey wanted to do the right thing. You failed the MLL and bond, you violated the open record law and waste DCSD taxpayers over $100,000 to defend the lawsuits. Today, you're talking about another payout. What have you done to help all students besides having one scandal after the others? And the four obstacles are against the equity policy that's supposed to help the student at DCSD to be able to be able to remaining. successful and get good and graduated just like you know, their other peers, everybody deserves to be successful. All students in DCSD deserve a chance. Please implement the equity policy as written. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. <laughs> Tina De Los Santos, Nancy Katie, followed by Matt Cassidy. Ready? Awesome. Um, in regards to JLDA, the revised vision or the revision of it, paragraph page one, paragraph five, page two, paragraph two, I take issue with shall not be subject to consent procedures and removes parental consent. Both of these paragraphs have removed parental consent in order to mess with the child's mental health. Parents and guardians have the absolute and inalienable authority over their children's medical care, both physically and mentally, not a government school or staff. We cannot trust you with children's mental health if you have proven time and again that you do not have our children's best interests in mind. Two examples, parents beg this school district, specifically Meeks, Hanson, and Ray, to remove masking of children. Testimony after testimony of parents explaining the deterioration of the child's mental health fell upon deaf ears, and why? Because you chose to sell their mental health to the highest bidder for both state and federal funding. When Parker Police notified me of a child who had been hospitalized for both suicidal and homicidal actions and thoughts and has set his sights on my daughter, I reached out to the high school she was supposed to start attending to get a safety plan in place. Principal didn't return my call. School resources officers didn't return my call. I was pushed down the line to a social and emotional counselor for the high school. After providing the police report that stated the child carries a weapon and disbowels animals for emotional release and wanted to murder my child, the counselor's response was that there were too many students to keep my daughter safe and she would create a safe space in the event that my daughter ever felt scared. How was my daughter to even know that she might be in danger when we didn't know that she was in danger until the police notified us? The social and emotional counselor had the audacity to tell me I shouldn't live in fear for my daughter of being in harm for an event that had not happened. Makes me wonder if a similar set of circumstances happened in the Castillo case at STEM, with the STEM shooting. This was during Corey Wise's reign of terror. 15 so seconds So when Evaldi remaining. happened, I called Aaron Kane, who couldn't be bothered to get on the phone with me. So now it's a part of the school board records in the event this child hurts anyone. You will not be able to deny that you knew and hid the details. And David Ray, you interrupted my daughter's public comment to demand clapping to keep a safe space for adults. Thank you, Ms. De Los Santos. Nancy Cady, Matt Cassidy, Sharon Vandal. 
Hi, good evening. I'm here to address educational equity. When my daughter was born, we raised her to love all humans and to never judge a person by the color of their skin. Why are we pushing a person's skin color? Why aren't we celebrating that all human beings are a gift from God and that the content of their character is the most important versus the color of their skin? How did the word equity become so divisive? The word equity in itself means freedom from bias or favoritism. Why would we support anything that leads to the declassification of a human being being forced to show bias or favoritism to a particular skin color? During diversity week at some schools, certain identity groups were prioritized over others. Is that teaching inclusivity and love to all? Students are being encouraged to label themselves as privileged or oppressed. Does that speak equality to you? There is no evidence to support the theory that a focus on equity leads to better academics. There is, however, plenty of evidence that equity policies are incredibly divisive, create a hostile classroom and school culture, and may, in fact, instigate racism and intolerance where none existed before. Let's refocus on teaching our children the fundamentals that will help them to succeed in life and return to basics like reading, writing, math, and respect for all. Our schools have a huge role in our children's lives lives and you can choose to celebrate the content of their character and teach them the skills that will get them through life, or you can force them to first look and judge a person's skin color. Which do you think will help them to succeed and equip them coping with coping skills and to make this world a better place to live? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katie. Matt Cassidy, Sharon Vandal, followed by Holly Horn. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and comment on the ADB equity. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm guessing you're not Matt Cassidy. Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's hard to hear back there. Yeah, it's Mr. Cassidy here. Okay, we'll do Matt Cassidy, Sharon Vandal, then Holly Horn. Thank you. Good evening, directors, Superintendent Kane. I'm here to talk to you tonight about the equity policy, but more so, I'm here to talk to you about love. I know that sounds weird. Uh, it's a term that's been bent and stretched and contorted almost beyond recognition. Love is love, love trumps hate, love is whatever makes you feel good, love is strong affection. The platitudes are innumerable. I grew up with something a little more specific. St. Thomas Aquinas said that to love is to will the good of another. You, you all want what's good for DCSD students, I have no doubt. In that sense, thank you, board and superintendent for taking the time to review the equity policy. I truly believe that for you, it was a labor of love, for you and for the majority of the people who put it together. The majority, but not everybody. Many so-called anti-racist diversity, equity, and inclusion zealots read from the book of Ibram X. Kendi, who teaches, quote, the only remedy for past discrimination is present discrimination, and the only remedy for present discrimination is future discrimination. They don't want the good for the other, they want vengeance. They want it from people who did them no harm merely because of the, what their ancestors might have looked like and where they might have come from. That's the concern with the equity policy. It elevates people, their behaviors, and their outcomes by their group characteristics. We want a policy born of real love that affords each individual the agency to create his or her own path. With academic excellence, truth, and individual accountability in mind, I wanna leave you with a quote that's been on my heart and on my mind as I reviewed this policy and thought about what I would wanna ask of you all. Finally, whatever is, tr whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever 15 is lovely, seconds remaining. whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, end quote. Character, not color of skin, excellence, not immutable characteristics. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Sharon Vandal, Holly Horn, followed by Jason Hurt. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to comment on the ADB education equity policy. The ADB policy states that it would increase and embed into the Douglas County School District education program learning opportunities and experiences that involve four specific things, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. The Douglas County School Board already has an AC non-discrimination equal opportunity policy that covers inclusion and equity, and the JB equal education opportunities policy that covers accessibility. A new policy is not required. 
for those items. The AD policy directly violates the AC policy. The ADB policy states, diversity is the presence of difference within a given setting. In this case, schools and the school district are the settings and the differences typically refer to identities like the races, colors, and ancestries, creeds, etc." end of quote. To implement the policies of presence of difference, one must seek the, these differences. And in seeking these differences, in the dis is a direct violation of your AC policy, which states schools in the district are subject to all federal and state laws and constitutional provisions prohibiting discrimination. The school district is bound to not discriminate based on the very criteria that the ADB policy seeks to implement. The ADB policy also violates the AC policy when it defines representation. Again, these policies require the school board to seek out and identify differences. Thirdly, the ADB policy requests an advisory council that would advise on identity and diversity. The school district would then be asking for an unelected group of people to point out an individual's race, color, and ancestry. 15 seconds The very remaining. thing that prohibits the AC policy. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Vandal, Holly Horn, Jason Hurd, follows, uh, followed by Allison Ridwell. Good evening, board directors and Superintendent Kane. I'm Holly Horn, and I'm here tonight to say great job. The amount of work that goes into filling your seats is enormous, and I'm so grateful. In reviewing the proposed policies to be discussed later tonight, I'm encouraged by the excellent work being done in this district. There are some really outstanding items in proposed policies KBB, ADBR, and JLDA. I especially love that parents will now be made to feel like the valuable assets to their child's education. We know they are. When the school system tries to do too much, it cannot do any one thing exceptionally well. When the school system is responsible for not only academic education, but also for being doctors, therapists, identity sorters, experts on social justice, and even parents to students, it starts to fail everyone on all fronts. At times, the fine line between offering adequate support and tending to matters that require experts on the issues can easily become blurred when the school system isn't allowed to stay in its lane. No wonder so many districts find themselves testing behind academically without some of the guidelines in these proposed policies. We find ourselves overextended and not able to focus on our primary job, academic education. I feel it should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Dividing students into separate groups based on immutable characteristics is not healthy, nor is it wise. Enticing children to participate in indoctrination sessions with the promise of community service hours without parents knowing the content of the session is also not healthy, nor is it wise. Showing preference to any one specific group of students over another, participations in clubs and activities that discourage parent support or involvement, and attempting to educate children on things not just above our pay grade, but certainly above that of one student trying to teach another in a professional setting is not healthy and is not wise. Twisted adaptations of classic little woman women performed on stage by underage minors in our local school is not healthy nor is it wise. Remaining. I am so out of time. I am not at this time calling for complete dissolution of educational equity policy, but I'd like to see more work being done and I trust you for to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Horn. Jason Hurd, Allison Ridwell, followed by Amy Winju. <clears throat> Greetings, Board of Directors and Superintendent Kane. I'm here to talk about the equity policy in, in light of some national issues. I think it's important to consider not only what we have proposed in Douglas County, but what is happening across the nation because very likely these other interpretations might weave their way into the implementation here. Some things to be aware of. The following is a list of school districts around the country that have eliminated honors or AP programs in the name of equity. Barrington, Rhode Island, Madison, Wisconsin, San Diego, San Francisco. If you do a Google search, you'll find a much longer list. It seems to be a national trend, at least in some places. This is an incredibly cynical worldview, an approach that represents the so-called soft bigotry of low expectations. What this essentially says is that certain groups are incapable of achieving, so let's pull everyone down to that level. We cannot allow this corrosive negative approach to our next generation to penetrate the Douglas County educational experience. It may make people, some people feel better, but in the end, we have simply let our children down 
if we force them into groups and then remove educational opportunity in the name of feelings? The questions we need to be asking here are, one, whether this equity policy will be implemented in true spirit of the Douglas County interpretation. Two, whether this equity policy is in fact a Trojan horse, a ruse disguised to knock down academics at a later date. Please, Superintendent Kane and the board, take extra care to craft any wording of implementation to prevent these kinds of things from ever happening in our schools. These foolish and misguided actions speak for themselves, but don't let non-specific wording of implementation allow for these corrosive things to seep into our district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Allison Ridwell, Amy Winju, followed by Jenny Brady. I just apologize, I'm a mess, I'm covered in flour. Efforts to improve schools over the last half century have been built on the foundational principle that all learners are different and that educators should strive to meet their individual needs. Whether it was called individualized education plan, multiple intelligences, differentiated learning, whole child, student-centered learning, the understanding that every student comes with their own unique needs has guided school improvement efforts since way back when I got my master's in special education. Now there is this emergent notion that anti-racist equity policy that rejects those decades of understanding by actively encouraging educators to pick and choose which students to favor academically based solely on immutable characteristics. It actively seeks to prove Ibram Kindi's assertion that the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. When educators are forced to embrace this philosophy through board directive, racism becomes a moral imperative. It should be self-evident that this blind push for equity is stumbling into a truly gruesome place. I'm deeply saddened by the stories some students have told today. I wish I could offer my 50 years of wisdom to help them understand that the rise in racial issues isn't because people are more racist, but because a spotlight has been forced upon immutable differences for the last two years under this policy. Continuing to divide us by those differences as required by equity is the problem, not the solution. Thank you, Ms. Ripko. Amy Winju, Jamie Brady, followed by Deborah Flora. Ms. Winju. Good evening. Um, according to Marian Webster, equity is defined as being fair and impartial. Diversity is the inclusion of people of different races, cultures, etc. In, and in a group. Inclusion is the act or practice of including and accommodating people who have been historically excluded because of their race, gender, sexuality, etc. I bring these definitions up because the diversity, equity, and inclusion words are hot button items for this board. Last week, Thunder Ridge High School held the Cultural Celebration Conference, which was led by the Student Coalition for Racial Equity Club. An addressing framework flyer was presented by the club to 200 plus teens and adults in the audience. This flyer provides an overview of which groups in society have more power and privilege than other groups. Summed up, anyone who is not white, Christian, US born, heterosexual has less power. This club is teaching or rather indoctrinating students with the belief that there are groups of students who are oppressors and other groups who are oppressed. This is straight out of Marxist theory. Moreover, according to this chart, the students at the top for leading oppression are white Christian heterosexual males. I am deeply troubled by this and the potential impact it may have on teen psychology who are now being called oppressors. According to Colorado's Department of Public Health, in 2020 and 2021, there were 94 suicides committed by remaining. teens between the ages of 10 through 19, of which 71% or 67 were young teen males. Of those 67 teen males that committed suicide, 77% or 52 were young white teen males. I request that this board stand against the pinning of one group of students against another. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wingy. Jenny Brady, Deborah Flora, followed by Kaya Griffin. Hi, 
Hi guys, no speech. I just want to let you guys know that in the community, we are very supportive of what you, you four are doing and we're going to continue to be supportive. Even if we're not here every board meeting, we are out in the community supporting what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Deborah Flora, Kaya Griffin, followed by Tammy Fleming. Ms. Flora. Good evening. First of all, I want to start by thanking you all so much for the thoughtful and in-depth approach you've taken on these policies. Almost all the policies are so refreshing and respecting the parents' rights to be the ultimate authority in their children's lives, and also freeing teachers up to focus on education, not indoctrination. There's only one policy that I wish to address tonight with concern, and the very name equity policy shows what needs to be addressed. Equity is focused on equal outcomes, not equal opportunity. Equity is only achieved as children are separated into groups, judged by immutable characteristics, and treated unequally. It is in the name of equity that diversity of thought is silenced. It is under the name of equity that parents' rights are violated. A perfect example is what happened recently at Thunder Ridge High School, a conference where students were given community hours needed for graduation and went to workshops, including ones where students, not medical professionals, led discussions on gender reassignment surgery. Presentations were made about omnisexual and pansexual activities. There was a focus on microaggressions, reparations, identity politics, and white privilege. This is an example of why I wholeheartedly ask the board to eliminate the equity policy and instead pursue a brand new equality policy that does the following. Eliminates the division and shaming of children on immutable characteristics such as race. Notifies parents in advance before any controversial sexual, ideological, or political presentation is made. And lastly, for all of these po policies, parents must be allowed to opt in, not required to opt out. This will be the final final step in not only fully reestablishing trust between parents and educators, but it will also lead to a full return of the golden triangle of education, where parents and teachers partner together remaining. for the flourishing of children. Thank you all so much for your hard work, for your continued stance for academic excellence and doing what is right for teachers, parents, and students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flora. Kaya Griffin, Tammy Fleming, followed by Jen Iverson. Ms. Griffin. Hello, my name is Kaya Griffin, and I'm the oldest sibling of Jeremiah Ganzi. I want to start off by saying I'm hearing a lot about equity, but this topic is more of right and wrong, not equity, because equity is established, and it should already be right. But right and wrong, and what's wrong, should not be highlighted so lightly. I'm the oldest child of my household, and to come back after four and a half years after serving in the most diverse community in the United States military, to hear that my middle sibling and my youngest sibling faced racial discrimination from staff and students was saddening and almost like gut-wrenching because I had experienced the same thing as well as a student at Douglas County High School. My incident uh, encountered another student. I had uh, name-called him because we were in an argument, and then he came back with a comment calling me, uh, excuse my language, but a nigger. And no one around me had said anything or stuck up for me. And when I brought it to staff's attention, they also did nothing. Instead, they tried to manipulate me multiple times throughout the day to believe that it was my fault that I had caused him to call me a nigger. My mom then received a phone call from me, panicking in an anxiety attack, crying because they wouldn't stop bringing me to the office in the middle of class, where she had to show up to the school in an aggressive way and talk to them about why they kept pulling me out. It's really sad to say that I'm here years and years later after this has been discussed that it is wrong to stand up here and try to basically sell that racism as wrong. Uh, I don't think it needs to be sold, I just think it needs to be taught that it's wrong because I was born as a biracial person. I can't change this. I can't do anything about this. So the fact that it's being pointed out and, remaining. and almost ignored that we're being picked on by staff and students is embarrassing and it's not giving liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Tammy. Tammy Fleming, followed by Jennifer Iverson, followed by Linda White. Ms. Fleming. Hi, guys. It's been a while. Um, let's see. 
So I did want to start out by saying that I appreciate the continued effort on the board's part to attempt to clarify and perfect the educational equity policy. Um, I do understand that multiple charter schools have requested a waiver from the policy, including American Academy, while under the supervision of Superintendent Kane. So to me, this should be a clear indicator that it isn't what's best for all students. Um, kind of all over the place today, but regarding the student walkout on April 5th, uh, my child's school was told that due to, due to our role, we are not allowed or able to voice our opinions regarding a specific topic, nor are we allowed to participate in the walkout. A different school took a photo of a dozen staff members dressed in solidarity, and this picture was shared and praised by the Douglas County Federation. I was told that the message they received from their leader leadership was to keep politics out, but they did no such thing. So I'm wondering, is there a policy regarding staff expressing political opinions? Is it the same across the district? Um, is that policy made clear to staff through their school leadership prior to these events taking place? And if it was made clear, what are the consequences for teachers who disregard the policy? Um, next, I want to discuss community service. On your website, it says that through commun community service, students are given the opportunity to become responsible citizens by helping others. So if you look up any definition of community service, they include words like help, work, and service. Um, I would like to know why community service was offered for an event last week when there was no help provided to the community and no work or service performed. Um, and why were five hours offered when the event was advertised as three hours long and was actually two hours and 15 minutes? Uh, it kind of sounds like bribery, if you ask me. And that was actually what my daughter said when I showed it to her. She said it sounds like bribery. Um, and what's the point of having a 20-hour minimum if hours are given at twice the amount of time spent. 15 seconds Finally, remaining. Finally, in regards to the event last week, I was alarmed to hear that part of the event was a student leader promoting radical life-changing surgery as medical advice without evidence to support their claim that those therapies work, and in light of there being substantial data showing that they do not have positive long-term outcomes, do we want children receiving medical advice from unlicensed minor students? Thank you, Ms. Fleming. Jen Iverson, Linda White, followed by Holly M. Ms. Iverson. Good evening. Thank you for taking your time this evening to listen to me. Your volunteer positions show your passion for education, and I think that's can be common ground for us. As we all come to understand, education is not just the three R's. It's learning how to be part of a classroom and a larger community. As I read through the agenda for this evening, there feels like a lack of acknowledgement there feels like a lack of acknowledgement of what exists in our school district. For example, the first reading of the changes to the board policy JICB, prevention of bullying, is narrow in its perceptions of what is occurring in our schools and where the line is drawn between bullying, retaliation, criminal activity, and hate-filled discrimination. We've heard from several students this evening who exemplified maturity with their experiences which unfortunately went unanswered. I feel embarrassed for our community and humbled by these students' experiences. Furthermore, these changes do not recognize that bullying and retaliation do not occur only between students. There are sadly too many adults that participate in bullying towards students. There are also parents who bully staff and staff that bully, par bully parents. As a parent advocate, I know and have experienced this personally. I like to be a solution oriented. Therefore, if we want to attract educators, we must do the work to ensure our climate and culture are welcoming to all. There must be consequences for actions we do not condone under our own policies and handbooks. We must uphold the beliefs that we purport to protect and value. 15 seconds remaining. Bullying is not a new concern in Doug Co. There have been many and continue to be many complaints about it. We need a solid, trauma-informed, and empathetic victim's advocate to protect these members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. Next is Linda White, Holly M., followed by Rosabel Harrington. Ms. White. Good evening, Board Directors and Superintendent Kane. My name is Linda White. I am founder of Grandparents for Kids and a grandmother of two students at a high school in Highlands Ranch. I am here tonight for two reasons. First, I want to thank the board for pushing to keep the focus on academics in the classroom. I would also like to thank the board for proposed policy KBB that helps ensure parents have a seat at the table concerning their child's education. 
Second, though you have done great work as a board, the Cultural Celebration Conference at Thunder Ridge High School is a recent example to us to remind us we aren't quite where we need to be. That name, Cultural Celebration Conference, is so misleading. It appeared to be more of an instructional or possibly an indoctrination session on terms some people use to identify themselves and medical procedures that many high school students aren't mature enough to understand. How is this necessary or appropriate? Some say, but it was optional. Yes, it was, but students were bribed to attend with community service hours, the name and flyer were not at all indicative of the material presented. Indoctrination is not required to teach students how to treat one another with respect and kindness. There is a need for further guidance to our schools on parameters for these conferences, community service hours, transparency with parents regarding program content. Let's ensure all students are given the opportunity to learn in a way that allows them to reach their highest potential, ensure no one identity group is given preference over any other, unite through kindness and acceptance without the equity policy. Thank you for showing the community you are committed to addressing this. Thank you, Ms. White. Holly M., Rosabel Harrington, followed by Meg Furlow. Good evening and thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. This administration from the top down is bulldozing over universally established guiding principles for moral and just behaviors, not just in America, but right here in Douglas County. In an effort to synthesize humanity towards an irreversible outcome, a certain leadership is damaging the well-being and development of little human beings. <laughs> As parents, it is our uttermost joy to raise our children and show them growth opportunities for a positive outlook and worldview. As parents, we are, were blessed with these children, and as parents, we are responsible for our children's learning, growing, and connecting. This progressive agenda has turned almost every school into an indoctrination camp, creating an environment of rules governing social behaviors and demonstrating the very hatred they pretend to be against. We entrusted the safekeeping, the learning, and growth of our precious children to the school system for too long while we work to pay the very government that is trying to extinguish our way of life. How did we allow this to happen? And who seeks to benefit from synthetic diversification in academia? And to what extent will this be valued over true core education? Look no further than your own government. Let me tell you something. The state receives a whopping $16,000 per month per child if they are successful in removing children from their parents. Now, I'm telling you right now, this, this deviation from normality, this deviation from, from goodness, kindness, self-control, this, this massacre of trust between child and parent. 15 seconds remaining. This culture of destruction of self and death will not be tolerated among the parents of Douglas County. Parents, you need to come and be more engaged. This is our time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rosabelle Harrington, Meg Furlow, followed by Megan Birch. Good evening, board and superintendent. My name is Rosabelle Harrington. I'm a mother of three here in Douglas County. Tonight, I wanna to share my support for the board and give thanks for all you do to make Douglas County a place where kids are safe and supported while at school. I wanna thank you for ensuring all students have access to the resources possible for getting them the best education. This care and support enables our kids to reach their full potential. Thank you for your commitment to academic excellence, for seeking to stop bullying and supporting mental health and wellness care for all students while preserving and encouraging the involvement of parents. As you persist in defending our students, teachers, and parents, Douglas County will continue to progress and ensure our students are safe and supported while growing into their full capabilities. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your time and God bless. Thank you, Ms. Harrington, Meg Furlow, followed by Megan Birch, and then Kelly Mayer.
Good evening, directors. I'm here to comment on the policy revisions on tonight's agenda. The whole process has been unclear and less than transparent. The equity policy was written by experts in the field, the input of numerous community members, and support of DCSD staff. The Hanover survey took additional district resources to again tell this board that the community is overall in favor of the policy. Now tonight, this board is going to be going through the first reading of several policy revisions written by what appears to be one board member under the influence of outside political groups, such as FAIR and CPAN. I was especially concerned to read the red line version of policy on parent and family engagement, which closely mirrors FAIR's parent toolkit. Not only are these policy revisions concerning, your anti-equity agenda and lack of transparency is costing the district directly and indirectly. You recently had to settle the lawsuit for the wrongful termination of Corey Wise with costs totaling close to a million dollars. Your process for that termination also led to a lawsuit and injunction where the judge told you to simply follow the law. How are the taxpayers who only see these headlines ever going to support voting for an MLO and bond? The way these policy revisions are being brought forth feels uncomfortable and secretive, similar to the firing of Corey Wise. Good policy development involves stakeholders, open conversations, and listening, similar to how the equity policy was originally developed. And definitely not by just listening to the privileged white folks in this room this evening, expressing their dissatisfaction with the policy. Why doesn't the board oh, meet oh, open One, one second, remaining. we'll give you your last 15 seconds. Audience, please do not react and interrupt the speaker. Uh, Mr. Blair will give her another 15 seconds. Thank you. Why doesn't the board meet and openly workshop the policies if they need changes? Director Peterson, you ran to bring accountability, advocacy, and leadership back to the district. It's time to start being accountable to DCSD teachers, students, and staff, not political groups. Thank you, Ms. Furlow, Point Megan order. Birch, Kelly Mayer, followed by Julie Watkins. Ms. Birch. Good evening, uh, my name is Megan Birch. I'm a DCSD parent. I'm here tonight to highlight concerns for the revision of the equity policy. Um, the original policy was developed over a long period of time with robust community feedback, experts in educational equity. This board majority has created enormous community disruption with the resolution to the equity policy in which the superintendent was ordered to make recommendations, if any, to the equity policy. Superintendent Kane has indicated she has no recommendations to change the policy. And now, Director Peterson, you decided on your own to revise the policy, blatantly ignoring the feedback of the superintendent, ignoring data collected uh, from the Hanover Group that the district paid for. You're not an expert in educational equity, and nobody expects you to, that's fine. I'm questioning your decision to override a community developed policy as well as the data that we received, thinking that you know better. I'm not understanding some of your proposed language in the policy, including some of these obtuse diversity definitions. Our students are reporting an impact to safe learning environments and sense of belonging due to racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and more. Let's focus on the actual problem here instead of diminishing our students and their lived experiences by, by adding unnecessary language to the policy. You think the superintendent committees like the Equity Advisory Council are an overreach. I think this unilateral policy change and ignoring all of the data and feedback is an overreach. The recent MLO bond poll paid, by, paid for by the district indicated the majority of community members think the Board of Education is too political. This is exactly how you continue to perpetuate that public perception. How much money will this district have to waste before the agenda is satisfied? And whose agenda? The so-called parents' rights agenda that is notably not inclusive to all remaining. parents. There's a certain type of parent with a certain type of student that is being served. This anti-LGBTQ movement certainly does not represent me or my family. Our students need actual leadership, not playing politics. They told you so tonight. Please listen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birch. Kelly Mayer, Julie Watkins, followed by Tara Cole. Good evening, board directors and Superintendent Kane. My name is Kelly Mayer. I am a longtime resident and mom of many in Douglas County School District. My comment is related to the proposed Curriculum Advisory Council. I have questions. 
Is this gonna be a board committee? Is this gonna be a superintendent committee? What will the process to staff the committee look like? Will it even have teeth? Given what we've learned and experienced with the other committees, how will the community interact with this proposed committee? I have concerns about people with no education or background in this topic making curriculum decisions. I also have concerns about the use of precious dis district resources, including staff time, that should be used to educate our students, not to appease community members with their own agendas. This type of proposal is just a distraction from the real issues facing our district. We need to concentrate on issues with special education, the science of literacy, equity, emotional safety for marginalized students, such as the brave students who spoke here this evening, and the devastating teacher shortage. Our district used to attract hundreds of applicants for each position. Now we can't even fill the positions. Let's stop wasting district resources. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Julie Watkins, Tara Cole, then we will transition to online with Tiffany Baker. Ms. Watkins. Sorry, I have to have my readers to see this. Good evening, Superintendent Kane and directors. I originally signed up to speak tonight in support of the equity policy and out against Director Peterson's seeming obsession with putting his mark on it despite years of work of development with input from thousands of stakeholders, recent third party research and data that confirmed that nothing in the policy needs to change and Superintendent Kane also recommended no changes at the March 28th board meeting. But I recently became aware of some horrific racism going on right here in our district, in my town and in my feeder school. And even worse, it isn't being addressed in a manner that this student, his name is Jeremiah, feels safe enough to go back to school or even to go out in public. The student, Jeremiah, you heard earlier this evening, and his mother, whose name is Lacey, who I literally just met for the first time in person tonight, is trying so very hard to protect her child. Neither of them are asking for anything other than for us to all do better. Jeremiah even submitted a feedback form to the district last month asking for as much. He's been met with radio silence ever since. Lacey only found out about this communication when he told her late last week. He had tried to deal with the hatred on his own. Not only hasn't Jeremiah received any feedback or acknowledgement from the district, Lacey hasn't been contacted either. And she is still trying to get access to what was submitted and where it went through open records requests. She feels like she is being stonewalled and I'm sad to say I think she may be right. This is a perfect example of why the equity policy is necessary and why a comprehensive implementation plan is critical. Lacey and Jeremiah have been asking for solutions from the district, but they've been given the runaround. I want to believe that all the obstacles Lacey and Jeremiah are facing is due to staff and administration simply not knowing what to do in the absence of a comprehensive equity policy remaining. implementation plan in place. Let's make sure they do know what to do so that going forward, every single student in this district feels safe and valued while they are here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watkins. Tara Cole, then online, Tiffany Baker, followed by Katie Barrett. Ms. Cole. Hi, guys. I'm Tara. During the dark days of the COVID shutdown, when many of us began learning the ins and outs of district policy, I remember watching four brave charter schools stand up in front of the dais. The wonderfully kind, academically focused leaders were forced to stand here and ask permission to opt out of politically charged policies like masking and equity policies that had been created by the experts. The experts were wrong then, and they are wrong now. These divisive policies create unnecessary conflict within the district, and they create confusion for teachers, parents, and students. I personally would feel a lot more comfortable recommending district schools to people that are moving here, knowing that the policy itself is academically focused and not just dependent on how things are interpreted by current leadership. This board and superintendent have done a great job shifting the culture away from accepting divisive CRT activism in the classroom, but it's still sneaking in because the policy itself has remained in place. Elevating the voice of the student as an individual and the voice of the parent only strengthens the community. It is not anti-teacher or anti-public education to encourage transparency and strong communication. I truly think either removing the policy or using it to strengthen relationships rather than dividing students by identity groups 
will be a lasting legacy that this board can be proud of and exactly what you were elected to do overwhelmingly by the people of Douglas County. Thank you for considering it. Thank you, Ms. Cole. Move online to Tiffany Baker, Katie Barrett, followed by Kelly Dixon, Mr. Blair's Miss Baker online. I'm going to read for your teacher. Hello, board members. I have been a teacher in DCSD for the past 18 years, and I have seriously been considering leaving the district I love because of your inability to put aside your politics and truly focus on doing what's best for the students, teachers, and staff in this district. I am choosing to remain anonymous because I do not feel safe in DCSD and fear retribution. You are creating a very hostile work environment. You are continually gaslighting our teachers and community with such buzzwords as CRT, the union, and the indoctrination of students. None of these things are happening in DCSD, and you definitely don't need to protect students from them. When was the last time you actually talked to a public school teacher in this district? I am tired of hearing you and others blame the union for all sorts of things. Are you aware that there hasn't been a teacher's union with a bargaining power in DCSD in over 10 years? The union isn't doing anything to DSC, DCSD, but you are. Your continued focus on these political issues is not helping staff, teachers, or students, but it is putting the spotlight on yourselves and your supporters like Bear Douglas County and LPR. Do you truly believe they care about our students? They only care about their political agenda and are using our students and schools as pawns in their political game. Your attack on these buzzwords translates as an attack on teachers. Right now, I feel attacked by this board and parents and political interest groups. Teachers just wanna do their jobs and support students. Teachers are expected to treat students with grace, respect, appreciation, and validation. Teachers deserve the same in return. However, currently you are treating them remaining. as evildoers, not the professionals they are. Regardless of your personal beliefs, there are LGBTQ kids in DCSD that need our love and support. I actually had a transgender student who ended up dropping out because of the constant bullying and harassment they endured. This person was sweet, kind, and compassionate, but did not receive that in kind. Presenting revisions to the equity policy that are unnecessary, unwarranted, unasked for by the entire board is an abuse of power, Mr. Peterson. You are not the only person who gets to make decisions for DCSD. Mr. Thank Peterson, you, Ms. Baker. you are part of a great... Uh, we now have Katie Barrett, followed by Kelly Dixon, followed by Matthew Smith. Is Ms. Barrett online? Yes, she is, sir. Asking yes, this is Katie Barrett, and uh, I talked tonight about the equity policy. The Douglas County School District is being taken over with Mr. Peterson huddling with anti-diversity groups leading the charge. I implore Christy, Kaylee, and especially Becky Myers to dig deep into the intent of factions who funded your 2021 campaigns. Sadly, the donated money was not given to support your place on the board due to your intellect, passion, or knowledge of managing a school board. Your Selected for your political inexperience and malleability. I remember when Becky tried to vote differently than expected. Peterson stared her down and questioned her vote out loud. Becky, you quickly caved. We need strong women with backbone and to trust themselves and their experience in knowing what's best for children. I reach out to Becky specifically because she was a teacher. I imagine she knows and loves children of varying colors, abilities, religion, and sexual orientation. The tapestry of human diversity is a source of wonder and opportunity to be embraced and explored. Perspectives from indig indigenous people, slaves, Japanese internment survivors, and women who marched for the vote are just a few of the diverse voices that belong in a well-rounded public education. Regrettably, groups such as Moms for Liberty, FEC, and FAIR have rigid hearts. There's no room for ideology or culture beyond white Christian nationalism. Becky, when we spoke briefly, you told me you remaining. weren't sure about FEC and FAIR, their goals and their operation. 
Christy, Becky, and perhaps Kaylee, I implore you to educate yourselves about who funded Kids First. Embrace America's rich tapestry and stop blindly following the Pied Piper Peterson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Chad Cox, Dana Marie, followed by Brandy Bradley. Sorry, that was Katie Barrett. Then we have Kelly Dixon, Matthew, Matthew Smith, and Chad Cox. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, I am a Douglas County parent and taxpayer. First, I want to emphasize yet again that the equity policy should remain as is. We have wasted a year and a half on pointless resolutions and political grandstanding, not to mention the wasted money. Meanwhile, we have real students who are experiencing a hostile learning environment and are telling you over and over that they don't know who to go to and they don't see anyone doing anything about it. It happened again tonight. Their pain should be more valuable, more worthy of our attention and action than whatever parents' rights group agenda the board majority is pushing. Tell these students that you care by stating publicly that you won't stand for hate speech and discrimination in our schools. Tell these students you care by stop, stopping the swirling on policy ADB. The costly handover survey indicates the same. Let's move on and move our district forward. My next concern is about ADBR section D, which reads, classroom instruction or curriculum may not be used to indoctrinate or persuade students to be to a particular point of view. No, I'm sorry. I was reading Florida, Florida's House Bill 7 from 2022. Oh, here it is. Teachers who choose to discuss current events or widely debated and currently controversial issues of public policy or social affairs shall, to the best of their ability, strive to explore such issues from diverse and contending perspectives without giving deference to any one perspective. No, I'm sorry. That's not right. I was reading the Texas legislation that passed in 2021 requiring teachers to both sides the Holocaust. Forgive me. The ADBR text reads, in order to promote critical thinking and independent thought, DCSD educators will endeavor to present opportunities for discussion of various viewpoints when studying topics that are considered controversial or polarizing. Perhaps you can understand my confusion now. Why are we doing something that has been demonstrated to make the learning environment harder for everyone, especially teachers? If we care about our students, we must care about our teachers. Seconds we must support them. There is no backup, no one else waiting in the wings, especially not when we can't pay them enough to come work here. I don't have time to get into my other concerns with the red lines on the agenda tonight, so I will just implore you to please shift our focus to the things that actually improve our district and stop delaying and distracting on these culture war issues. Stop bringing the national narratives into our district and do something real for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon, Matthew Smith, Chad Cox, followed by De Deanna Marie. Matthew Smith is not online, sir. Chad Cox is not online, sir. Okay, we will move to Deanna Marie, followed by Brandy Bradley. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. I'm asking that the educational equity policy be repealed. It was sold two years ago as something that our community wanted and supported, and we've all recently learned the truth behind this sales job. One parent in Douglas County was captured by the anti-racism and Black Lives Matter movement of the summer of 2020 convinced DCSD teachers and administrators that the Douglas County community was likely suffering from this white supremacy and discrimination against non-whites and ultimately played a major role in creating this edu educational equity policy. A recent LinkedIn post by this parent confirms that her group, Equity Growth Zone, takes credit for getting the equity policy passed. In this same post, she states, one of our greatest defeats was losing the Board of Education to white supremacy supporters. Directors Hanson, Ray, and Meek, you all were led by the nose by a narcissist who wanted to be seen as a savior, duped by a person who hates our community. You all were hoodwinked. We were not. We've been telling you for two years that our community does not want a policy that supports a cult culture of hostility and may, in fact, foment racism and intolerance where none existed before. School administrators are using this policy as cover for elevating specific identity groups over others. How on earth is this going to promote unity that Director Meek, you so often speak of? How is it unifying or welcoming 
when students are being told what identity groups should be celebrated and students are skipping school rather than facing bullying and harassment for choosing not to wear certain colors or items like pronoun pens, get real. I would like to hear a discussion amongst the seven of you on what harm would come from repealing the educational equity policy. And no excuses that every year the school district has an equity seconds policy remaining. or so much time and effort went into creating it or the equity policy was created by DEI experts. I want to see you all flex your critical thinking, a skill set that we're supposed to be teaching our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marie. Our final speaker for this evening will be Brandy Bradley. Is Ms. Bradley online? Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Good evening. One board member said that every policy in the equity policy is linked to a bank of research. I strongly disagree with that, especially after our previous board spent $37,000 on the Gemini group that offered nothing about equity and everything about activism. This current policy is divisive and needs to be overhauled. Equity is the quality of being fair and impartial. Fair is without favoritism or discrimination. On Monday, April 17th, a cultural conference was held at local high schools in Douglas County. This conference offered free food and drinks along with community service hours for attending. Among the groups presenting were SCORE, GSA, or GSA, No Place for Hate. One of the main issues is that during the main presentation in the auditorium, the addressing framework was on the screen for 200 plus students in the audience to see, of which the majority were overwhelmingly white students. The slides show that there are groups of students who are oppressors and other groups who are oppressed. Moreover, according to this chart, the students at the top of leading oppression are white Christian heterosexual males. As a mom to four amazing, talented boys, I am deeply troubled by this and the potential impact it may have on their psychology. According to Colorado Department of Health, in 2020 to 2021, there were 94 suicides committed by teens between the ages of 10 to 19, of which 71% were young teen males, 67 teen males that committed suicide or 77% were young white males. So why in heaven's name would schools prey on vulnerable group of students, especially in a mental health crisis? Where's the equity in this when we tear down these students? Another is the GSA session included multiple topics that were startling. One topic um, discussed sexual identity terms such as pansexual and polyamory, which I guess means we are teaching kids it's okay to sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want. This is not something I would consider as the role of a high school. It is the parents' duty to decide what morals they wish to teach their children, not the high school. And you did so by offering community service hours. My son is a part of FCA, and this group does not talk about demonizing members of the LGBTQ. They talk about scriptures and the love for Christ and acceptance. They don't talk about hate. They don't talk about exclusivity like the other groups in the school. As Christians, the Bible teaches us that we're all sinners and that we can be born again through faith in Christ. Why are we allowing kids to say that the Bible is homophobic when it's not true? And why would we offer community service hours? That's the end of public comment. We now have a uh, 15 minute recess. Let's extend it to 17 minutes and we'll start the meeting again at seven o'clock.
We are now on item number 11, adoption of consent agenda. It is involving items number 12 through 29. Do we have a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. We have a motion by Hansen. Second. Second by Myers. I'll now call the roll. Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray is not here. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. We will now move into item number 30, the study session, which is interpretation and implementation plan for policy ADB, educational equity. We have a 60 minute presentation followed by a 30 minute Q&A. Superintendent Kane. Okay, um, thank you very much for, um, well, I wanna thank our charter schools that just left, so it's too late, but they were here for the consent agenda. Um, so it was a really quick trip for them. So um, thank you for that. All right, so let's talk about educational equity. Um, I first just want to um, acknowledge all of our public commenters. Um, I think when, um, for the longest time as we've been talking about this, something that we've been talking about a lot is just getting a little more specific about what we're doing so that we can allay fears that everybody has and make sure that we're taking care of every single one of our kids. And I hope that you all will find that the work that staff has done, which has been um, pretty substantial, has walked that line because it is our goal to take care of each and every single one of our students in our district. Um, I also want to just say that I was able to speak to the family that was um, here for public comment to make sure that um, our system is addressing their needs and um, and we are and they have my, um, they know how to get in touch with me and to, if, if they feel like there's anything tripped up in the process. Um, and, and we're so, of course grateful for anytime kids come talk to us about their experiences. Okay, so um, here's, what, here's what I'm gonna go over. Um, to, well, actually, I wanna start with um, a little bit of background before I talk about agenda. So um, on March 23rd, the Board of Education adopt ADBE, or excuse me, ADB, Educational Equity. On January 25th, the Board of Education passed a resolution, Culture of Individual, um, excellence and conclusion directing the superintendent to do uh, to recommend potential changes to ADB and related implementation. Um, in January 2023, we authorized the use of Hanover Research to administer a survey and conduct focus groups so that we could gather um, perceptions and feedback in our community regarding um, educational equity in our district. And then Hanover, of course, presented their findings in March. Um, so, in response to those findings, staff has done a lot of work on, um, on ADB-R, which is the regulation that would go with ADB. Um, so I want to start there. Right now, policy ADB um, does not have a statement in it that delegates the regulation to the superintendent. So um, that means that as we move forward with ADB-R, there's a couple of options that the Board of Education has. Um, a statement can be added at the end of policy ADB delegating the regulation to the superintendent, which is in many of our policies, um, or the board can retain control of, or have control of ADB-R. So I just wanna make sure that the board understands that. Um, we are not recommending any specific changes to board policy ADB educational equity, but we also fully acknowledge that ADB is a policy that belongs to the Board of Education. Um, and at the end of the day, the Board of Education is always responsible for policy setting in the school district. We believe we've addressed um, what we were asked to address through ADB-R, but we certainly recommend that as the board looks at ADB, they do so with um, the community feedback in mind, and if ADB-R is helpful, um, that we can certainly adjust ADB-R. Um, based on the red lines that are on the agenda for ADB, um, really more additions, I think, than red lines. We don't have any concerns with respect to ADB-R. We still we feel it still follows 
um, ADB. Okay, so that was, I feel like I'm gonna be saying the words ADB an awful lot tonight. Um, okay, so again, ADB-R is the superintendent regulation to give staff's interpretation of board policy ADB. Um, I just wanna say a few more quick background things. One, it has always been um, our goal, my goal, to try to bring our community together. It's something that we have talked about um, a lot, and that is something where, again, ADBR, we're hoping addresses um, any fears and concerns and hopes and dreams for um, people, regardless of their perspective on equity in general or what it means to them. Um, we wanna make sure, again, that we are taking care of every single child um, in our school district. One of the public commenters tonight asked about um, me specifically standing up here um, as the leader of American Academy and asking for a waiver to educational equity ADB and then American Academy under my leadership rewrote or wrote our own policy. Um, we did not write something, we wrote our own policy. And at the time when that meeting occurred, I remember telling the Board of Education that I didn't have an objection, we didn't have an objection to ADB, anything specific necessarily. We felt the wording um, meant that there could be multiple interpretations. And that what we wanted to do was make sure that it was clear to our community, essentially what our interpretation of ADB was. So. Um, this is staff providing the board with an interpretation of ADB and actually in, in my view isn't dissimilar. So, okay, um, here's how we looked at ADB. We interpreted policy ADB through multiple lenses. One, academics. Two, student wellness. Three, human resources. Four, resource allocation, so financials and five, parent engagement. All of these areas are impacted by the intent of ADB, which is taking care of every single student. Um, we also will discuss at the very end, so I wanted to put it at the beginning, but at the very end we discuss the education, or the edu, excuse me, the Equity Advisory Council um, and our interpretation of the work of the Equity Advisory Council. Um, for each of these lenses, that I've specified, our slide deck will go through the findings that Hanover had, um, the interpretation, the way staff is going to interpret or is interpreting ADB, our implementation plan, um, and our professional development plan surrounding each of those lenses with the lens of taking care of every single child. Okay, so with all of that, I'm going to start with academics. On the academics side, these were the main findings of Hanover Research in terms of what people hope will result from the policy. Um, I put green arrows next to anything that related to academics, but the top four hopes were curriculum that promotes critical thinking and problem solving, a historically accurate and comprehensive social studies curriculum, increased growth and achievement for all students, and increased access to opportunities for all students. Those were the top four um, findings as they pertain to academics. Likewise, the concerns expressed in the feedback pertaining to academics, um, I will just highlight the top three. Politization of school curriculum and relatedly the school environment, reduce focus on core academic curriculum and introduction of age and appropriate content. So those were kind of the top um, three concerns. Okay. Um, I don't know why my slides are, oh, it's because I don't know which direction I'm going. Sorry about that. Okay, nope, are my slides, I'm so sorry, hang on just a second. Okay, um, on the focus group key findings, students desire curricula that is culturally diverse, uh, diverse. Students feel that teaching cultural differences will increase overall awareness and appreciation, which will in turn improve learning environments. And many of the student participants, and actually this was focus groups in general, not just students, many participants had concerns that national narratives, politics, misinformation, and misunderstandings might influence the school district's decision around implementation. All right, so ADB-R, 
um, goes through an A, so ADB-R is attached under um, agenda, under policy governance ADB-R, but this slide deck is intended to go through each of the areas of ADB-R, so we don't need to do it all when we get down there. With respect to academics, DCSD is committed to increasing the growth and achievement of all students, including those in state and federal identified subgroups, all students, all means all. DCSD is committed to increasing student access to our pathways. Um, DCSD will not lower standards and expectations for any students, including those in state and federal identified subgroups. We are committed to not lowering standards for students, and we did not interpret that that is the intention of the educational equity policy. Um, one of our public commenters talked about um, gifted and talented programs, AP classes, et cetera. So this commitment, this bullet here, this commitment in ADB-R um, is a clear indicator that we will not be doing anything like eliminating AP or gifted and talented or anything um, along those lines. We will not lower standards and expectations for any of our students. We want to have high, ex high expectations for every single one of our students. In fact, what we want to be careful to do is not underestimate our students. That's what we want to be careful not to do. Um, as a parent of a student with special needs myself, um, I've watched, I watched time and time again over the years as she would be underestimated. Um, I was guilty of underestimating her as a parent. Um, and so that really, it's, le it's not about lowering expectations. It's about making sure we don't underestimate any of our kids. Um, and we are committed to teaching the Colorado academic standards. All right, so in ADB-R, from an academic lens, um, we, have, we, have that, we have the academic lens put into multiple sections. Um, and so I'm just summarizing those sections here. But academic needs, we, we offer the integrated multi-tiered system of supports for all of our students. And our um, experts will be talking more about what that integrated um, multi-tiered system of supports actually means, but it's individualized. Um, it's individualized so it's for every student to make sure that we are meeting our students where they, um, where they are and that we are doing everything we can for each individual student to ensure they meet their potential. Um, access to opportunities for all students. We want to make sure that the pathways and programming that we have in our district is accessible to all. And so um, that is addressed in ADB-R. Especially right now, we have now 14,000 seats in career and technical education, for example. And we want to make sure that those seats are accessible by all of our students. Um, and that's something that we've had a conversation with co uh, about collectively. Curriculum resources. So in IJ-R, um, we are proposing some changes to other related policies, as you know, so those are all under policy governance, and we'll be calling out some of those. So IJ-R, we are proposing adding a curriculum advisory council. It would be a superintendent's committee, so it's completely like the calendar committee and a million other things that we as staff um, use as an advisory group, not a decision-making body, but an advisory group that could have community input, teachers, parents, um, could give us community input into our curriculum process. So our process of approving curricular resources. This committee is not approving curricular resources, um, but they are advising us on uh, curricular resources. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to that part. Balanced perspectives. So one of our families, um, one of the things that came out of the survey was promoting critical thinking, right? We always want to be teaching our kids how to evaluate information and how to um, critically think and make decisions for themselves. Um, and so something that we've talked about a lot is making sure that we're offering critical thinking and, and balanced perspectives through our teaching and learning. Um, one of our staff members commented that um, when she was in teacher school, they used to always say you shouldn't, your, your students shouldn't be able to um, know your political perspective based on your teaching. Like you want to teach all perspectives 
re all reasonable perspectives, um, and then have your students evaluate for themselves. So it's just about making sure that on particularly polarizing and controversial issues, we're presenting um, both sides of an issue to our student or multiple perspectives. I don't even really want to say sides because there's multiple perspectives. But I do want to provide some clarity around that. So we're not talking about things like uh, Holocaust denial because there's like 0.001% of our society that are doing Holocaust denial or whatever. Not suggesting that we're teaching a perspective about denying the Holocaust, but it's really more those issues that actually are defined in our controversial resources policies that are that are reasonably polarizing in our community. Um, not, not fringy, but reasonably polarizing. Okay, um, the social studies. Um, so we do address social studies through the Colorado Academic Standards. Um, and the Colorado Academic Standards has a great quote that I pulled out just to include in there that um, the Colorado Academic Standards is devoted to making sure that we have diverse um, perspectives of history, that we have history not only of um, groups and individuals, but all of the collective fact-based history that make up the tapestry that is um, that is the United States. And so we do want to make sure that we are teaching factual history and that we're teaching um, perspectives from different points of view. Health education, um, we have parent notification and opt-out opportunities on health education that have always been part of policy here in our district. So ADB-R kind of points that out. Um, for connections to relevant policies, Mr. Reynolds is going to come talk about that and summarize some of the um, associated policy updates. This whole going through all of this was a really great opportunity to be able to um, look at a number of policies that haven't been looked at in a long time. We found um, world-class outcomes and such in some of our policies, so we were able to um, really do some a thoughtful cleanup and match our, our policy to our current practices. Mr. Reynolds. All right, perfect. Thank you, uh, Board of Directors. Um, it was really an interesting project to, to go through and actually start looking at policy. Uh, one, just generally speaking, as uh, Superintendent mentioned, we, we do have specific language in there that we certainly need to address, not only just because of the times, but also think things have changed, and, and I'll touch on a few of those. Many of the policy changes that you see are on tonight's agenda. Uh, but there are some that we've listed here that won't necessarily be on tonight's agenda, but they're connected with the work. Um, so IMBB, which is the exemption from required instruction, um, the original policy, we didn't make revisions to that, but we're suggesting some revisions to the regulation to clarify the expectations regarding concurrent enrollment classes. Um, as we continue to expand into concurrent enrollment, it's really important to clarify that expectation uh, within that realm. Uh, we have IJ and IJR. Um, a few things that we did were IJ, we really wanted to update that reference to the newest version of the Colorado Academic Standards to make sure that the language in there was clearly marked and aligned to what the current expectations are for the standards so there's no confusion. Uh, the other thing that uh, Superintendent Kane just mentioned was the idea of introducing a curriculum advisory council to really help us to examine our processes and procedures uh, and provide us recommendations as we're introducing uh, new content standards. We have brand new social study standards that were just approved this last year. We'll have new standards introduced every two years from the Colorado Department of Education. This group can help us look and review those standards uh, in with our staff. Uh, we do have IJA and IJAR. Um, again, the idea here is to clarify the language in that policy it references 21st century skills. Uh, we're way into the 21st century skills, so they don't use that reference anymore. They call it Colorado Essential Skills. So updating that policy to refer the latest and greatest version of those standards. Um, a few things regarding um, IJC, which is instructional resources. Uh, we changed the language. We softened that language within that policy to go with the, the term concerns. Uh, the idea that if there is a concern, it's first addressed at the classroom level with a conversation starting at the school. Again, if parents have questions regarding the content, the standards, the materials, their first option is to go reach out to their teacher, and we're, we're clarifying that with that policy. Uh, the last one is really KEC and KECR. Um, KECR was uh, the first time we've used that policy in the fall, and we got tremendous amount of feedback from those that participated, and incorporating their feedback into that current process 
as we went through, there are certain things that we identified that we'd like to make that process better and more aligned with the actual policy itself. Um, and just, just to add a little bit about the concurrent enrollment courses um, issue, actually, um, in looking at our work and in doing this work, um, part of the feedback that around that area actually came from one of your board engagement sessions. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. Our concurrent enrollment courses are college approved curricula. So um, the, the resources in the curricula are all part of the, the college approved program. And so we can't customize that um, for individual opt-outs and individual needs. They, it really is college level material. So we absolutely will be making sure that our parents know what they're signing up for when they sign up for concurrent enrollment. Um, but because it is a college level course, we won't have the flexibility to be able to change um, what kinds of things are taught. So that's where, um, that's where the, we had to make that call out for concurrent enrollment because in order to approve the college credits, that's up to the college or university that's accrediting the course, not up to Douglas County School District. Uh, so a few metrics that are associated here. Some of these metrics you're familiar with because we have introduced those this year, uh, not just in the monitoring reports, but also in some of our general presentations to you for data. Uh, certainly um, capturing growth data, we do that annually uh, based on our assessment data results, uh, achievement results um, as well, but specifically calling out those, and it is called out in our performance framework that's provided by the state, which are those desegregated groups that are identified state and federal. Um, we also want to start talking about access to pathways. A few months ago, you all saw a presentation from Dan McMinnamy and his uh, team uh, presenting information about who's accessing our, our pathways. Uh, that's something that will continue in the future. Um, another thing that we're, we're looking at, and as part of our unified improvement plan as well, is looking at our graduation statistics, something that's on everybody's mind, um, especially looking at desegregated subgroups, um, looking at our graduation rates, not only globally, but also uh, more micro examination. So in terms of monitoring, um, not only will you get information from the state and from the federal government through their monitoring system, but we also have monitoring reports that have been reintroduced. And so for this particular area, you'll see this data appear in academic excellence. So in future years when we present this information, you'll see this data appear in that particular monitoring report. Now, um, I'm going to turn it over to our Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Erica Mason, to talk a little bit about some of the professional development we see that's tied into this work. Thank you. Good evening, Directors. Thank you for your time tonight, and thank you for listening. Um, as Matt said, we have, and this will be a multi-year plan that we're presenting for our professional development aligned to those topics. So we've been, we've spent a lot of time this year on instructional routines. Our Read Act 45 Hours um, required training for our teachers and the implementation of our core reading programs was a catalyst for us to align all of our um, literacy practices to instructional routines that are explicit and evidence and research based. We'll continue that work next year and even dive deeper into other content areas around disciplinary literacy and instructional routines that support math, social studies, and science, and so on. Um, as part of our PLC learning, we will continue to dive into data analysis, making sure that all of our leaders and teachers have rich literacy, data literacy skills in analyzing data. Um, this year, as part of our core reading program implementation, we um, purchased resources for our schools aligned to intervention programs aligned to their resources. We'll continue to work with our student support services group to make sure that we have systems and structures in place to make sure that those are impacting students. Um, we'll continue to um, support cultural responsiveness with our professional development. Our, uh, our Colorado academic standards, as both Ms. Kane and Mr. Reynolds have said, are, have been updated. They've also provided significant resources at the state level from Colorado Department of Education with high impact standard um, professional development strategies that we'll be sharing. And part of this work will be to support our educators in being able to feel comfortable in teaching polarized topics or topics that might be considered controversial or polarizing. Um, Finally, part of our standards also asks 
students to evaluate information from multiple perspectives. And so we'll have professional development on supporting what does that look like in a way that addresses um, those multiple viewpoints. And finally, in working with our student support services group and specifically Dr. Kelly Smith, we will be providing uh, professional development on our multi-tiered, our integrated multi-tiered system of supports. All right, perfect. So thinking about all the things that are connected, this for sure is going to be a multi-year plan. Um, literacy has been a big focus. Um, we have talked about that for the last several years. In the near future and in the far future, that will not stop. Uh, we're really in year one of full implementation of a universal approach to give all students access to this program. Now, as you continue forward, you're starting to talk about how do we provide individualized um, instruction using this new resource, which will be a big focus up for us over the next uh, several years. Uh, we're also exploring piloting uh, additional core programs or at middle school uh, to see uh, specifically in the area of literacy. So that's something that we're examining right now. Um, PLC, we, we use that uh, acronym all the time, Professional Learning Communities. It's a structure by which our, our teachers operate to be able to you know, provide an analysis of their data and look for implementing strategies to improve student performance. We will continue that um, in the future. Uh, the last thing uh, which we've talked about a, a few different times is the Curriculum Advisory Council. We anticipate starting that um, next year where we're introducing that council idea in the fall with the idea that by spring we have the council up and running, that we're able to start uh, looking at reviewing uh, the, the resource criteria that we use for approval. Uh, to look at new resources that are being introduced, reviewing standards, and also look at uh, reviewing existing resources. Uh, we have a large catalog of resources in our system of board approved items that may be 30, 40, and even 50 years old. Um, so it's coming up with a process by which we go about and re-examining re those resources that may be old. There are some history books that don't reference five presidents. Um, so it's, it's going back and looking at those resources to see you know, do we need to reevaluate how we revisit? And this council would help us uh, with recommendations for doing so. Okay, um, so we'll take questions at the end. We're gonna shift to um, student wellness. So in looking at student wellness, um, the Hanover key findings are here. What positive effects might the implementation of ADB have on students and staff? So these are people's hopes for positive effects. Um, decreased instances of bullying and harassment, greater respect among students, um, more welcoming and inclusive classrooms, improved uh, school and district climate, um, and differences views it, viewed as assets kind of highlights some of the top ones related to um, student wellness. The key findings um, from the focus groups included that Douglas County students have had experienced with some inequities in schools. Some are faced with more direct forms of discrimination. Um, several students have shared their experiences with discrimination. Um, some have had direct encounters of racism, such as racial slurs. Um, additionally, there are more subtle um, there are more subtle examples, so one might be that um, my teachers tell me they don't know how and don't want to pronounce my name kind of things. Um, participants, especially students, acknowledge the importance of reporting structures, um, and currently many do not trust reporting structures because they've not necessarily felt like it resulted in what they were hoping for. Um, and there's been some concern about tattletale snitching um, type retaliation. Okay, so here are our commitments in interpreting ADB um, around student wellness. We're committed to providing an environment that pro promotes belonging, connectedness, and empowerment of students as a foundation for their academic success. So I wanna provide kind of a, a real world example of what this might look like. Many of our classrooms in our district have um, um, some, some time set aside in the morning where the students just connect in a circle. Um, how was your weekend? 
or there's some kind of topic, almost like um, at the kitchen table, how for our families, we often have like those topic cards. If any of you have done that with your family where you um, talk about a topic, you know, and everyone goes around. So there, are, there's a focus on, on students connecting. I was in a classroom um, at Crest Hill Middle School not long ago where um, the students were put in random pairs every single day for like five minutes with a particular topic that they discussed together in pairs. And it really, in random pairs, people they might not normally talk to. Um, and it was just really fun to watch the students actually connecting about um, you know, their favorite hobby or, or whatever the topic might be and really seeing that um, respect and belonging growing among our students. DCSD is committed to providing an integrated multi-tiered system of supports to ensure students are able to access and excel in academics. Well, um, you just wrote this in academics. We did. This applies to both academics and student wellness. Um, because the multi-tiered system of supports makes sure that our kids have support in whatever area they need support in, in order to be able to access and excel in their academics. Um, if they're struggling with a mental health issue, they're probably not doing really well in their classes. And so we need to be able to make sure that we're targeting whatever their specific needs are and really helping them so that they can access and excel in their academics. Um, we are committed to implementing the Colorado Essential Skills. Um, the Colorado Essential Skills are all about resiliency and perseverance and critical thinking. Um, all of the things that employers in the state of Colorado have said they need to see from their future employees. Um, and we're committed to continuing community partnerships to foster social, emotional, and behavioral wellness for our students and our staff. So in breaking down student wellness, we talk about a welcoming environment, so belonging um, and relationships, and that we just really promoting relationships is what it's all about. So it turns out that's what it's all about for adults. It's what it's all about for students as well, those personal relationships and connectedness. Um, student wellness needs, again, that integrated multi-tier um, system of support, and really um, pointing out policy JLDA, which is one of the ones that is on the um, agenda tonight around educational counseling and in partnership with parents. We are in partnership with our parents when we're counseling our students. Um, prevention of bullying. So the prevention of bullying changes in JICB um, include prevention of discrimination and harassment. Um, as well as consistent reporting structures. One of our things for our multi-year implementation plan is to make sure that we find some reporting structures um, that, that are consistent across our district so that our kids feel like they have, and families feel like they have an easy way to report um, harassment and discrimination that isn't necessarily calling safe to tell, um, but that we have some kind of way for reporting and students in particular have expressed a desire for the ability to do anonymous reporting of bullying and harassment. Um, I wanna make it really, really, really clear that racial slurs and such things are not okay. They are not, nobody thinks those are okay. There isn't a teacher in this district that feels like that is okay. And it's not. And that's something that our prevention of bullying policy works through. It's the reason that we have Title IX investigators. Um, and we have ways for to make sure that we prevent discrimination um, and harassment. And so we'll talk more about prevention of bullying when we get to that area. Um, and again, talking about the essential skills, one of the um, powerful statements in ADBR, when you read it closely, talks about the empowerment of our kids. Um, we want to make sure that our students feel empowered, um, empowered to to empowered to report, empowered to um, do what's right, empowered in their academics, so that they feel that they have that they are empowered, um, as well as partnerships. Okay. I can see you all looking for the word empowered, so I'm finding that sentence to uh, make sure that I say that out loud. So hold on, let me find it too. Um, it is in there somewhere, I promise. Oh, go up, Danelle saw it. In the welcoming environment. 
Oh, it's in the very first bullet of where, President Peterson? I'm sorry. It's the very first bullet under student wellness of the macro four outcomes. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, students um, committed to providing that focuses on empowered. So we want to make sure our kids are empowered. Okay, um, now Danelle is, uh, uh, Deputy Superintendent Hyatt is going to talk about the connections for student wellness to relevant policies. And um, I would like uh, Matt and his department, she and her department have done so much in all of this work. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. So in similar fashion to what Matt overviewed with you all around the academic element of um, ADBR, uh, we did the same kind of crosswalk with student wellness and those policies that we see um, have alignment. So uh, we have ADF and ADFR. Um, it is titled Student Wellness as the policy. Um, what you will see as an adjustment um, and a revision to this um, policy is referring to physical, social, emotional, and behavioral wellness and refer referencing that integrated multi-tiered system of supports. Uh, so previously the behavioral element wasn't included in the policy and so there was, of course, that's such an important part of the work that we're doing to support the development of our students and so that needed to be reflected in uh, ADF. Um, Dr. Kelly Smith will talk more about integrated multi-tiered systems of support in just a minute, so hold there. Um, JICB and JICBR are prevention of bullying uh, and the policy related to that. Really in JICB, what you're seeing is an updated definition of bullying with defined goals um, and addressing the reporting element, which Superintendent Kane uh, just spoke about. And this is also in response to 2021 legislation um, that came out of uh, a model policy from CDE and our um, district team is utilizing that model policy as we um, uh, develop our, our policy. Um, JICBR is about providing that clarity around the reporting structures and um, prevention and intervention supports that are consistent in our schools and across our system. Uh, policy JK is student discipline and there are no suggested changes to um, policy JK. Um, policy JLDA and JLDAR are, have been retitled. Um, the new title is Student Mental Health Wellness Services in the School Setting really trying to be very specific about the role of mental health in supporting um, students' access to the educational learning um, uh, that's so critical for their growth and development. And so you will see that adjustment um, from the name from student psychological services to student mental health uh, wellness services in the school setting and really adding clarity regarding the parental consent and the role of school mental health. And school mental health is not a therapeutic um, service and support. It is really about helping our students with the educational needs and support um, that they have. And there will be additional information about that to come during the policy element of this evening. Um, and then um, JLDAR is just updated procedures around the par parental notification. And parental notification has always lived in the policy. In terms of metrics to help us to monitor around student wellness, this is a little bit more of a preview um, since we haven't had the opportunity to um, uh, do our last monitoring report um, for this year, which was around safe uh, culture and climate. And many of these metrics you will see reflected in that monitoring report that is upcoming. Uh, we know how critical protective factors are for supporting the development of our students. Our students needing to feel like they are connected to their school community, that they belong, that they feel safe, they know trusted adults to go to when they have needs um, or have concerns, and that they're involved in our school communities. And so our HKCS is 
in reference to the Healthy Kids Colorado survey. Um, and we give that survey or have in the past every two years. This year was not a cycle of survey administration, um, but we will give the next HKCS um, survey in the fall of 2023. But of course we have um, last year's data and that will be a basis of that monitoring report. But the Healthy Kids Colorado survey really gives us information from our students, our middle and high school students in particular, around positive feedback. Um, are they receiving positive feedback in the school community from their teachers or those educators that are connected with them? Um, do they feel like they belong uh, in their school environment? Um, do they feel safe? in elements of safety? Do they have a trusted adult that they can go to when they um, are aware of something that is not safe? And um, so those are all references, as well as our TLCC survey, which is the Teaching and Learning Conditions in Colorado survey that is given uh, to our educators, our teachers, our administrators, and some of our classified folks. They take the TLCC survey every two years as well, and there are many survey questions on that instrument that also talk about um, whether or not the adults see themselves as trusted um, adults to their, their students. Um, of course, involvement in extracurricular activities in the data, participation data is really critical for us to be able to evaluate, to be able to see who is participating in extracurricular activities um, and where we can continue to support um, additional involvement and improvement. Um, bullying, what we have right now with self-reported incidents is a little variable across our schools in our system. And so our schools have different ways in which our students can report incidents of bullying. Um, and what we are looking for in, in terms of this policy R is uh, having consistency with how our students can self-report uh, incidents of bullying. We do have discipline data. Uh, that data is um, input into our um, our infinite campus system, and it is broken down by behavioral incident type, including um, bullying. And so we do have that information that we have accessible to us, as well as safe to tell dispositions. Some of our students will use safe to tell to let us know about um, circumstances around bullying. And so we have the ability to pull some data from safe to tell around those incidents. I'd just like to add a little clarity for our community around the Healthy Kids Colorado survey. Um, when we as a district give the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, we have the ability and we have used this ability in the past to select um, which questions we want as part of our um, the survey body. And um, the last uh, issuance of the Healthy Kids Colorado survey was an opt-in situation for our families. Um, and so we will certainly look at doing something similar when we um, do this survey in the future, but I actually want to encourage our community to go um, look up the Healthy Kids Colorado survey data from the Colorado Department of Education. Um, a number of years ago, I did some research around the impact of the legalization of marijuana on um, drug and alcohol use um, among our students over the years, you know, looking at what that looked like over the years, we couldn't possibly as a community have those answers or know how to do that research if we don't actually have um, data where our students are indicating um, where they're telling us information, like if they're using drugs or alcohol, for example. So going and looking at that data, that data comes from kids across the state of Colorado. It's anonymous. It is not, um, the state doesn't ha isn't able to do anything with it on a personal um, basis, but it is also helpful for us to know things as Deputy Superintendent Hyatt talked about, like if our students feel safe in their schools or feel like they have a trusted adult. Um, and so that, that I just want to give our community some peace around that um, particular survey. Thank you. Next slide. 
So as I had just said a, a few minutes ago, in terms of monitoring around student wellness, um, in an upcoming um, Board of Education work session, we will be going through the monitoring report for safe, positive climate and culture with some of the metric data that I just um, outlined for all of you this evening. And so that is the one monitoring report that you haven't had a chance yet to see, um, but that data will be um, a part of that report. So. Uh, in terms of our implementation plan, I'm going to invite uh, two critical leaders in this work, Dr. Kelly Crawford. She is our Director of Health. <laughs> Dr. Kelly Smith. <laughs> that was good. I'm going to exchange your guys' name. <laughs> Dr. Kelly Smith, our Director of Health, Wellness, and Pre Prevention, and Dr. Stephanie Crawford Getz, our Director of Mental Health. Thank you for giving me some grace this evening. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Smith. It's a compliment. We work very closely together with prevention and mental health. So I want to talk a little bit about the development of the integrated MTSS framework and what that means. There's a lot of acronyms that we use in education, and we've added integrated purposefully into our policies. The integration of our social, emotional, behavioral, academic wellness. And the academic is what Erica's team works on, and we are here to support that social, emotional, and behavioral access to the academic. So our work throughout this multi-year plan is to ensure that we identify universal systems in all of those areas. So our team is really digging into what does that look like for the social pieces, the emotional pieces, and our behavioral pieces. So we're leaning into our nurses, our behavior specialists, and our school counselors to build those tier one universal supports. What are some systems to get to those tier two intervention supports in those areas? And then what does intensive look like? Um, for teaching wellness standards, again, it's around our entire support staff teaching those standards. We can't just lean into our teachers to do that. We're pulling our nurses into teaching those wellness standards, nutrition and sleep. We used our Healthy Kids Colorado survey to identify sleep and nutrition in our middle schools was really impacted. So they've been doing lessons with our fourth graders, seventh graders, and ninth graders on that this year. Um, we're working with our school counselors to identify specific elements within tier one and publishing a counseling handbook, hopefully the end of next year, remember multi-year, um, identifying what does tier one look like at every grade. So our community will know comprehensive school counseling has specific areas that every kindergartner will get across the area all the way up to ninth grade, 12th grade. We're excited about that opportunity. And then school rights structures and systems to, su to support restorative practices, as Danelle talked about, restorative practices and um, Superintendent Kane and those belonging attributes that we're really focusing on in building relationships. When we're looking at what that means, our universal structures around how do we treat each other in schools? How do we train our staff to really use those I statements and those relationship effects statements so that we're all being heard and we're treating each other with respect. That goes into our prevention of bullying procedures and training. We're really digging into what does that look like so we can build some systemic practices within our universal supports so that all students feel supported and treated with respect. And then ensuring that there's a consistent anonymous bullying reporting system and then defining really what that is across our system. So from school to school and grade to grade, speak, people can speak to how they can access that support and what that looks like. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Crawford. Thank you, Kelly. And continuing with that, when we look across what our students are needing, we've talked a lot about universal and then our at-risk students and what they need to build skills as well as our, as our intensive students. And so really those mental health services what does that look like for every student? Because we know kids can do well when they have the skills to do well. And so that's what we're here to do is whatever level of support they need, we're here to teach them and give them what they need so they can access their education. And along with that is safety as well. And so we're looking at trainings to expand for our students and our staff about safe to tell. Not only teaching them how do you make a safe to tell report and what that's like, but then what happens after you make that report what goes forward and ends in a positive, safe result for everyone. And so we're really excited about that work ahead of us. 
So this is a slide just to unpack the difference with all these acronyms that we've been throwing around with how we support kids universally and targeted interventions. So when we look at what this integrated multi-tiered system of support really means, it's a prevention framework and it's not new. It comes from the medical field from the 60s and it's evolved into education. It's really a framework that provides um, improves outcomes for all students, whether they have disabilities or not. It's for all kids. And it's really integrating the academic, social, emotional, and behavioral support systems. We talk about PLCs as our culture and IMTSS as our framework to get at that culture. So the language alignment, RTI is our response to intervention. It's traditionally been referred to how we respond academically to students. And then PBIS is positive behavior intervention support. What are those behavior systems universally? And then MTSS, that multi-tiered, combine the two. And what Douglas County is doing now is looking at how we integrate it all. So an example would be if I'm a second grade reading teacher and I'm teaching a reading comprehension lesson, I'm also teaching behavior regulation while I'm doing that lesson. So we're integrating those in. I'm also teaching problem solving and critical thinking and what those success criteria look like. So it's not stand alone across the continuum. So I described the integrated multi-tiered system of support, universal prevention agreements. So what we're working on within our team is what are those universal agreements at each school that align with their positive behavior supports and then how they're teaching those with their counseling, nursing, and teachers to get at these areas of social, emotional, and behavioral wellness. Restorative practices, we're expanding our restorative practice trainer of trainer team so that we can really be accessible to schools to lay that foundation on how we build relationships and belonging within that tier one. And then when conflict does occur, how do we respond? And that goes hand in hand with the prevention bullying policy that we're working on. Trauma-informed practices, we've been deep in that work for several years and we're um, expanding that trainer of trainer team so that we can provide schools support in trauma-informed practices, which we know research shows that that supports all kids learning at the universal level. Again, current prevention and bullying policy, we're infusing that in with these practices. And then our school-wide system of support for discipline. So the big thing that we're looking at right now is how do we support students with behavior without student removal? We know that when we remove from kids from classrooms, they're not learning. So our goal is what are those practices to keep kids in classrooms so that they can support those lagging skills in behavior? And then really identifying what the role of our school mental health staff is. Does everyone know the role of the school counselor and how they can support in all the different tiers of MTSS? Do folks understand that our nurses are medically trained to support wellness standards and can be teaching in classrooms? And we help, they also help with um, mental health. We have nurses that are supporting within the office when students come in and have um, those tummy aches, is it really a tummy ache or is it an anxiety issue that they have about the math test? So those are things that we're really um, bringing into our schools. And then our hand in hand with our social workers and school psychologists. All right, and then along with that is some more of our, our professional development. So these are our current mandatory trainings for our staff, and they go right hand in hand with all of our well being and our safety. So all of our staff, no matter who they are when they enter, they take keeping students safe training, which is an initial course on how do you identify students who might be of need. And how do you get them to a helper, such as their school administration, school nurse, counselor, psychologist, or social worker? We also have our child abuse and mandatory reporting. As educators, we are all mandatory reporters. And so we're very much working with our staff so that they know what their role is and how to keep our children safe. And then we have Title IX discrimination and harassment training that everyone must take. Our um, Staff can also take question, persuade, refer, or what we call QPR. This is a gatekeeper suicide prevention training. This helps everyone, no matter what your background is, know, again, when you come across someone who might be in need and might be at risk of hurting themselves, what to look for, and then how to help them and talk with them to safely get them to supports and connect them with resources. 
This is available to all staff and it is required for our mental health staff. We also have suicide assessment procedures. This is how our mental health staff assess our students who are referred and are at risk and then put together safety plans with the students and their families. And then our threat assessment procedures are also required for all of our mental health professionals, our school resource officers who work hand in hand with us, and our school administrators. And um, this is truly a team that works closely together at each school level so that they're very good and thorough at looking into every safety concern. Um, no matter what the concern is, we want to look into it. And rather, it's something that we find was somebody was frustrated and made a mistake or something bigger, there is always a safety plan that accompanies that. And that is always something where we're intervening with that student to help them because they came to our attention for a reason. So those are, those are our main mandatory trainings. Um, I just want to do a shout out to this team. They have done um, an incredible job of looking through everything. Um, Dr. Smith it works with all of our counselors uh, across our district and has really talked about um, the counseling handbook and the idea of publishing for our community and for our families exactly what our counseling standards are um, for students in kindergarten all the way through 12th grade so that our community knows exactly what our counselors are working with our kids and what skills they're helping to develop with our kids. Um, it's just incredible work. And um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Crawford uh, has done such incredible work around um, safety in our district and around mental wellness. And so I'm just really grateful to both of them and to Deputy Superintendent Hyatt for all of the work. Um, they were part of the bullying, uh, the prevention of bullying policy revisions as well as the JLDA um, policy revisions. And so you'll see them again very soon. Thank you very much, you guys. Okay, um, to address resource allocation. So this is one of those things where I feel like um, often our community misunderstands each other's intentions is around resource allocation. Um, one of the hopes for the implementation of educational equity was that resources would have um, different, we would have differentiated access to instructional support materials and resources um, that, that was shortened, but it's basically based on each individual child's need. And something that um, our students and our families talked about in terms of resource allocation is they felt that programming resources um, and fundraising capabilities are inequitable in Douglas County um, and that they perceive this as causing siloing. Um, they perceive programs as not being given the necessary resources to meet the needs um, of students, and some schools are perceived to have a greater capacity to fundraise, um, and inequities are perceived to impact funding and resources within the district. So our interpretation of ADB is as follows. First of all, we, we are absolutely committed to the idea of um, making sure that different students are entitled to different educational resources to meet their individualized needs. I know in my family, this looked like uh, spending for my family. We have three kids in my family, one of whom has five learning disabilities. And over the years, we spent a lot more um, on, our, on our kiddo who needed some um, extra therapy, some extra help, et cetera. And as long as I could always look at my other two kids and say, sweetheart, if it had been you, I would have done the same thing. That's what resource allocation is about, making sure that we're meeting the individual needs of our students. We are committed to implementing and evaluating um, our site-based budgeting formula that reflects allocation of resources to serve the unique needs of each student in alignment with the district's mission and vision. So making sure that we're looking at our site-based um, budgeting formula and on a frequent basis and just evaluating how it's doing, making adjustments if we need to. We are committed um, to allocating resources and supports to address the academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs of each individual student, again, through IMTSS, um, special education programming, multilingual learner programming, gifted and talented programming. Um, as we look at our site-based budgeting formula, um, we consider all different kinds of learners in our allocations. Um, 
on the monitoring report, this is actually covered in financial well-being, and it was indeed covered in the financial well-being um, monitoring report that we did earlier this year. Um, we talked about our resource allocation being based on the individual needs um, of our students, and we are trying to fund our schools according to the individual needs of our students. So think of it as the funding following the student in terms of their individual needs. The implementation plan, when you have Jana come up here and talk to the next few slides. Thank you. So we will continue through our site-based budget or SBB steering committee to review that formula and the allocations on an annual basis and make suggestions to adjust that formula as needed. We will study the impact of those SBB changes on students' learning, and we will identify and explore ways to address those fundraising disparities between the different groups. And then for the professional development, we do annual SBB training for our school leaders, as well as semi-annual bookkeeper trainings to the staff who help support those leaders in that SBB budget process. Thank you. And just, um, just want to address the fundraising piece for just a moment. Um, that is a significant disparity between some of our schools because some of our schools have a much higher proportion of students in poverty and they're not raising money for climbing walls. They're trying to raise money for um, more library books and that kind of thing. So we do need to really look at that um, and that's why Jana mentioned that as being part of our implementation plan is really looking at that and making sure that the kids across our district all have access to really great resources. And also that, that we're connecting families um, in, in some of our schools with our other schools. Um, we have schools in our district where the families really wanna be serving um, students that are not as well off as their students are. And they really wanted to have that community service component and they often look to um, going out to Denver or wherever, but we have schools and kids in need right here in Douglas County. So we also need to um, be more purposeful about connecting our families that want to support and um, our students and families that need the support. Okay, and then the final uh, area, I think it's the final area, is parent engagement um, pertaining to the key findings. So the key findings areas that relate to parent engagement are district climate and culture, and an increased sense of belonging in school for all stakeholders. DCSD is committed to providing an environment that honors and recognizes the importance, shared responsibility, and partnership between families, schools, and the community. Such as such, the involvement in the education of students contributes greatly to achievement and to the positive school environment and experience. DCSD is committed to providing and sharing opportunities to connect and engage those who support our students during their educational journey with our district. And DCSD is committed to attracting and involving all parents, families, and community members interested in engaging with our school district community. Um, I'm going to have Allison Rausch come up here along with Remy Rummel to talk about the rest. Thank you. Um, yes, and so the um, connections to relevant policies, we've talked about KE earlier this year, and we recently updated that. Um, KBB um, is essentially the commitments that Superintendent Kane just read off are the essence of KBB, um, and it sounds like there are some potential updates forthcoming um, on KBB, so we will keep our eye on that, but that is the essence of it. Um, and then KEC and KECR, public complaints about learning resources. We heard um, Mr. Reynolds discuss that, and the KECR has been updated to include the curriculum uh, advisory committee, so that would be a great place for um, engagement with our parents and families and, and community. Parent engagement metrics. Um, you just this evening approved your um, monitoring report related to collaborative parent, family, and community relations. Um, so this is a, is a lot of that. Um, of course, we have community engagement. Um, much much of this, some of this is is my role 
um, which is going to be coming up on a year now. Um, and I'm learning all sorts of things, but definitely our community engagement with all sorts of different um, stakeholders, engaged uh, school accountability committees. We will continue to do um, trainings, et cetera, but um, we'd really like to work with those SACs and learn how we can um, help them better engage with their communities of their schools. Engagement with economic development groups, governmental groups, industry partners. We have had um, a lot of different meetings with them. You all have had those same meetings and they've sort of crossed over with the work um, that we've done and some of what I've done, um, but we're, we're creating uh, great relationships. As, as Dr. Smith and Dr. Crawford were talking, we heard about um, a sense of belonging and also relationships, and it, it absolutely transfers over to our work with, in particular, parents and families, but with all of our, our community. And so we are working on those relationships and making sure it's a, it's a healthy uh, relationship and, and that we can support one another. Um, engagement with statewide advocacy organizations and elected officials, definitely doing that. And, and of course, you've heard about our lobbyist and how hard they, um, he's working up at the state capitol for us as, as things are starting to wind down there. Um, and um, being involved in that has been, has been really um, helpful to me and, and to him for us to be able to have that liaison and that lobbyist there working and um, speaking for Douglas County. Um, of course, student community service hours is something outside of, of my realm, but certainly would be a, is going to be a wonderful metric for um, having our students engage in, in our community. And establishment of and engagement this, with superintendent committees. So we've already got the Equ uh, Equity Advisory Council, um, Employee Council, and um, of course, there'll be a, a Curriculum um, Advisory Council we just heard about. And monitoring. Um, so this is part of your uh, new monitoring report as well, but uh, we will be um, collaborating, working with parents, guardians, families, and community members. Uh, we all want to partner together with the district um, to empower students, you, you heard that earlier, to maximize their individual educational experience. Um, collaboration with community, business, governmental, Government educational and organizational leaders is sought to provide opportunities for students to create positive change and provide service in our community. And finally, uh, for me, my portion here is schools are the center of community learning. We've heard that as well um, throughout this school year. Um, community learning, entertainment, and gathering. And I'm gonna pass this off to Dr. Remy Rummel to talk about some more monitoring. Thank you. So we are we value communication pathways for every single family in this district and ensuring that families have access to the information, fam access to learning opportunities, access um, to our educational system. So our district communications and school level com communications are made available and accessible to our multilingual families um, in the language they prefer and the lang language they can understand. Um, our accountability committees, like district accountability committee and our school accountability committees seek that diversity of, of thinking, the diversity of identity um, through multiple perspectives um, and to ensure that we empower all of our parents and all of our families to engage authentically in our learning experiences and that we welcome and empower our parents um, to be part of the educational process and to be part of our school environment in an authentic and meaningful way. Um, and I'll pass it to Ms. Roush. Actually, actually it's good to be. Yeah. You might still You're still Where's up. the clicker? Oh, you have it. OK, cool. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry. Uh, Director <laughs> Rommel, before you move yes. off, LEP acronym for those at home, since it's not spelled out in ADB. Thank Dash you, I appreciate R. that clarification. Um, we are, LEP is the federal definition for limited English proficient through an asset focused lens. I say multilingual learning um, or multilingual um, families, but LEP is limited English proficient. Um, 
Our implementation plan will include taking a look at our parent guide um, for the Douglas County School District, supporting our school accountability committees and increasing parent and family engagement. Um, and that authenticity is important um, in those engagement and partnership opportunities. Um, that we continue, we have uh, Ms. Rausch and Ms. Becky Kaur, um coordinate our partnership with the Colorado Department of Education in the Family, School, and Community Partnerships cohort. In that, we have multiple, approximately 25 to 30 people um, in the district and parent um, volunteers to provide insights. How can we better engage and empower our families? Um, and in this partnership, um, in the, through this cohort, this is an opportunity for us to gain insight and to improve our practices continually for family engagement and partnership. Um, and to develop the um, Douglas County School District Annual Parent Survey through the implementation of Superintendent Kate's um, workforce. Yes, multi-year. Finally, professional learning um, for all stakeholders is critical throughout Douglas County, including for our families and parents. Um, we have m multiple opportunities throughout the district. Our school accountability um, committee trainings are first and foremost to ensure that we have, have aligned supports for families and opportunities to engage in that formal process. We offer multiple parent opportunity or parent university opportunities um, to learn and grow as a, as a whole district. Our student support services programs offer multiple opportunities through advanced academics and gifted programming, um, special education and English language development, um, culturally responsive practices, um, experiences for families to really dive into some of that learning together and to partner with us to provide insights um, and partnership with us. Um, and then our school-based parent family learning happens across the school district. Um, schools provide very specific um, um, partnership and learning with their families at the school level. I think that is the end. Thank you. And uh, I do want to thank um, Dr. Rummel and again, Becky Kaur um, and Director Rauch. Um, but one of the things I talked about in my superintendent updates is the English language development um, community celebration that Dr. Rummel's um, organization held. And that to me was the quintessential partnering with our parents and getting our parents involved because um, that was absolutely packed with parents that um, want to be involved in their kids' education and have a way to connect with other families um, to get involved in their students' education and in their schools. And so it was a really great way to empower parents, and I really appreciate that event. It was great. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Human resources. I wasn't quite at the end. Human resources. Um, so uh, one of the things that came up was staff recruitment and development decisions that are equitable. Did I miss something? No, okay. Um, and so the key findings around um, the focus groups included, um, again, a desire for curricula that's culturally diverse. Um, and they, I feel like this is a repeat slide. So if I did that, I apologize. All right, we are gonna skip right to the interpretation of ADB-R. Um, DCSD is committed to recruiting a diverse pool of highly qualified staff and DCSD is committed to recruiting, hiring, and retaining the most qualified educators and staff. All right, and now it is all yours. Good evening. Um, and as you know, we do have our current policies that are in place regarding um, the hiring, uh, recruitment and hiring of um, all of our staff. So both of those are in regards to licensed and then other employee groups. Those are actually fairly, they've been reviewed fairly recently, so we don't anticipate any further changes. And then of course, we continue to gather and develop uh, metrics around staff demographics compared to our student demographics. Um, also retention rates, hiring data, and more. And so a special thanks to our IS team, to Mr. Reynolds' team, and to Team HR and, and many others for helping us make strides in this upcoming year um, for reviewing all of these systems as part of a large project this year. Um, we recently, um, thank you for um, participating and supporting in the monitoring report related to human resources. So um, again, uh, we will 
review and report out on um, our uh, next slides here of what next steps will be the next time our monitoring, monitoring report comes around. Multi-year implementation plan um, in human resources around this topic. And we thank our Equity Advisory Council for their year-long engagement. And I appreciate the opportunity to actually meet with our EAC on what our current practices are and other members of HR have shared as well. So based on the recommendations that we recently received, we'll continue to review this and then determine areas that are already in place areas to continue to explore and expand. In addition, it's important to note that we currently and will continue to rec recruit lo locally and nationally. We do that formally and informally. And we also go to many universities, local and national, but also um, at diversity designation schools, Anapeasy, um, um, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institutions, HSIs, Hispanic serving institutions. And we gather um, every wonderful um, candidate for Douglas County School District, for example, in the area of our teaching staff or our licensed staff from every background and every level of preparedness, and then we deliver those candidates um, via other resources to our hiring managers and leaders um, as part of their hiring processes and uh, candidate screening processes, and we'll continue to develop that. And again, as shared earlier, ultimately, we recruit, hire, and select the very most qualified candidates into each of our unique positions. Um, we will continue to partner with all of our wonderful DCSD leaders um, and also in our schools. And we thank you to our principals who've joined us at recruiting as it's very important to have their lens um, in all that we do and hire uh, the very best amazing teachers for our kids. And then we will continue to partner with our universities in talking to students even like right when they enter the teacher program as they head into um, any other of their um, practicums or their observations, um, opportunities to sub to student teaching to hire. So we support them and have special handling all along the way to help them come to wonderful Douglas County. And we will continue to develop our grow our own programs and teacher pipelines. Some wonderful things are happening next year and into the future years. And as you know, we will further develop our systems and data processes we have had some in place. It's time to review and revise in the area of recruitment and retention. Um, and then actually analyze that data in new and different ways. So many thanks to Matt Reynolds, who is our data guru, who partners with us in this work as well. So we have a lot of um, wonderful work to do and work worth doing. So we're excited for these opportunities. OK. Um, as you know, um, Matt Reynolds and Danelle Hyatt work with our Equity Advisory Council, which was part of Policy ADB. And we are committed to maintaining the Equity Advisory Council. Um, again, it's a superintendent's committee that is um, that will coordinate our school with our school district leadership to support and advise the implementation of everything that, that we just laid out. Um, in alignment with ADB and now ADB-R, um, the bylaws and this regulation, the EAC will choose a focus area for each academic year. So we just laid out um, academics, student wellness, we just laid out focus areas, one of which was human resources, which the EAC has focused on um, for this academic year that's almost over, and then they will be able to pick another area um, for the next academic year to look at the implementation planning that we have laid out um, and to advise us on that implementation planning. And then finally, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Reynolds share our feedback themes. As promised, we did um, present a lot of what was presented to you tonight to our district leadership team, um, our Equity Advisory Council. The prevention of bullying was, um, to, uh, we presented to our student advisory group and our district accountability committee in order to receive feedback from all of those groups. And we have incorporated much of that feedback into um, what is before you tonight. So I'll have Mr. Reynolds talk further about that. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so we went through and, and with each of these different groups, we gave them an opportunity to really engage and look at either the entire ADBR or specific sections, depending on what their role, role is. Uh, for the district leadership team meeting, uh, we gave them access to the entire slide deck for them to really dig in and start looking at some of these policy revisions. Um, after all, they're going to be you know, responsible to help us implement these policies. Some of the themes that came out of that conversation, which uh, was about an hour, hour and a half, I think, per session, uh, prevention of bullying was that there was questions and they provided us feedback on really the implementation. What does this look like in practice? Um, policy reads one way, but what does it look like in practice? Um, another thing that came up is uh, another theme was really supporting the Colorado academic standards. Those are on everybody's mind because we just got a new set of standards and so they're wondering what resources and support we can provide our teachers in uh, with the new Colorado academic standards. Uh, the Equity Advisory Council had a similar process. Uh, we laid out um, the ADBR and specific themes regarding professional development. Really curious about what professional development is going to be offered, um, how is it going to be selected, and how is it going to be implemented, as well as questions regarding the Curriculum Advisory Council. Uh, what role does the Curriculum Advisory Council play in all of the aspects regarding academics? Uh, the student advisory group, we really pinpoint uh, their feedback on the prevention of bullying policy. That was the section we wanted them to really look at because they had voiced in the past that bullying was an issue that they wanted to address. So what better way than to show them the revisions to that policy? Two themes that, that came out really on top were cyberbullying. Uh, the references to cyberbullying, they were really curious about how would this play out in the cyberbullying lane. The other thing that they were really curious about is policies and uh, processes and procedures, and you all have heard that. Uh, what, what are the processes and procedures by which students can go through and you know, either uh, cite that there's been some bullying or what's the response to um, a site of bullying? Uh, the District Accountability Committee, we really focus their attention on the parent engagement side of things, um, as parent engagement is a major role within the District Accountability Committee. Um, they were really curious about the, the impact of student subgroups. Um, how were all of the different things laid out with parent engagements going to impact those subgroups? And they were also interested in what measures uh, were going to be utilized to analyze how this policy was having an impact. And of course, every group was really interested in next steps. So that was really the feedback that we got from these particular groups. Okay, and that is the conclusion of um, our presentation around ADB-R. I hope we did it within our timeline, President Peterson. We did not, okay. <laughs> well, all right. Um, our, whole, our whole group is here to uh, take your questions. At this point, we'll open it up to uh, questions. I do want to point out that when we get to item number 32, we'll actually pull up the written policy, and I do have some, some typos and some changes from the presentation, but I'll hold all those. With that, uh, I will open up comments, questions from directors about the general, uh, not the specific wording, but the general concepts and everything that the staff presented. And just checking, Mr. Blair, we do not have Director Ray back with us. I know he was boarding a plane. It's just, okay, just checking. Director Weiniger. Um, I just mostly have a comment. Um, I really appreciate all the work you guys have done. You can tell a ton was put into this. And um, for me personally, this is what I was looking for with the resolution, with the work you put into it, as far as the surveys you've done, the ideas you had around um, the policy and um, just maybe you don't recommend potential changes, but you know, putting those out there might put ideas in our head on potential changes, potentially. <laughs> um, and then I just, actually I did have one, actually this is on the actual ADBR, so maybe I won't say that one yet. Um, but just a comment, I do feel like the presentation was more around like our culture at Douglas County School District and um, it makes me wonder the purpose of our educational equity policy and is it more so to define our culture um, and is it more so to bring all our policies together in our culture um, and if not then I'm not sure totally if our title reflects that but um, that's just my thought out there. But great job. Um, I really do appreciate everything, all the hard work you guys put in it. Thank you. Are there directors? And Director Meek. 
Yeah, I ditto. I very much appreciate so much work has gone into this. It's obvious. And um, I really appreciate all of the time and effort. It must have taken months. I think I've heard you say months that you've been working on this. Um, I also appreciate the approach that you were talking about um, using this regulation to help explain what is and is not meant through the equity policy. So, so I think that can be really helpful with getting facts and information out there. Um, I actually, I remember when you interviewed, you brought up how polarized we are with national politics. And I, I feel like we're still struggling with that a little bit. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we don't have many of the people who spoke at public comments still sitting here to hear what's in the regulation. So, you know, specifically in the regulation, it calls out, you know, we're not lowering standards. Um, equity doesn't mean equal outcomes. Um, there, there's a lot of clarity in the regulation. So I think my, my first question for you is, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we help address that. How do we help make sure that our community understands what's in this regulation, which was posted, right? But not everyone's gonna read the board packet, you know, to understand that. So what are your thoughts in how we help our community understand exactly what this means? Thank you um, very much for that question. Actually, um, one of the, assuming we are able to um, kind of get through second reading on, on all of these things. Um, one of our goals is to update our website with our um, FAQ because we do want to make sure that we call out um, all of the good stuff that is that was embedded in ADBR because you're right, Director Meek, they're not, um, our, our families are not going to go to our policy list and find ADBR or ADB for that matter and and go and then go okay now here I've got a string to JLDA and now I've got a string to you know curriculum uh, curriculum and resources so what we want to do is really um, do an FAQ that kind of calls out um, I think you had a great example of does um, does are we interpreting ADB to mean equal outcomes no we're not um, so just really being able to um, have an FAQ for our community to refer to with links to real board policy that um, set up the things that we talked about tonight. Yeah, I think that is a real challenge because, you know, we have a definition of equity and, and community members are saying, that's not it, it's equal outcome. So even when it's written down, people still have their own ideas in their head. And so I think it's a heavy lift, mm -hmm. but I think it's really important. I think so many individuals that we hear from care deeply about students. And some people think that the policy is trying to elevate some and hurt others when the policy is simply to make sure every single student is valued and respected in our classrooms. And so I just think we have a really heavy lift to help explain to folks exactly what that means. And so I think this is a step in the right direction. The other th big level comment, because I know we're gonna go through the language later, um, there's a lot of work to be done a lot of work is in here. And you've said multiple times, it's a multi-year process. I think really understanding how you're prioritizing what you're gonna do first and when is really important given how much work needs to be done. And the area specifically around um, ensuring there's consistent anonymous bullying reporting system and consistent district-wide bullying definition resources, reporting procedures. You know, we passed this policy two years ago. Two years ago. 14 months ago, it was basically put on pause right before we were supposed to have a monitoring report to see exactly how we're doing. So I think our community really would appreciate understanding the prioritization of what will happen when um, it's really hard sitting here and hearing students be very vulnerable talking about their experiences. And then we heard it loud and clear in our student engagement opportunities 
there's a lack of reporting, there's a lack of consistency, and I don't think we are doing our job unless we are addressing that as immediately as possible. And I think that's why I was really pushing for a monitoring report 14 months ago, because it would show where we are. And so I just feel like that is an area that our community and our students deserve to have addressed first and foremost. And I just don't see a timeline in here. And I think, I get you can't do everything at once, but I'd like to know what the priorities are. I appreciate that feedback. Other directors? Director Myers. So, um, Sydney, listening, first of all, thank you. What a great team. Yeah. I mean, I, I work with Dr. Stephanie Crawford. She's on uh, committees with me. I just love it. And we're, she's all about kids. And you've got a great cabinet, great people working under you. There's a good system that looks like it's getting into place. Um, a couple of things uh, that I just pulled out, just some simple things, and because uh, I know literacy is a big focus. That was always a big focus. That's our number one things with our kids. You get our kids reading, then they start moving forward, really advancing forward. It's, it's where it starts. Um, I'm glad we've piloted this core reading. Uh, one of the things that I've heard, and I've heard since I was a teacher in Douglas County, empowerment. Empowering our parents, empowering our students, getting our kids to be critical thinkers, getting them to participate, be a part of, and I'm, I mean, I know I'm only familiar with middle school kids, but God bless their souls. They just love, you know, communicating and talking about some of these things, and they, they're really wanting to push out and be empowered. That's what I remember. And one of the things that I wanted to, um, oh, and I wanted to bring out, I like this, and it is, I believe this is true, with our student wellness. There is probably that clear evidence that our kids will always, when they know they're in a safe environment, they're gonna learn. So it is very hard over this, the year, the months that I've been in as a board member to hear students still come up and talk about what's happening in school. Which leads me to, to think, we have policies in place. So what happened with the implementation? I mean, I know teachers cannot do everything. I know that. And I, if I had a kid that addressed a situation to me at school, my policy was get her done right then. Get it figured out. See what's going on. Whether that's talking to a parent, to the other student. And so some of the things that I hear from some of these kids, they're getting pushed to the side. And they're getting, they they don't feel like what's happening is getting addressed. So where have we failed in that? Is what I would like to know. So I mean, my goodness, I know we've got a district of sixty three thousand kids. We've got a lot of employees. There's a lot out there to do, and keep and and there's a lot on teachers' plates. And that was one of the things I talked about. Is some of these things getting on that needed to be taken off a teacher's plate. And yes, maybe to address a public comment. And I'm gonna speak for myself, but I am talking to teachers every week. I am, whether it's in the community, when it's the schools I visit, or a program I go to, wherever it is, I am talking to teachers every week. I still know a lot of teachers, and I, and I think with the majority of us, we probably are recognized in public and not wanting to be recognized, but people will stop and have a conversation with you. And so, you know, they're, they're either for or against us. We saw that tonight. We see some of that division. And here's another, the only other thing that I think that I would like to see. I don't want to rip the Band-Aid off of ABD policy. I don't want to rip that off. I don't want to rip it up. But I would like to, I would like for 
the people, the the thousand stakeholders that and that were in this group that wrote this policy, I'd like for them to honor that possibly not, they didn't honor their narrative of diversity, equity, inclusion. Were there a diverse group of people on that that really, I'm hearing from some of the community that no, they didn't have a buy-in to some of that. So while I don't believe in ripping it up or ripping the Band-Aid off, we do need to look at some of the language. We do need to look at some because I think this is what our community wants. They want us to come together. They want to see us up here remedying this for everyone so that it's so that they can feel comfortable with the language and then we go forward with the implementation and great ADBR. I mean, that's the roundabout way of seeing, I mean, hearing what's happening in the district with all the other policies we're going to talk about tonight. But yes, and I, I hear it from Director Ray all the time. I've heard since we were up here, that's our job, looking at policy. So we are over to, a little over two years later from the policy ADB being uh, voted in. So it might be time to take a look at some of it and get those people in the community with the parent engagement. And I can testify, and I know that that's difficult. Parents are busy, busy to get the parent engagement. And I heard from the students, I know you're tired of me. The, I heard, we heard through our students and our parent and our business communities. First of all, students. I heard loud and clear. I hear it with DCYI, and I think Dr. Crawford can say this. They want to connect. 2020 was hell. They want to connect again. They want to be out. These kids need connection, and they need relationships. And I think we heard it from our teachers, and I've heard it over and over. They want to teach, and they want to teach their subject. And then we heard it from our business leaders that they want to, what they want to see coming out of our school district is kids that are honest, have an integrity, they've got a work ethic, and they've got an education because I just read something that was alarming the other day. We have half of over, over half of our kids going into college have to take remedial classes. We don't want to see that. Because we, and while we're, Douglas County is great in the state of Colorado, it's not good enough. I'm sorry, it's not good enough. We've got to push our kids, we've got to get those academic standards up, we've got to get them reading, we've got, because that's how you create a critical thinker. And we got to get the buy-in from the parents, and we got to get on the sides of our teacher. And I, th I think we can do this, I really do think we can do this. Other directors, comments, questions? Director Hanson? I have questions, but I didn't know if Director Myers wanted her questions answered, or were you just putting them out there? Well, <laughs> if uh, uh, Superintendent Kane wants to address anything, yep. that'd be great. Well, I, I, I think what I um, got from that as far as questions go, um, the first one was about bullying and, harass and harassment in our schools. Um, and that that is a problem that, that you know, has been always a challenge um, in the educational environment. And I will tell you with the introduction of social media into our world and um, the cyber world, a lot of the issues that our office is investigating right now are issues that um, aren't happening during school, prop on school property, during school hours, or even during school days. Um, but because they're happening amongst our students, we are still working to make sure that we address those. So the scope has become so much bigger. Um, and I do uh, want to say in response to your question and also in response to Director Meek's comment that we know that consistent reporting structures um, is a significant priority across our district. Um, all right, so I think I got that one. And then I, I, I guess the second response would be a comment which is, um, I think from a staff standpoint, we could not agree more that it's not going to be good enough. It's never good enough. We are always working to make sure that we are getting better, um, whether it's creating a better environment for our kids and certainly in the area of making sure that we are consistently have better academics. Um, but we have a really, really great start in Douglas County School District, and we have so much to be proud of. 
Perfect. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I don't know if any of you remember back to um, March of 21 when this policy was passed. Um, if not, Director Ray did a beautiful job of explaining how the R portion of this policy would be the foundation. That would be the true work. And he really did an excellent job of differentiating what the policy would be and what the R policy would be. And I am so overwhelmingly grateful that two years later we have an R policy and that this work can be be implemented with fidelity. So grateful for, I know, the, the many, many hours that went into this. Um, it is a very large scope of work that needs to, that even to present on this many different topics, even the number of people that are sitting here with us, um, an unbelievable amount of work. Um, I am always a fan of progress over perfection, and I am always going to push for that moving forward. I think what would be really helpful for me is probably more of a question for board with your input, but um, I'm not sure I'm clear on on the process moving forward. The lines are pretty blurred for me right now with board responsibility and um, operational responsibility. And um, I'm not sure that I've ever reviewed an R policy in my time on the board. So I'm not sure if we're just doing this. At, it's very blurred for me, and I want to make sure um, that I understand what this process looks like. Um, are we just weighing in on your R policy? Are we going to somehow vote to approve an R policy? Um, very good. Yeah, Any if, input it, yeah, would be helpful for me. Yeah, if I could take a, a shot at that, and I'd like the superintendent to weigh in if there's a disagreement. Um, I think Superintendent Kane mentioned early in the evening, I forget, um, right now we don't have a dash R policy, haven't had one. This would be a proposed one. If we are going to have the superintendent take responsibility for that, we as a group of seven are going to have to amend ADB to at least add delegation of the implementation, uh, you know, a dash R policy to the superintendent. Um, so I'll start with that statement and get superintendent's comments. Yes, um, actually that, that is accurate. So um, when we create a new policy um, until it's clear whether it's something that's delegated to the superintendent or it's owned by the board. We're going to show that to you. Um, we also dash our, so let's assume for a moment that it was delegated to the superintendent. It's not yet, and if that's the board's intention, um, that's great. But also by showing it to you, it, it also shows what the next steps are that the board is, uh, that the um, staff is taking with the work um, to implement and interpret ADB. There are some dash R policies that are owned by the board, only a couple, but it's because in those cases, it's because um, there is something in that dash R pro, uh, policy that is actually statutorily required to be in the lane of a board of education. There is, in nothing, there is nothing in ADB dash R, which is statutorily required to be in the lane of the Board of Education, so it would be very unusual if it was not delegated to the superintendent, but because it isn't called out as being delegated to the superintendent, that's why it's sort of in question at the moment. Does that make sense? And I, maybe uh, legal counsel can help me with that. I'm not sure. Did that make sense? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm happy to share a few comments in that regard. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. It is interesting when you look through our policy process in our B policies, and there are express requirements in those policies which indicate that to the extent the policies have not yet been delegated to the superintendent, including some of the R policies, that they are maintained by the board. And in an abundance of caution, I think Superintendent Kane is um, presenting an assurance to the board that she is asking for delegation from the board to, to this policy to assure that there is a, an understanding among the board, at, between the board and the superintendent, as to their delegation of authority to the superintendent to generate this implementing policy and to then proceed to administer the administration of this policy in the schools of the district. 
So, so just to follow up to council while she's commenting on this. So the first question was who owns it? We'll have to decide as a board, but to do that in my mind, we have to amend ADB to add explicit delegation to the superintendent to take charge of implementation as written in an ADBR. Um, the second part of that would be um, we would have to do that in basically what I understand from this evening. I thought it was a really good reference because what we would want to make sure is if this is the superintendent's current interpretation of existing policy, we could either maintain a changes or whatever we decide to do as a group of seven to ADB, which again, we own the what and the why. We certainly, and this goes for all policy, this is not unique to ADB. We don't own the how. Um, so we should make sure that we stick in our lane with anything we would do to ADB to the what and the why and make sure that we don't cross over into the how, which is a dash R policy in this case of the superintendent. And I thought it was, uh, I thought it was clarifying to make sure that as we discuss uh, tonight and then in a future work session, anything we may or may not do as a group of seven to ADB, we would be very careful of any conflicts. Not that we can have conflicts. If there were, the superintendent would have to align her policy to ours, like all board policy, but just to be aware of the direction that the superintendent and staff was going. So therefore, if that delegation is in ADB, you won't see a second reading and there won't be a vote on ADB-R. Thank you for the clarification. So we would not, if we delegate, would not vote on an ADB-R if the board, for whatever reasons, decides they want to retain responsibility for an ADB-R, ADB we would start with what was offered, drafted by staff, and we would take responsibility for that as a board, and then we would have to vote on an approval of ADBR. Did that answer your question, Director Hans? Okay. Do you, do you have any other follow-ups? All right, I've got one final one here, which is, uh, it, I actually think it echoes um, most of what Director Weininger, um, Director Meek, and, and Director Myers said. And um, my biggest concern when I voted to pass a resolution about a year ago around the policy was implementation. Um, Superintendent Kane, you even opened up tonight by saying, referring to your decision as the executive of American Academy to opt out that the wording of ADB could have led to multiple interpretations. And that's what I was seeing as one director. And even before being elected to this board, that's what I was seeing as a parent is there was my perception of a diversity of, of implementation, which was not consistent. Um, having an ADBR as you proposed in, uh, in effect, had that been in place right after ADB was passed, I think we would have avoided a lot of the ambiguity, a lot of the concerns over implementation. And, and I agree, I believe, with Director Meek that we're not really saying, oh, this is a massive change and we're going to start doing things this way. It largely, in my mind, codifies existing best practices that are already going on in the district under you know, the intent, well, I believe, the positive intent of ADB. So I applaud you, I applaud your staff. Everyone knows how, how much of work. I specifically, again, <laughs> echo Director Meek. Um, the fact that you broke out not just the policy and the intent, but the uh, professional development that will occur to support the implementation of that. At the end of the day, I mean, how long have we had a bullying policy here? Like forever as a district? yet we have problems with bullying. We can write the best policy in the world as a board, but if it is not implemented at the building level, at the classroom level, at the individual relationship level, it's all meaningless. I didn't mean to call our policies meaningless, but at the end of the day, it's the implementation that ultimately matters. So this is work for the board. This is work for the superintendent. This is work for the cabinet. This is work for all our staff and all our classroom leaders. And I'm not just talking educators. We've got uh, incredible role models in our law enforcement personnel and our bus drivers, uh, custodial staff, every member of this district. But frankly, it's also work for the students. Because at the end of the day, if the students don't buy into what you laid out, we're not gonna see change. So this is ownership from the board down to our newest student uh, coming in here. And as far as priorities, again, um, I would start as one director, man, I would start on the bullying side and the reporting. We heard it from students, we heard it from stakeholder groups. Um, you know, I know we've got a lot of stuff on our plate, I personally would love to see, again, with comments tonight on the bullying, 
that includes safe to tell clarifications and, and everything reporting that you're doing. My last uh, comment on that is, boy, that counselor handbook will be really good in transparency, something that parents have already asked for, um, communicating to parents. Again, it's nothing new. It's what we do. We do it really well. And just to have that certainty and reduce the fill in the blank. When we have any type of policies that have fill in the blank, I hate to say it, a lot of our community fills it in with negative. But to have that counseling handbook, again, another massive, huge lift. But I can only see that as an absolute positive, and I applaud your work in that area. Uh, Director Meek. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I did just want to highlight, you know, I also appreciated your story and totally agree that a student should be sitting in a classroom and not knowing the political you know, opinions of an educator. I believe that wholeheartedly. I think, um, I, as Director Myers said, I mean, we are in the classrooms, we are having <laughs> conversations. I think it's, it's really important for you to hear, you know, you gave the example about the Holocaust denial, right? Well, at one of the very first DAC meetings, a teacher said, what do I do when I have a family? And there are questions that our teachers have. And I, as I've talked with students in the classrooms, you know, they are clearly saying there are racial slurs or transphobic slurs. And I've heard teachers say, I'm not sure how to handle that. And I've heard you say loud and clear, we do not accept this, but I think there's a lack of clarity and I think that needs to be addressed immediately. Like, I'd love for you right now to say, teachers, this is what should happen if there's a racial slur in the classroom or a transphobic slur or, you know, anything like that. And so if, if you truly are saying we do not tolerate this, I think we need absolute clarity on how that is to be handled because I don't think there is clarity right now. And so I'll let you answer that, I'm sorry. Well, I thank you for that, for that comment. Um, we have some work to do to make sure that in terms of professional development and in terms of um, communicating consistent systems and responses throughout our system, that's part of what the um, red lines to JICB are all about. Um, and why we're working um, so hard in that area to make sure that we do have clarity across our system of what the response, what, a, what an investigation looks like and what an appropriate response looks like. Um, that's part of what's being laid out in our proposed red lines for JICB. Should those red lines um, make it through this process, then our very next step will be to make sure that we're communicating um, that information to our staff along with what to do. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything on my team. Does that summarize it pretty well? Okay. So thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And then just one last comment, and this is to my colleagues here. You know, 14 months ago, you know, we didn't have a level of trust where we could work with each other because we had the conversation 14 months ago that we really needed to, to be implementing. Like that was the step we should have been doing. And I'm really hopeful that we have grown over the past 14 months and we can have these conversations and listen to each other. But it's, it's hard to sit here and hear, oh yes, it's implementation when that's exactly what we were talking about 14 months ago. And we have had no, pro no progress, we've had a, some progress because we're looking at a regulation now, but it shouldn't have taken as long as it has. And I think our community deserves better. Any board members like to add a comment or respond? Okay, thank you, Superintendent Kane. Just for the board, um, if we can move through approval of minutes, then we'll take a break. So next item is item number 31, which is approval of minutes. And these are the minutes for the March 28th and April 11th board meeting. Do I have a motion regarding the approval of minutes as presented? Move to approve the minutes. Motion by Hanson. Second. Second. Give it to me. Oh, tie. Second by Meek. <laughs> uh, now I'll take the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. 
Myers? Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray, absent. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed six to zero. Um, 10 work for everyone. Okay, we will now take a 10 minute recess. We will reconvene at five minutes after.
We'll now resume. We are on item number 32, proposed policy ADB educational equity uh, proposed superintendent regulation first meeting, and we've got a 10 minute discussion. And I will open it up, and Mr. Blair, I see you're bringing up the uh, policy. There is no red line for this, so if you'd just like to bring it up, and, uh, and I'm not going to misstate this, if you can go to page five of three, Five of three. Trust me. So just just a minor thing. We've got uh, we've got some page numbering issues um, on there, and uh, the only other thing that I saw when I took notes was two things on this page. Uh, if you look under the main bullets of parent engagement, we have LEP, but it's not spelled out for anybody that's reviewing it. So thank you to Dr. Rummel, Ling limited English proficient, if we can just get that spelled out. And then there was also a reference in the presentation to policies, uh, KEC and KEC-R, public complaints about learning resources, which was referenced in the slides, but it's not referenced under the district policies that are applicable under parent engagement. Um, those were the only typos or, or things that I had on there. Um, with that, I'll just open it up to other board members on comments, questions around language, things they'd like to see. Director Williams. So we touched on this a little bit. Director Hansen had brought up the confusion and the blurriness between um, the R and then the board policy. And I'm probably a little bit of a outsider, maybe have a different opinion, but I personally believe that we should consider as a board making this a board file. And the reason I say that is because this has been such a um, charged issue with the public that if Superintendent Kane or a next superintendent decided to make changes, it would not have to be public and therefore the transparency aspect of what happens behind the scenes could be a concern. And I think it's important for us because this is such um, an important topic to the public that we are transparent about any implementation that might change in the future. So my recommendation as one board member is that we consider making it a board file. Other directors' comments or superintendent, if you'd like to comment on that. So I don't, uh, I don't want to comment on that per se, but I will <laughs> say that um, I am aware that there are a few discrepancies between the dash R file and the slides. So um, we will make sure to put an updated version, uh, yet another updated version of the slides on the um, e-board for anybody who is watching to make sure that um, those discrepancies, there's just a couple little ones that I noticed as going through, that those are resolved um, in response to President Peterson's comments. Um, but certainly it is at the board's discretion whether ADB-R is a board file or a superintendent file. We are, we are neutral on that matter. So whatever the board wants is fine. Okay, uh, just in response to Director Williams' comments, uh, I understand her concern. I think it's a valid concern. Um, I personally would actually like to, as one director, uh, move that we amend the uh, ADB draft to include delegations to the superintendent. Again, I think um, my understanding is we want to stick to the what and the why. We don't want to get into the how. I think there is a lot of how. There is a lot of granularity in uh, ADB-R, which I think would be a board overstep. Um, I would expect any future board, if this were not the superintendent in place and whatever, or this superintendent decided to make further changes to Dash R, I would expect them to come to the board and present I'm changing my superintendent policy, and this is not just for ADB. If there are any significant changes made to a Dash R policy, I would expect the board to at least be updated via memo or presentation or whatever applicable, depending on the magnitude of the changes. And because the superintendent would update the board, the board would have a chance to respond. Uh, that's just my opinion, but I would like to delegate it to the superintendent. Um, any other? comments on that or any other director questions or comments on ADB-R first reading is drafted or the theme? Director Meek. Yeah, I mean, my opinion on that topic would be to really follow traditional policy governance, which would be ADB and ADBR is delegated. 
and we monitor, right? And that's how we are being transparent and accountable to our public. And really we're giving the superintendent what she needs and holding her accountable. So I would prefer to delegate it if when we get there. Um, the question I had under um, page one, access to opportunities for all students, was it intentional not to list industry certifications? I just wasn't sure if it would be worth highlighting that. We talk about college prep programming, career tech ed courses. Yeah, and Mr. Blair, can we sure. go to page one just so we can all follow along? Thank you. I think it's at the bottom, uh, Director Meek, you're referring to. Yes. In, uh, my response to that would be it was not intentional industry certifications falls under career and technical education programming um, in, in our world. Okay. So that's a it, career and technical education programming includes um, industry certifications. Yeah, I just think it might resonate with the community and they might, they might not understand that. So it was just a thought. And then um, I meant to bring this up earlier where we talk about educational counseling and I feel like it gets a little confusing whether it feels like in different policies we will get into mental health aspects for counseling and we're using the term educational counseling and I'm not sure whether educational counseling works. I don't know if anyone else found that yeah, did you have a specific reference in ADVR where you're oh, seeing the words educational it, counseling? It's page three of three under student wellness needs. It just says educational counseling provided by school mental health providers is initiated in collaboration with parents who've been given informed consent. Um, is educational counseling the official term that we use for any and all yeah, types? And, and I may be able to answer that when we get to policy JDLA and JDLAR, which is item number 34 for this evening, uh, that is the recommended change la language. Uh, they use the term educational counseling throughout, and it is even defined in those policies. But I just wonder if someone's reading that here, if they might be confused. And so I just wasn't sure. Thank you. Needed clarification. Thank you. Um, yes, educational counseling was used intentionally. It is, it is um, our terminology of what we provide, and it is, as Director Peterson pointed out, in um, JLDA and GL, JLDA-R. Um, but I could, uh, we, it is certainly easy for us to provide additional clarification um, by saying something along the lines of educational counseling as defined in policy, JLDA, et cetera. Yeah, and I'm not sure if it's needed, but I think if through our feedback mechanisms, if other people maybe brought that up, then maybe it's worth clarification. Any other director's comments, uh, questions on uh, Director Weininger? I just want to call out a paragraph I really liked, which is on this page, the welcoming environment. Um, I'm just going to read it because I like it so much. DCSD is committed to fostering students' sense of belonging and wellness. Belonging refers to having positive relationships and feeling safe and connected within the community. Wellness refers to practicing healthy habits to attain better physical and mental health outcomes. Students will not be compelled to share personal information in public settings, including statements regarding their personal beliefs or circumstances. And students will have access to a trusted adult. Um, I love that because I feel like that's how I felt in school and I just want all of our students to feel that way and I would love to see that on all of our doors and our schools and um, well done on writing that. Yeah. Um, and then a question I did have was um, something I liked in the presentation that um, I'm not sure um, why it's not in the R's and maybe you just thought you'd do a more condensed version in the R's but the Curriculum Advisory Council, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, and is that just something that is planned for, but you don't didn't feel the need to put it in the R's, or just thoughts around that? Um, I different policy? think, sorry, I have to, there have been so many versions that have gone around, as you can imagine. Um, it was um, my intention to have the Curriculum Advisory Council called out and along with a reference to the policy that defines the Curriculum Advisory Council. So um, 
I can't find it right at the moment, so I may I, not have done that. I know it's in IJR is where okay. it, it is uh, yeah. stood up and referenced, uh, but I. It like, should be under it should be under academics and called out under section C. So we'll make yeah. sure to make a note. I was going to say that. I agree oh, with Director yeah. Weiniger. We'll it would be nice to cross reference yeah. here. Any other directors? <laughs> okay, thank you, Superintendent Kane. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, no, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask. I th go ahead, think Director I might Lee. know the answer, but I just want to make sure. So, in our ADB policy, it states the Board of Ed shall not condone by its staff, students, leadership, and it goes on to list biased, inequitable, racist, or exclusive practices, discriminatory behaviors, um, and it goes, there's a list. Mm -hmm. And I do see under page 3C, we have prevention of bullying. And so would everything be covered through the bullying policy when it's not bullying, but say it's biased, inequitable, discriminatory? Would all of those categories fit within bullying? And I know we're going to get to that policy, but I just want to make sure that that, that is where we would go to. Um, yes, those should be covered under um, bully, under prevention of bullying and um, as part of our professional development planning. So um, it's it's kind of a both. But um, the other thing, um, since you brought that up, Director Meek, that I would like to point out was um, one of the potential areas for confusion in ADB was the um, a deficit-based educational framework, which um, <clears throat> I believe ADB-R has interpreted to um, not mean that we're not um, addressing deficits in our kids' learning. And in fact, through the integrated multi-tiered systems of su system of supports, we are actually addressing gaps in learning. And so that clarifies that um, piece of it along with the um, clarity around high expectations for every student. <clears throat> Other directors? Um, just, I should have prefaced all of this and I will back up. Um, we've got a whole queue of policy up here tonight. Um, before we go to, these are all first readings with the exception of item number 41, which already had a previous first reading. So just for clarity for the three people that are left awake and still listening to the board, um, these are all first readings. There are going to be no votes on the policy tonight. All these policies will come to a second reading one month to now, uh, one month from now at the end of May. We will have additional public comment prior to those second readings and votes. And specifically to policy ABD, we will have a scheduled work session for the entire um, board of directors, all seven of us, to take extra time to specifically work on that policy. Uh, so that will have some comments tonight dedicated work session on Monday, May 8th, and then that, again, will have uh, additional potential changes and will be voted on in May. So just to be real clear, we're not voting on any of these policies tonight. We're just getting a board sense of questions and concerns in case slight modifications may need to be made. With that, I'll return to uh, item 32 if there's any more questions from directors regarding ADB-R as it sits today. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to item number 33. This is policy proposed revisions to policy JICB. That is the prevention of bullying first reading. Again, these were uh, recommendations from staff to the board on how they believe uh, this policy need to be changed. Thank you, Mr. Blair, for having that up there. Go ahead, Superintendent Kane. I'm so sorry to jump in. Just a quick um, follow-up to Director Meek's question. Um, policy JPA also um, addresses uh, racial slurs, et cetera. And so I appreciate the comment, and we are going to connect policy JPA through ADB-R. So that's a note that we've taken um, as a revision. Thank you very much. Good evening. Oh, sorry. 
Ready? Go ahead, Council okay. Jacobs. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to talk about the genesis of the revisions to JICB and the process that we're undertaking both to um, go through the policy and also to develop the implementation piece, because that's obviously very important as we've discussed. The revisions came about because of a change in state law that initiate, initially came from the direction of the legislature to the Department of Education to develop model bullying policies and guidelines. And then the policy or the statute was then changed directing district boards to implement and develop policies that were consistent with the guidelines and policies that had been developed by CDE. So that's where we are now. Um, we started off, uh, Attorney Clemish and I put together a committee that we wanted to include stakeholders at different levels of dis district administration, including principals from both middle high school and elementary school. Uh, directors of schools, folks from um, Dr. Crawford and Dr. Smith's departments, and we just wanted to get a really broad base, both because it's important to, to get their perspective on the language, but also because ultimately that's where the rubber meets the road, and that's that those are the folks that are going to know the questions to ask and to understand the training that needs to go into place in order to... Um, to do those policies. So the, the language, the revised language in JICB largely comes straight out of the definitions. For example, there's a revised definition of bullying that comes straight from the CDE model policy and guidelines. And we made an effort to incorporate into those definitions the federal definitions that are also used so that we don't have different definitions that people are trying to understand. We wanted to have some uniformity so that there would be clarity. And, um, and then just put into place the different, the prevention and intervention and reporting pieces, those are, again, straight out of the, the CDE requirements. And so some of it was just us massaging the language so that it was concise, so that it made sense. Um, but then, Another piece that we are continuing to work on, I think we put the, the committee together back in January and really started doing the work in um, February as far as having meetings and, and deciding what, what were our priorities. The language of the policy to me is sort of, you know, that's the bare bones. And now what the committee is really working on is reporting forms, investigation forms, because those will represent the way that all of this is gonna look on the ground. And that is really where the school folks and the district administration has just been invaluable. Um, their insight is, is, so, is so wise and um, they, they're the ones who know what they're doing. Like I'm just the lawyer, I can help write some words, but they're the ones that really put them into effect. And so that's, that's where we are at this point. Okay, with that, I'll open it up to directors. Director Hansen. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify for my own purposes, um, are the definitions um, something that we have any ability to change the language in, or is it pretty much, I, I don't like the definition of bullying, for example. I don't think that to, to be a bully that there needs to be an imbalance of power. I think that that really limits what we are going to address and that isn't at all what I want to do. But if there's no reason to even have that conversation because this is the change that's coming from far above our level of authority, then I will just save my comments other than I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I get that. The The language in the, from the definition is, it comes both from state statute and also from the CDE guidance that talked about the characteristics of bullying. Because I think that the word bullying can be used sort of in the vernacular in a very broad sense to describe, and this is, you know, it's not that people are trying to paint with a broad brush, but sometimes conduct can be described as bullying when it's really just a conflict or when people have a disagreement or when kids are, you know, sort of snipping at each other. And there is a very specific legal definition that is used, for example, by the Office for Civil Rights or in investigating Title IX violations, things like that, that does have that very specific component of an imbalance of power, the ability of the bully to um, influence the bully, the, the bully, the victim, in, um, in some way. And so we wanted to make that clear in order to differentiate 
bullying from other kinds of disputes or harassments, because that is something that the statute actually calls out. That, there are, that bullying doesn't mean any time there's a disagreement or any time people are upset at the way they're, they're being treated or spoken to by others. It, it, it does fall within uh, a specific definition, and it is kind of a legal term of art, which is why it sounds very legally in, in this. So we, I did try to incorporate both the plain language of the statutory definition with some of the guidance language so that it could flesh it out and make it more clear about exactly what it is we're talking about. Okay. And along those same lines, is the language that's been added around retaliation and false accusations also in that, would that fit under the same category of we need to follow state law? It, you mean in terms of calling out false accusations as something? And including it here in this policy, is this something that we really don't have a lot of flexibility to even Not discuss? really. I mean, I do think, you know, it's, it's covered in our other policies about the implications uh, and the consequences for, for making false accusations. Um, I, I did when I was drafting this, and this has gone through multiple iterations. Like, I basically said, here's, here's a template. Let's go through and, and tinker with it. Um, but I do think it's important to highlight that just to make it clear, because we do have a lot of work on the, the reporting mechanisms. And, and I personally, because I deal with a lot of um, school folks and, and the types of school administration calls come to me when, they're, when they come to the legal office, there are a lot of instances where um, both parents and school folks are really frustrated by the use of safe to tell and other mechanisms to you know, you can sort of put it out there because it's anonymous and there aren't really any consequences. And so I think it was important to call out that absolutely we want people to use these mechanisms. And it's important that, that students and staff understand the ways that reports can get to them so that they can be acted upon. But I do think it's also important for people to understand that false, false accusations and false reports are, are going to get some attention as well. Okay. Um, just conversation, but um, I don't really like how the the definition of bullying is, God, I keep doing that, so, um, I don't like by how the definition of bullying is defined as repeated, and um, that is going to take multiple instances to amount to a claim of bullying, and in the situation that was just described of retaliation, that's one time. And to have, and I understand the need to prevent that retaliation piece or the false accusation piece, um, especially the false accusation piece, but um, I don't like that there's that imbalance of, um, of how we're taking care of the victim in this situation. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that, and that's certainly something that we can look at when we're, when we're looking at the language. Um, in terms of aligning this definition with the definitions that are used in other types of, you know, when you're talking about civil rights discriminations, for example, bullying has a very specific meaning. And you can have it, it, the, the statutory language and the, and the language that's used by the agencies that enforce it refer to severity, it's severe pervasive um, and so you can have severity and pervasiveness shown in different ways. If it's really, really severe, then you're not going to have to have as many instances to make it pervasive. If it's something that is not quite as dramatic but is repeated over time, then that can meet the standard as well. And so I think that I can look at it and see if there are ways that we can sort of massage that and, and make it clearer. But I, that was a deliberate attempt to align this definition with, with the definitions that are used in other legal contexts. Superintendent Kane. Yes, and just to, uh, just to add to that, um, I want to be sure to being students being mean to each other, even if it's not in the context of repeated and an imbalance of power is still something that we have an obligation Correct. to deal with in our schools through our discipline policy. But if you look up, for example, the um, Cambridge uh, definition of, of bullying, it, it does involve that imbalance in power and that um, repeated. That's a pretty common um, adoption of the um, definition of bullying. And, and um, as Council uh, Jacob said, that's um, very common, not only is it common in statute, but it's also common um, in practice. But I do want to be clear that when students are 
um, being mean to each other and things like racial slurs are covered in um, under harassment and discrimination and perhaps um, uh, Council Jacobs, you can talk a little bit about racial slurs in particular. Sure, and and that that's uh, that was a point that I was gonna make, so I appreciate you making that point. That just because something doesn't meet the legal definition of bullying doesn't mean that it's not actionable for disciplinary purposes or that it's not something that people are gonna address. Um, I think that there are, there are behaviors that can be sort of codified in multiple ways. So for example, when I've been working with the Office for Civil Rights as part of their investigations, and they're looking for specific instances of bullying, I would look at bullying, I would look at harassment, I would look at all different things because sometimes they're just codified differently. And certainly part of the implementation of any policy will be to help educate staff to understand how this particular type of behavior should be identified, for example, in Infinite Campus. But I think that racial slurs absolutely can be considered bullying. They can also be considered harassment. I mean, there, there are different ways to, to call it. It doesn't change what it is. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, and I, I frankly share uh, Director Hansen's concerns on the language. If I could may maybe offer just changing the order under uh, a, letter A there. Bullying is um, intentional, including physical, social, or social, or, or excuse me, uh, is intentional and may in, and may include repeated. And you know, if mm -hmm. we just put that clause in there that it's intentional uh, and may include repeated actions and or marked by an imbalance of power, so it doesn't have to include that, but we can keep it in there to honor the legal ease. Um, just putting that may include, I think, makes me feel more open sure. because that way we can deal with those singular instances of bullying and just say, hey, look, any instance that, that's flagrant or, like you said, it's a, what was that thing in a famous Senate trial, a, a congressman or a senator stood up and said, I don't know what the definition of pornography but, but, is, but I know, I know what I it is it. when yeah. I see it. <laughs> Bullying's the same thing. For we, sure. can, we can squabble over definitions, yes. but I trust our staff, our building leaders, our classroom leaders, they know what it is and they know what it is when they see it. And we would expect them to be empowered to use discretion to separate instances uh, that may not rise to the occasion to ones that are truly acts of bullying. Yeah, and, and, and that's that's absolutely right. And certainly later on in the policy, like when, when it's talked about um, the consequences, and this is definitely fleshed out in some of the, the dash R's that we're working on, um, it points out that the various disciplinary interventions that are available under our code for all kinds of different infractions, whether it's discrimination, whether it's harassment, all of those can come into play based upon the, the sort of considered discretion, the educational expertise of the folks in the schools to determine how to deal with disciplinary, um, with behavioral infractions that always, we can always apply those to any instances of bullying just as we would for any other kind of misconduct. Yeah, and Mr. Blair, can you slow, uh, scroll down slightly? Uh, keep going. Uh, right there. Uh, my favorite, I'll just echo Director Weiniger, my favorite line in this policy as defined above bullying, retaliation, and false accusations are prohibited. I don't think it can get any clearer than that. So um, I appreciate the clarity. Uh, the rest of it where the staff has put an incredible effort to um, bolster reporting and intervention and I think uh, I'd like to applaud you for the work. I, I can't find anything that I would disagree with or that's unclear for, for me, but I think that is something, again, we've heard it from student groups, we've heard it from focus groups, and I really appreciate that addition to this policy. Again, policy alone, I said it earlier, is meaningless unless we get implementation, but I think this reporting whole section that was, added, was added um, is absolutely going to improve the clarity and the intent 
that can follow on to uh, uh, professional development and ultimately to implementation. So thank you for your work on that. And I appreciate that. And I, I definitely cannot take credit for that. The, the folks that we've assembled as part of this committee have been amazing at coming up with creative ways and really talking through all of the implementation pieces that I certainly am not an expert in. So like I said, I, I, I can write the words and help people with the language, but they're the ones that really do the hard work. And so the credit has to go to them. Other directors, uh, Director Williams and Director Meek. Yeah, so I 100% um, support the friendly amendment that um, President Peterson just mentioned. I guess my question would be, how does this roll out to our, like how do we inform our schools to let them know that there's changes to the policy, that they're trained and all of that sort of stuff? And that is, that is something that we are still actively working on. Like, as, as I said, there are a lot of things where, that get down to the nitty gritty that are being included in, in terms of our development of the reporting forms and the investigation forms. And, and part of developing the form is thinking about, okay, well, if somebody has this situation, what is it gonna look like? Do we need this section? Should we add something else? And all of that is part of an active process that we're still undergoing. But a huge amount of the discussion has been, how do we push this out to, to teams in school so that they understand what the definitions are, what the obligations are, and how to make it consistent throughout the district so that we can implement it with fidelity. Superintendent Kane, then back to Director Meek. Yeah, just, just to um, add to that response, um, there's also been a lot of discussion around the common use of terminology, not only within our system, but also among our community and our families. So making sure that our parents understand um, what the definition of, of bullying is and um, making sure that we have a common, and similarly to how Director Meek asked about um, how are we going to communicate all of this to people? And I, my response was, you know, via our website, having an FAQ. Um, we want to make sure that we have a similar central area district wide to address um, bullying in terms of definitions, reporting, all of those things that's consistent across our entire district. Um, but that is a, a very heavy lift and definitely involves work with all of our school leaders. Um, in making sure that everybody is is together in that, but it is that is work that is very important and is prioritized. Thank you. And Thank I would you. just say that certainly an example of racial slurs and the kind of behavior that we heard about earlier, which is awful. That's a very clear example. Like to me, there's no dispute that that could be discrimination, harassment, and bullying all wrapped up in one. I think where it gets a little bit. Um, less clear to, to folks in schools, and also sometimes to parents, is my child got in a fight with somebody and they're, they're bullying my child. That's, sometimes that's just using a word that, that is different from what the legal definition is. And so I think part of the policy is understanding what truly constitutes bullying so that we can implement this policy well and what is fighting what is something that could be resolved through restorative justice. I mean, there, there are a lot of nuances there. I, th I think racial slurs, is that's an easy one. But I, th I think it's the, the, the fuzzier ones where there needs to be more clarity about the exact definitions and how to, how to, how to deal with it. Director Meek. Sorry. <laughs> Well, and I also think before rolling it out, it's like all the training, right? Sure. So everyone needs to know how to talk about it, right, as it's rolled out. But it kind of reminded me, I didn't ask this earlier, the process for feedback on these policies. And President Peterson, you mentioned there'll be a month, right, before these come back for adoption. Um, and, you know, being really intentional that it goes out to all of our board committees, right? And... Um, going out to EAC, I, we did have some great conversations, but they didn't have it in front of them to actually react to. And that was some of the feedback we heard from DAC and, and my breakout group was, I'm the kind of person I need to be able to read it, right, and have time to digest it. So I think just being really intentional with 
the next month's board committee meetings and everything, but also I think about being really intentional with making sure that our charter schools have an opportunity to receive this, provide feedback. I truly believe it's going to be as strong as possible if we ensure everyone out there is weighing in and has an opportunity. So that was on the feedback. But my only other thing on the policy, under investigating and responding, it starts off with procedures will be developed. I'm not really comfortable with procedures will be developed without a firm deadline there, unless maybe they'll be developed by the time we approve this. But I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with a policy rolling out that just says we'll have procedures at some point in the future. It's page three under investigating and responding. Yeah, Mr. Blair, if you just go there, it's right after, uh, right before yeah. discipline, uh, right at the very top of the screen, Director Hanson. And in terms of that, as I said, a lot of that is what we're doing right now. We're developing the R's, which includes forms that have detailed instructions about, you know, if it's this kind of behavior, then go here. And we're trying to make those both comprehensive and also user friendly. And so sometimes you, there's a lot of massaging that goes on because you don't want to lose detail in the interest of making things more digestible. So that is absolutely going on right now. I mean, those, those drafts are, we're working on those. Yeah, and just one last thing. Um, this speaks to student bullying. Do we have anything around our staff being bullied? Is, are there policies or where would that fall? Thank you for the question, Director Meek. I, I don't know all of the G policies off the top of my head, but I believe we have a staff professional conduct policy, which likely would include unprofessional sorts of behaviors, which would include harassing, intimidating conduct. We also have a very specific policy that prohibits discrimination and harassment by staff members in the workplace and in the educational environment. And that includes not only staff on staff, but staff to students, yeah, I et just cetera. I wasn't, wasn't sure if maybe it needs to be revisited if there are definition changes or if it goes into defining bullying. The, the definition changes in staff should only apply to, to students. To students. Okay. Yeah. And we, we did see uh, Chief HR Officer uh, Amanda Thompson nodding in the affirmative to <laughs> Council Klamesh's comments about uh, what is in place, uh, Superintendent Kane. Yes, and uh, as you saw tonight, um, Dr. Crawford gets also talked about our mandatory training and so staff um, discrimination, harassment, et cetera, that is um, staff on staff is also, including power imbalance, mm -hmm. is also um, part of our training every single year that every staff member receives. And just for the record, uh, uh, Director of Choice Programming, Gordon Mosher, also gave a big thumbs up and nodding when it was uh, requesting feedback from our charter partners. So. And I'm sorry, one more. Um, I noticed we're taking out pictorial, and this is on the first paragraph under definitions on page one. So if you go all the way to the top, I think we're eliminating pictorial language. Do you guys see it? Yeah. Um, so the second line under bullying and the definition. So, you know, I'm just wondering, was that intentional? Because I, I know there are hate symbols out there that are used, and I didn't know if that would be covered it elsewhere. Would, because under the under all of the definitions of documents that apply to whether it's open records or anything else. A written or oral expression includes everything. It includes things in writing, it includes a PDF, it can be a picture, so all of that. I mean, we can certainly add it back in, but it, that I believe that it would be comprehensive, but it's certainly. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, sure. because I do know, you know, I yes. want to make sure that's being covered. Yes. So. Any other directors? And I know we went long on this one, but this has obviously been an area of concern, so we're, we were going to run over on this. Sure. Any other guidance that Superintendent Kane that you need from the board regarding this policy? 
Uh, no, I believe we've collected um, your feedback and um, we'll continue to collect feedback over the next month in preparation for second reading. Um, I believe we have clarity on what we need to change. Great. Okay, thank you, Council Jacobs. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to policy, and, and by the way, we're going to take a break halfway through these, so uh, we'll now move on to policy JLDA, Student Mental Health Wellness Services in a School Setting, uh, and this includes policies JLDA and JLDAR. Stephanie Smith and Kelly Crawford Getz. Uh, it was a it was a joke. <laughs> it was intentional. We gotta have a little levity. It's been a long night, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want to start? Or sure, I can start. So we updated this policy. Um, when you see in the original wording, there was a lot of clinical terms. And there needed to be some clarity around what our educational counseling services were how students receive them and parental consent as well. And so we wanted to um, really clean this up and make sure that it spoke to what we're doing in schools versus what can happen in any setting around mental health. Um, we're proud of this work and in preparing for this, we actually had opportunity for every counselor, school psychologist and social worker to look at the original policy with us and make um, suggestions for edits, and we took all of that feedback for making these edits. So this is something that wasn't just the two of us or even our team, although our teams worked really hard on this, but this was every single person that wanted to work on it in our mental health roles in the schools. So that was the feedback to start with this. Okay, thank you, and I'll open it up to directors. Um, I'll go first, because sure. I did talk to the two of you yeah. about this policy, and my going on position was, uh, because I sit on the Safety and Security Council, and there's so much exposure that Director Hansen and I get to the inner workings of, whether it's crisis response, whether it's resilience, whether it's, I mean, everything mental health and counseling uh, that goes on, and, and the great partnerships between the district, law enforcement, everything like that. I knew that what we were doing was really, really good. I mean, literally nationally recognized. And I did not even want to take a crack at this and get it wrong. So I think the charge here was, tell us what it is that you do do. So my question is, you've clarified everything, codified everything that you do. I, I really like the the assuring language, especially for parents, given a national conversation, which probably doesn't apply here to what's actually going on in Douglas County, but it still assuages fears. Um, does this in any way, uh, although you're restating everything and there's a lot of changes, does this really change what has been going on in the district, you know, in, in recent history, certainly since I've been on the board? Or is there some changes in direction that you're making based on improvement, best practices, or things like that? Um, I, I think what this really did was try to clarify uh, for our community what the role really is. It's not therapeutic counseling, it's access to academics and we support counseling services to have them access academics. So if a student is struggling with a significant mental health concern, we refer to outside therapists for that. If a student comes in and has a crisis, we support them in the crisis and get them outside help, but we are educational counselors um, to access that educational aspect of it. That's the big reason for the change because there was some confusion about what actually counselors' role were in the school, so we wanted to make sure that was clear. Absolutely. Does that help? And I, I think when you look at the changes, that was needed because there are a lot of um, misrepresentation sometimes or myths about what we're doing. For example, we don't diagnose anything in the schools. That's, that's something you do medically. What we do is evaluate and assess, and we identify if there are educational disabilities that need support. Um, we don't treat. We do educational interventions. And so we wanted to really clarify that for our community because it wasn't clear in the original policy what we were doing as mental health professionals in our schools. So, so to sum this up, again, this is an uneducated board member's uh, interpretation. 
what I think this entire policy says is right there up the front, educational counseling, and it's defined in the next paragraph, but is provided by mental school providers, is initiated in collaboration with parents who are given informed consent and written permission. So the first premise is we will coordinate, collaborate, and work uh, together with parents. I believe when we dig into the minutia, there are some exceptions. So when a student is at risk, comes in and says, I may want to self-harm or something like that, we will never turn the student away if we cannot contact the parent. Also in response to some type of mass trauma, um, death of a student, death of a teacher, God forbid, some type of school violence, um, we're gonna come in and start talking to those students and staff members immediately if we can't get informed consent. And what's not in here, but should be explicit because we are all, even the board members, mandatory reporters. Um, if there is a parent that would qualify for mandatory reporting or a guardian or whatever where we suspect abuse, this is all out the window, and we have our mandatory reporting responsibilities as staff members um, under statute to go a completely different direction. That stops the consultation consent because we are in a whole other lane. Is that a, a very fair but crude uh, summary of what these policies say? Yes, that that's accurate, and and that other piece is really clarifying for parents that we want to partner and that they have informed consent for their students. So thank you. I would like to add, though, this was something that came up with our counseling leadership team, that our students will be working with counselors on academic plans, and that doesn't apply here. So they see lots of students for academic plans, particularly in the high school, and that wouldn't fall under this policy. Okay, last question, I'll turn it over to other directors. Was there anything like the previous bullying policy, any changes in Colorado statute or federal law or things that forced a reflection or a change in this policy? Not that I'm aware of. No, not that I'm aware no. of. No. Okay. Any other directors? Okay, Director Meek. Yeah, I think this goes back to my question on the ADB policy. Mm -hmm. So let's see. The second to last paragraph on page one where it says, all students shall have access to their school mental health staff for situations when a student needs emotional or behavioral support for an immediate need. So it's the for an immediate need that really is qualifying this. So a student comes in there, they need immediate support with anxiety or some, some form. We will help students. Um, and so I think that's what was kind of missing from the ADB because it only talks about educational um, counseling. A yeah, sorry, there's way too many letters. Um, <laughs> ADBR under student mental, under student wellness needs only references the educational counseling. There's no mention of you know, mental health support. Okay. And I, I think that's what I felt was missing. There's no mental health support. Okay. So um, I believe what I'm hearing you say, perhaps, Director Meese, is that perhaps adding a reference in ADBR to um, crisis support would, um, would address that concern. And certainly crisis support is covered in JLDA. Also, too many leathers, too late at night. But thank you. Did that address your concern? I think so. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other directors? All right, thank you to Drs. Uh, Kelly Smith and Stephanie Crawford Getz. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now moving on to item number 35 proposed, re proposed revisions to policy IJ, textbook and instructional materials selection and adoption. Go ahead, Mr. Reynolds. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. We, we touched on this earlier. Um, really, the revisions here are pretty minor, um, but there are some things that I do want to call out specifically. Um, in the very first paragraph where it calls out a specific person as a chief academic officer, 
Um, de depending on the configuration, uh, the superintendent can make the decision of who gets that responsibility, so we eliminated that section. Uh, we currently do not have specialists in, in curriculum. We, we call them coordinators. Again, the idea of, of clarifying. Um, and then the other uh, things in the middle of this under purpose, uh, there are two things that are misaligned currently. Um, you all have an active resolution that was passed years ago reaffirming our commitment to the Colorado Academic Standards, and that didn't live in this policy. So we have that reference twice. Uh, the other thing that was not referred here is your actual goals. Um, the goals weren't referenced. And so we updated that first uh, number one to make sure that your goals are referenced. Um, so it was called out specifically for uh, textbook and novel adoptions. And with that, I will open it up to any board directors, questions, comments. Mr. Reynolds always gets the easy ones. <laughs> I want to give all directors a chance. Okay, we have no questions for Mr. Reynolds, straight to a second reading. Uh, we will now move on to item number 36, proposed revisions to policy IJA, selection of controversial learning reading, uh, selection of controversial learning resources. Okay, um, again, this was a really minor change, uh, but it's really reflective of the language of the current standards. Uh, so uh, instead of having it listed as 21st century skills, the state now refers to that as uh, the Colorado essential skills. And so really it's, it's making that uh, one adjustment uh, to a language. Board directors, Director Meek. My only question is in the second paragraph, um, we're still, the first sentence, we're still referring to the district approved guaranteed and viable curriculum. Um, should that be Colorado academic standards? I think we changed the other policy. We removed that phrase and inserted Colorado academic standards. Yes, 100%. Okay. <laughs> Perfect, just checking. And then, um, let's see. Is it a typo that's being corrected on the second to last paragraph, three lines? Nope, sorry. <laughs> um, where it says, if an teacher is in doubt, I think it's just a typo, and I think it's corrected, but it's still showing. So I've just... Yes, uh, okay. we, we had that captured, it's just not red. Right. It's just, okay. I was gonna say the just clean kidding. version okay. has the correction. Yeah. Yes. Any other directors? Okay, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. We will now move on to the third of the Mr. Reynolds trifecta, uh, policy IJC, instructional resources. Um, excellent, thank you very much. So IJC, we had um, really, one uh, change that's reflected twice, uh, we soften the language uh, from an objection to a concern. Um, the introductory conversation, th this really lays out the process by which a parent's pathway is to have a conversation about resources, curriculum, or what's being taught. Um, and we're suggesting that that language be softened. Not everything has to be an objection. It could be a concern. It could very well just be a conversation, and so softening that language would open the door um, to allow parents to be able to do, I think, what you all aspire to, which is go have a conversation regarding um, a resource or a standard or a particular lesson. So I see a mirroring of what the board did previously with policy KE. Yes. Okay. Um, directors, comments, questions, uh, excuse me, concerns. Um, regarding the, this red line. Seeing none, we will let Mr. Reynolds leave the stand and we will move on to number President 30. Peterson. Oh, go ahead. I apologize. Um, not for you, but before we move on to the next one, um, I wasn't fast enough and um, I just had a quick follow-up question to JLDA. If we could pop back there for yeah, just a Mr. second. Mr. Blair, if you could just pull that up. Thank you, Director Hanson. 
I thought we were going to discuss JLDAR separately, but um, when I was looking back at JLDA, it does not have the same designation of authority language to create an R policy that if, and I wasn't aware of that, so it wasn't in my notes. I didn't realize that was something that we needed to have consistently throughout our policies. But if that is our goal to have consistently, it needs to be incorporated in JLDA. I, I believe okay. that is one that we have to own. Um, oh, there you yeah, go. That yes. is one. So we, we director, or excuse me, Council Clemesh, if you'd like to comment on that, or superintendent, either one. Yeah, we were both, I think, going to say the same thing, which is in the case specifically of JLDA-R, you cannot delegate authority to the superintendent. That is why it is actually listed as a first reading, and it is because what is in JLDA-R is statutorily required to be in the lane of the Board of Education. Um, Council Klamesh may want to add to that. I just would like to note that under the present chart we have with respect to delegation of authority, the board has maintained authority in the past for JLDA as well as JLDA-R. And they're both board policies and have been board policies uh, in the past. So it is a board election to maintain authority over JLDA-R or it is a requirement that it stays a, st a requirement under state law, I'm assuming, that it stays under the board's authority. I must, I haven't specifically looked at the statutory requirements in response to your specific question, but that would be my understanding as to why those designations have been made. But we certainly could prepare a memo with that legal response for your board of education if that's what the board would like. We'd be happy to do that. Okay, I don't necessarily need a memo. I just need it to be correct. So whatever whatever the right answer is, um, I trust you to dig yeah. that up and to have the language and the policy appropriately yeah. before it, we have a second reading. And, and just so that the board understands, under policy, I believe it's BE or BEG with respect to policy development, the board can maintain authority over any district policy that has been delegated to the superintendent or take it back under that policy as well. So I'm not certain, and I don't think any of us would be, as to necessarily the history of why a particular R policy was maintained by the board in the past. Um, so to, just to sum up, we will check if that is legally required. If it is not legally required, um, it sounds like the board would be inclined for us to come back to second reading with uh, a revision in JLDA that would um, delegate JLDA-R to the superintendent for consistency, um, assuming that there is no legal requirement otherwise. Did I capture that? Yes, thank you. I, I, I think you captured that perfectly. Okay, thank you, Director Hanson. Um, does anyone, just to go back to the end of item number 37 then before we move on, 37 was uh, IJC. Uh, any further questions before we move on to item number 38? Okay, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. We'll move on to item number 38, proposed revisions to policy ADF, student wellness. So the only thing that we added to this one was that behavioral wellness and the intentional integration of IMTSS, the integrated multi-tiered system of support. Director, comments, questions regarding ADF? Thank you, Dr. Smith. We will move on to KBB, and then we will take a break quickly before, AD, before ADB. Uh, next is proposed revisions. Thank you, Mr. Blair, to policy KBB, parent and family engagement. And, and maybe the first question I would have is, I know that there is a CASB file KB that's a, a standard uh, Colorado Association of School Boards file KB, which looks nothing like our current KBB. So um, I guess is there a recommendation from staff 
on whether we would change this to KB. We don't have a KB, by the way. That's the reason I bring this up. Uh, we do not maintain a current policy KB. And uh, if the superintendent or somebody can refresh me, I think it's more around, uh, it's around a different subject. Does anyone, can anybody help me with that? But we do not currently maintain a policy KB. Uh, so the question is, would we rename this to KB since we don't have a parent policy or would we just keep it as KBB? Uh, President Peterson, I'm afraid we don't have an answer for that. Um, I, uh, I will say that with respect to um, the revision submitted for policy KBB, the, I just, um, I'm sure you're about to point it out, but I want to point out that the national standards for family and school partnerships were all updated consistent with those um, national standards. So thank you for that. Yes, uh, Mr. Blair, can, can you actually, that. thank you. Can you actually put up the, thank you, there's the red line. Uh, so if you look at um, the changes to policy KBB, there's some uh, simple grammatical clarifications using the term the board up there and then following through the policy. Everything that you're looking at at the bottom where there was a strikeout in red and an insertion in blue, uh, we had the 2018 SACPI standards in there, which were updated in 2021. Uh, the additions are literally cut and paste from the updated SACPI standards. Uh, if you want to scroll down, Mr. Blair, that carries us all the way through uh, collaborating with the community. And then there is a significant amount of additions around parents' rights and expectations. Uh, at this point, I'll open it up to any director questions and comments about that section or any other part of KBB. Director Meek. Uh, thanks for walking that. Thanks for walking us through that. Um, did you help create the changes to this policy? Uh, yes, I did, and that was based on um, a bunch of parent feedback. And again, uh, just like we had in the mental, um, in our revision to our former psychological services policy, um, these were things that I believe mostly are already being done in the district, but again, it was to codify the things that we are largely um, already doing in many cases just to prevent people from filling in a blank, which was probably not accurate. Again, maybe something that's going on nationally or statewide, um, but to codify issues of how we were treating opt-in, opt-out, and other aspects of parent engagement here in Douglas County. But yes, to answer your question, uh, those are mostly my suggestions. Okay. Um, yeah, I looked up the SACPI. It's actually the PTA creates those. I wasn't sure if anyone knew that. I kind of researched that last night. It was interesting. Um, so just for clarity for everyone, the PTA is actually the source of those. And the SACPI, which is always fun to say, <laughs> adopts those and uses those. Yeah, really my only comment on this policy is I really don't think the parent rights and expectations belong in this policy. The way the policy is stated, you know, the purpose of this policy is about connecting and engaging with parents. Um, I think parent rights is something different. Um, I absolutely support parent rights and um, I think if we want to look at having a separate policy that talks about rights, that would make more sense to me than inserting it in this policy. But if we were, and I know we've talked about this topic before when we did our legislative priorities, um, I absolutely would want to ensure we start off with student rights in a policy. We talk about parent rights, we talk about staff rights, we talk about our community members' rights. So if we wanna have a policy that's focused on the rights of all of our stakeholders, I'd be really open to talking about that, but I don't feel like it fits in this policy. Okay, thank you, Director Meek. And as you uh, pointed out, this was a, frankly, um, we needed to update the SACPI standards. And based on our discussions at our board retreat, 
where we were discussing legislative priorities and some language was removed, that's when I stated my intention to, okay, we will put that into another existing policy. Uh, don't disagree with your uh, emphasis on staff rights, student rights, all those other things. However, this is parent engagement, which is why I omitted any reference to student rights, staff rights, other people's rights, other than the rights of, the, of parents um, and decisions that we would support as we're engaging with them in, in understanding what their desires are in terms of expectations from the system uh, relative to their students' education. Go ahead, Director Meek. I mean, I, I would just argue that all of our policies, not all of our policies, but many of our policies are inherently about parent rights. When you look at instructional materials and controversial, you know, all of that really is articulating it. So if you really want to highlight, and I think that's kind of what we did with our equity policy. I think our equity policy was around intentionally calling out a proactive statement around what educational equity means in our schools. Um, and yet it's woven, right, through many of our policies. And I feel like the parent rights is kind of the same thing. It's really woven through all of our policies. And if we feel like it's worthy of, of calling it out and articulating it, I think it's more around a rights policy, not an engagement policy. And I think by not having other student rights captured somewhere, I, I think it's an imbalance. And I, I would hate to put out a message that we're doing something that's, you know, putting us off balance, which we've all talked about is so really important with respecting everyone's rights. So. For that reason, I, I feel pretty strongly it just does not belong within this policy, but I'm open to us maybe in our work session looking at a rights policy that really starts off with student rights and then parents and teachers and community members. Okay, other director's comments, concerns? Director Williams. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this can totally fit in the, in this policy because it is talking about, yes, it's talking about parental rights, but it is talking about parents being engaged and how they can engage with opt-ins, opt-outs. So it does talk about engagement, even though the title says rights. I, I, I believe it fits in this policy and I, I support what's said here, so. Other directors, concerns, comments, questions? One thing I would like to point out, if you can go down, uh, Mr. Blair, under the consent for mental wellness counseling, obviously if we, that is conditional on approving changes to JLDA and JLDAR, because it'll actually have to read student mental wellness services uh, in a school setting, things like that. We've got so many potentially interconnected things that we'll have to wordsmith these almost live time as policies are approved going forward. Um, so that was important to note there. Um, other than that, any other questions, concerns around this policy before we take a break and move on? Okay, let's take uh, 10 minutes and come back at 1020. And um, we'll make it quick and we will resume at that time.
ADB, Educational Equity. And again, I will just reiterate that there is a special meeting that is due to take place on May 8th, a week from Monday uh, at 4 p.m., which we will get properly noticed. And we will have an opportunity as a board of seven instead of six uh, to go ahead and continue some very dedicated work on any changes to ADB with that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Blair, for having that up. And before we start discussion on this, um, I'd like to acknowledge Director Hansen, who uh, agreed to meet with me on multiple occasions. I think the intent of our meeting together was to understand different perspectives on what the intent of the policy was uh, when it was written, some different interpretations. Um, I want to be very clear, anything that's up there in blue or red is what I did. Director Hansen's not being asked to own any of that, but I would like to thank her for multiple hours of conversation around uh, the concepts of equity, what was intended to be achieved here. I would especially like to thank her for uh, positive intent, adhering to our board norms, uh, having very transparent uh, and respectful conversations. So I don't know if you want to make any comments, Director Hansen, before I move into what I believe the intent of what we have up here was. Oh, um, no, you can go ahead. Okay. So before we move into the changes, and again, um, we don't need to necessarily work and wordsmith and replace things. We'll have plenty of time on the 8th to do this. But I had five um, things that I intended to do with this. First thing I'd like to point out is if uh, anyone looks at this, there are very few deletions. There are some clarifications. So that is the red language. In fact, Mr. Blair, if you will scroll down, you'll see that with the exception of some rewording and then the final paragraph concerning the Equity Advisory Council, it pretty much retains the current ADB policy as a starting point for discussion among seven board members. Um, the things that I did in blue to add had five intents, whether I achieved them or not, that's up for this board to determine. But the first was to assume positive intent, keep elements of the original policy, but commit to continuous improvement based on feedback we had. The second intent was to focus on what educational equity should look like in Douglas County. Um, not what people believe it means at the state level, the national level, um, or in a political context, but to truly look at what I believed um, I was hearing from the community and other directors regarding educational equity here in Douglas County. That means uh, de-weaponizing language, but not devaluing intent, incorporating many elements of stakeholder engagement, whether that was language from the survey conducted by Hanover or from conversations with fo focus groups, and made a very explicit attempt to link outcomes and elements of this policy directly to the district's mission and vision. So that was number two. Uh, the third of five is to address concerns with ambiguity and lack of specific language as cited in the stakeholder feedback. Again, Superintendent Kane said when she was the executive of American Academy that the wording in the original policy could lead to multiple interpretations, and I think we saw that represented in uh, the stakeholder feedback. Number four was to provide specific outcomes to be achieved, and again, I tried to borrow language directly from the survey that we can ultimately integrate into our monitoring reports. So as we go forward, an attempt was to insert some language here that we could directly map to future superintendent monitoring reports. And the final one I took from my experience as a, as a consultant over the last decade, there's a little thing that engineers call prevention through design and the principle's pretty simple. When you write policies, when you create equipment, when you write checklists and procedures, the goal is to make it very easy to get right and difficult if not impossible to get wrong. And I believe due to some of the lack of clarity, some of the language, uh, again, as one director, we could make improvements to make sure we uh, get the policy right in implementation and leave no room for misinterpretation or getting the policy wrong. So those were my five um, intentions in the additions. Again, I don't know whether I achieved it. That's up for the board to decide. Um, with that, I'll open it up to any questions or comments from directors. Director Hansen. Yeah. 
thank you. Um, I appreciate your um, clarifying that this was your work and not something that we were able to um, present as a um, collaborative uh, draft. I absolutely chose not to participate in proposing revisions to the equity policy because based on the very process that this board created and agreed to follow over multiple conversations that occurred over a time span of many, many months, I think it was 15 months, um, there are no valid reasons to even be having this discussion or even be reading um, and discussing these uh, revisions that are on the agenda this evening. Um, when Director Peterson asked me to partner with him regarding the equity policy, like our entire community, I was relying on this board's repeated assurances over many, many months, like I said, that any changes, any proposed changes to the equity policy would be grounded in Superintendent Kane's recommendations and feedback from an extensive community engagement process. So when Superintendent Kane announced that she had no recommendations for changes, and the community engagement process indicated that any of the community's concerns or desires were driven entirely by implementation rather than policy language, which we have addressed through ADBR, um, as we just heard extensive information about. Our ability to even have a discussion with a basic level of integrity about possible changes to this policy ended. There really are no options for us as a board, given the process that we created back in January of 2022, and reaffirming that process over the course of, of um, many conversations, we don't have an option. And we owe our community to keep the word, to keep our word, and to follow through with what we told them that we would do. So accordingly, I move that this board affirm the original version of policy ADB, educational equity, which was passed on March 23rd, 2021, with the addition of the following sentence. The superintendent is authorized to develop and enact supporting regulations to further implementation of the policy, which appear in superintendent regulation ADBR. Second. I don't believe we have an actionable item for this. This is only info only, so. I can make the motion. Um, the okay. reading, the first mm -hmm. reading is, you are correct. We cannot vote on the policy that you have submitted as a first reading, but we can absolutely, and we need to vote on affirming the original policy because there, there is no, there's no need to have a first reading because we don't have the authority to do it under the process that you created back in January. Okay, I uh, disagree with that interpretation of the policy. It did not say that we cannot make recommendations or changes to our policy without the superintendent, but I'll entertain the motion if you would please restate it. Yeah, um, the motion is that the board reaffirm the original version of policy ADB, educational equity, which was passed on March 23rd, 2021, with the addition of the following sentence. The superintendent is authorized to develop and enact supporting regulations to further implementation of the policy, which appear in superintendent regulation ADBR. Okay, second. Moved move by Hansen, second by Meek. Discussion by board members before we take a vote. Any discussion or questions from board members? Director Myers. Well, I do have a little bit of, I think I stated it earlier. It's been two years. The purpose of the board is to go over policy. We are now two years later, and granted, I wish that this had been done sooner rather than later. But I think in regards to what's in the community with what's going on, we need to bring together and have some better wording, more input, and I'm in agreement that I, I'm, maybe we can vote, but if we wanted to table it tonight, come back and revisit it when we do, but I think it's up for we need to talk about it. Do you have any recollection of the January meeting in 2022 when the resolution for individual excellence was passed? Yes, I do. So I know as an individual director, I adamantly, 
adamantly said that this policy is the board's work. This is our responsibility. I went through probably 10 different reasons that the policy process that you had proposed in the individual excellence resolution was going to be a problem down the road because we were delegating the work of the board to the superintendent and it was inappropriate. So while part of me <laughs> wants to laugh when I hear you say, this is the board's work because yes, this is the board's work. But I can't laugh because there have been so many people who have been hurt because this board refused to take ownership of the board's work over the last 15 months. I probably agree, except that I do know with the last 15 months that have been going on, we've had other numerous things put on our agenda. And maybe intentionally this was pushed behind us. I don't know if it was by us or by what was going on, but I think that it, I, like I said, I wish we would have addressed sooner than now, but it's something that we need to address and we need to work together on it. I think we heard from Pom public comment tonight, they want to say, I mean, I would assume some of them will just want us to rip it off, but I'm ready to, I want us to work together, but I want input, not just the equity council. The uh, account because I just think that it wasn't inclusive when they went about writing this. Sure, and your policy or your resolution that was passed in January directed the superintendent to provide that input and to an engage and to engage in an extensive community feedback process. Both of those things have happened. Superintendent stood right here in this room and said, "I have no suggested changes to your policy." And the feedback that came back didn't highlight any lines in the policy that are, are problematic or concerning. It's all about implementation. And if we had tackled the policy language at any point along this path, we would be in a different place. But that isn't what happened. What happened is that we as a board told our community over and over and over and over again that we are going to engage in this process. Director Peterson's exact language the night that the um, individual excellence resolution was passed was help us help you point out any gaps and what, what might be creating implementation barriers for you. Director Winnegar mirrored very similar language. We have heard from both our community and our superintendent that there are no implementation barriers that they can clear, that they can easily and readily point out in this policy and based on the assurance that we gave our community that we were going to follow this process, we can't change course at this point. If we change course at this point, we are creating a lot of mistrust within our community and we have bigger issues that require trust to take care of down the road. And you're right, I wish that this had been handled differently many, many steps along the way, but it feels to me, and I can't be the only one who's sitting here watching this, that you created a process with the hope of, of ending at an end result. And when that end result didn't come out to be the way you had hoped it would be, now you're changing the direction of how this whole process is going to work. That doesn't feel good to me, and it won't feel good to our community. Let's avoid ascribing intent to other directors per Robert's rules and our decorum. Uh, Director Myers, just before you do, um, let's make sure you obtain the floor before we just open up to general conversation. So um, before I go back, I'll go to other directors and we can come back. But I'd like to address Director Hansen's uh, concerns around the process that we theoretically set in motion. I'm reading directly from the resolution now that, that you refer to. It says, now, for their, uh, now therefore be it resolved. And I'll skip ahead. Board of, Direction, uh, Board of Education directs the superintendent to recommend potential changes to policy ADB and related implementation consistent with the principles set above. And then it goes on to talk about mission bins. We had a, a superintendent say, I have no specific recommendations. Uh, she did say also that I suggest the board uh, consider the stakeholder and, and focus group input uh, when considering ADB. 
That is exactly what we're doing. This did not direct the superintendent to rewrite policy ADB. That would be completely inappropriate. This is, as we said, a board policy. This is not a special magical policy that we can't touch or amend. We have amended a ton of policies and whether the resolution uh, wound up with the superintendent directing specific, general, or just, hey, look at the feedback you got from stakeholder groups and focus groups and the survey, it is ultimately up to this board at any point to decide to amend, improve, resend, replace, or dispose of any policy that we see fit. That is the proper function of this board. With that, I'll go to Director Meek, who raised her hand. It feels very political right now to be pushing the changes forward the way they're being pushed forward with what has been written unilaterally. And it feels like our most recent polling has said the, the number one concern of our community is we're too political. And so following the line of thinking that Director Hansen was saying, you know, <laughs> Both she and I adamantly opposed the resolution and explained, you know, we need to focus on implementation. But bottom line is the board spoke, right? The board provided a direction and the process that was put in place was that the superintendent was directed to give feedback and gave us multiple presentations on how that would happen and you know, the engagement process that would happen. And here we sit, we have no recommendations from the superintendent or staff. The results of that equity policy was the majority of people are frustrated around it not being implemented. It's the implementation piece. There was no feedback specific to us around language changes. Um, so, and I don't know if we ever got the open-ended responses from Hanover. I think that was something that might be coming in, but I feel like having that level of detail would be helpful before just making language changes. And so it just feels like this is a very political move to make the changes the way it's being pushed forward right now. We just spent several hours tonight walking through how many policies that were drafted based on the original language of the policy. So why would we not ask for a monitoring report? And I know I feel like I'm a broken record, but what we could be doing and should be doing is actually monitoring and seeing what language changes we need to make to be effective. We have no evidence of what those language changes should be to make it more effective. We're just choosing edits to make to the policy. And so I just think we're feeding into our community feeling like we're too political based on actions that the board has taken in the past and how we find ourselves in the position we're in today and now we're going in a new direction on changing the policy. Director Williams. So I have, I mean, I have other things to say, but I have things to say about the revisions you made, which have nothing to do with what Director Hansen. And, and if we may, before you do, yeah. we are we do have a motion right. on the floor. Right. So that's why I'm so, saying. Okay. I, I, Thank you. I, my personal opinion is we should probably vote on what Director Hansen said, and if depending on what happens, I can move forward with my comments. Okay. Is there any other discussion or questions or comments regarding the motion as stated by Director Hansen to reaffirm the current policy with the amendment? Okay, I will take the roll regarding the motion on the floor. Director, um, before I do, just to clarify, an I vote would be to agree to reaffirm the policy as amended, and by intention, that is probably means to disregard any proposed changes or things. Um, so an I vote would be to reaffirm the current policy as written, with no changes, but for the one amended statement that uh, Director Hansen had. And with that, I will take the roll. Director Hansen. 
Um, I'm going to vote aye, but um, while you are each making your decision about how you're going to vote, um, I would just encourage you to really think back to the comments that you have made multiple times that are recorded that anyone can go back and watch. You were very committed to this process and um, changing the um, changing the process right now would really create a problem within our community and it creates a problem for me. So my vote is aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director, Me Director Myers. No. Director Peterson, no. Director Ray is not here. Director Williams. No. Director Weiniger. No. The motion is not passed by a vote of three to three. Any other comments regarding this? I'll, I'll make a comment to um, Director Hansen's uh, suggestion. Uh, I don't believe that the quote process that was set in motion was not fulfilled. We did get recommendations from Superintendent Kane, which was, I have no specific recommendations, but please look at the policy, or the, not the policy, the survey or the feedback when, if you're going to consider ADB. And by that I read, if you're going to make any changes. Um, we did also uh, get the second part to be responsive, which is what are you going to change in implementation? It was very clear. We spent an hour getting briefed on ADBR, and frankly, I as one director find absolutely no problem with ADBR. Is uh, to Director Meek's assertion that we somehow paused implementation of any type of equity policy the policy remains in place to today. Today we have a policy ADB. It is exactly as passed back in March 2021. There was no recension of a policy. If you recall my words back in December of 2021, my initial proposition as one director was repeal and replace. That would have been a complete pausing. That would have been a complete revision, especially if it was repealed and nothing was put in its place. So I do not believe that implementation was paused. I do believe, based on our comments that we heard from multiple people at the podium tonight, we have problems in implementation to this day, whether it's bullying related to equity, whether it's around resourcing, we've heard lots of issues. So uh, again, I will applaud the superintendent and her staff for developing and spending so many hours and weeks and months in putting together what I believe is a very, one opinion, effective step towards proper implementation. Again, it assuaged all my concerns when I voted for this resolution that we passed uh, approximately a year ago. Um, so I'm glad we have some clarity in implementation. Again, implementation, the, what, the how, needs to tie back to the what and the why. It was very clear in our stakeholder engagement and feedback that there are problems uh, with the language in terms of clarity and precision. Again, you don't see anything in this draft that we are looking at tonight that actually changes the policy, but for one thing that I'll get to at the end around the EAC. Um, and the rest of it, for a starting point, remains intact with additions. So um, that is my stance on this, that we absolutely have the authority to go forward as a board and fulfill our duties to continuously improve our policy if it offers clarity to both our staff and the community. Director Williams. So I actually believe we're completely following what we said. We asked for feedback. I believe we got feedback and I believe it is clear that it says that our policy is unclear. And that's why I, and it, and it was all around implementation. That's why I suggested making ADBR a board file because then um, we would be able to acknowledge any implementation, not to say that we would be controlling it, but that it was transparent. Unfortunately, the way that the policy is written, we've had two superintendents over the last year and a half that have interpreted this policy very differently. And without there being a transparent way to inform our public how it is going to be implemented by either making ADBR a board file, I, I, I believe it leaves us no choice but to change ADB and its wording to make sure that we are putting parameters on, on how 
we move forward as a district with this policy. So I'm saving most of my notes to have the conversation on May 8th um, for uh, specific changes that I would like to see. Um, but that that is uh, my opinion about what we should do moving forward. Other directors before I go to Director Meek? Director Weininger. Um, I agree. Um, as Superintendent Kane said in her presentation, I think our goal is to bring our community together. Um, we're not going to make everyone happy, but I think just keeping the policy as is is actually the political method of doing it. I don't think changing it is being political at all because then you're you're not showing that you want to come together with the rest of the community. And yes, the more information group said poll when they did their polling that the most important issue facing Douglas County Schools today is that they viewed us as too political. And then on the Hanover survey, the biggest concerns regarding implementation pol of policy ADB was the politicization of school curriculum and politicization of school environment. So does that mean that the educational, educational equity policy is what's making us too political? I don't know. I think I have a lot of questions I want to discuss at our, um, oh my gosh, yeah, what do you call it, work session. Um, and just like the purpose of this policy, is it achieving its purpose? Um, what is, what are ways where we can make not everyone happy, but ways to make our community feel like we are actually coming together, we're actually trying to represent everyone and achieve our goal of creating this welcoming environment in our school district? Director Meek. Yeah, I think good policy making is when you have the conversations publicly. And I do believe that was requested multiple times to have a work session. I'm glad we are now planning to have a work session on May 8th. So I look forward to that conversation. And I feel like this is premature this evening. It's on the agenda as a first reading. And to me, why would we do a first reading and then go into a work session, which is intended to change the document? Would we then have another first reading later after that and then a second reading? So I would move that we table the first reading of policy ADB, educational equity, um, based on it being premature at this point. Director Myers, uh, we have a motion, hold on, we have a motion from, um, Director Meek to table the first reading may offer, uh, I just want to understand, um, we would then schedule a first reading at the end of our work session to satisfy first reading. Is that is that your intention with tabling tonight? I'm just not yeah. understanding your intention. So my intent would be we would have our conversation on May 8th. At the end of that, I mean, usually there's a lot of wordsmithing and changes, and I don't think, I think we need time to post something afterwards. So, yeah, I hadn't really thought through that, but I just, I, it's really important that we have two readings. And so I, I don't think that meeting would count as a first reading. I think we're creating it, we're discussing yeah, just, it. Just to be clear, and when we're amending a policy, there is not a requirement to have a first and second reading, you know, per, per our current. Um, so if the, the hang up is on semantics of first reading, second reading, because we would be amending a policy, we could just do a first reading and vote if we wanted to, um, allowable by policy. But I get your point. Your point is we're going to have a work session on the 8th. We want to make that, it, it will be open to the public. <laughs> um, we can take any documents or changes or propose things after that and you know, make that available to the public and then whatever we would take forward potentially to a meeting at the end of May, of course, will be posted for public comment, consumption, just like any other attachment. So I, I think yeah. I'm trying to meet your intention, but without getting hung up on the semantics of which is a first reading, which is a second reading. Yeah, I would just encourage us to be very transparent in this process and take our time. So my concern with how this is rolling out so far is that it felt very rushed and not transparent. And so I think taking time to work together, I think our work that we did on the legislative platform, yes, it took a lot of time, but I think it builds trust with the community and I think it's a very helpful process. The original ADB policy 
went through multiple work sessions, multiple readings and iterations. It was a very long intentional process and that was on purpose to give people plenty of time to engage. And so I think if we are going to change language in here, and I always think there's room for improvement, but I think it needs to be done the right way and I think we need to take our time and allow people to engage. Thank you, Director Meek. So are you still wanting a motion or are you withdrawing the motion? Okay, a uh, motion. So my, my motion is to table the first reading of the policy ADB, educational equity policy. Second. If, if I may offer a friendly amendment for clarification of Robert Rules, if we may uh, just put the term rather than table, uh, because I do not want that to be confused with table indefinitely as in never discuss again postpone until? Yeah, so I, I gave that consideration as I was thinking through this. I think when you postpone, it's the intent that the same thing is moving forward. I think, you know, to me it feels like tabling is the more appropriate term, but, you know, postponing the first reading of the policy, it's just we're not doing the first reading on the 8th. We're having a work session on the policy. Yeah, for, for my understanding of table versus postpone, table could mean indefinitely. So I will take a vote on, if you want to keep the wording as motion to table the first reading, that would mean, in my interpretation, to cancel. If you would like to offer a motion that says postpone to a later date, that means that we may still do a first reading at a later date. So. Um, if you want to vote on tabling it, I'm going to take that at a affirmative vote, meaning that we will not do a first reading. Yeah, I mean, we are tabling the first reading of the document in front of us because we're going to have a work session and create a whole new document or slightly different document. Hopefully we'll all come to agreement, right, and come together on edits to be made. So to me, we are tabling this work product. Okay. And, to, and to be clear, if there were an affirmative vote by a majority of the members here, that would not preclude us from reposting this as a starting point for our working meeting. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. As long as, as long as we're all agreeing as a board that if we vote to table the first reading for this evening, we may bring similar or even an identical document forward as a starting point for our work session. I mean, I would be happy to amend it to make it clear that it's being tabled because we have a work session on May 8th on this policy. Like, it's not my intent to make it look like it disappeared. It's right. my intent that it makes no sense to have a first reading on a document that we're then going to spend time revising. Okay. We have a motion by Meek, I believe a second by Hansen. And just before we vote on that, my intention would be to, for transparency, to basically repost this document that you see on the screen as a starting point for our discussions in the working session at the special meeting on May 8th. And then if we are able to, you know, again, no action will be taken at that meeting to vote up or down. If we are able to work on that substantially to bring a document forward for May 8th, which may be a single reading followed by a vote, which is allowable via our policy, just so I have that out there. Um, any other discussion or questions before we vote on the motion uh, to table the first reading for this evening? Okay, with that, I will take the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray is not here. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Okay, we have a approval of six to zero on the motion to table. Any final discussion? This is, now we've tabled the first reading, so I believe we are finished with this item for this evening. Mm -hmm. All right, agreed. All right, we will now move on to item number 41. I believe Mr. Mosher will present which is proposed policy LBD-R-3, charter school waivers of district policy and LBDR-3E, the enclosure of the policy designation chart. And this is a second reading and we will take action as appropriate on this this evening. Um, as a second read, you have the um, 
the proposed board file, LBDR3, superintendent's file, uh, there in front of you. Again, the waiver request process just outlining a systemic um, process for the district that allows for the four separate areas of waiver categories to be clearly identified for the purpose of the Board of Education approving with final say the charter requests um, for waivers. Do you have any questions? Board directors, <laughs> any questions or comments? Uh, this is the second reading from LBDR-3 and the enclosure. <laughs> Director Williams. Can I just make a motion to, to, to accept the proposed policy LBDR-3? As, as it is on the agenda. And friendly motion to accept policy LBD-R-3 and its enclosure, since yes. there are two items. Okay, we have a motion by Williams. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Myers. Any discussion by board members? Seeing none, I will call the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray is absent. Williams? Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. And we will now move to item number 42, Board of Education Reports, President Report. Board of Education special meeting is scheduled for 8 May to continue board work on policy ADB and publicly discuss the Marshall versus DCSD matter and vote on a proposed settlement agreement. Board of Education regular meeting is scheduled for 9 May the following day. Agenda planning for both meetings is scheduled for this Thursday, 27 April at 10 a.m. Um, superintendent uh, state of DCSD briefings yesterday. I was able to, along with Director Myers, attend the first three meetings at three of our high schools. And the uh, state of DCSD focused a lot on um, participation in upcoming potential ballot measures, the state of funding, uh, short-term and long-term initiatives that were considered by the district to try to attract, retain, and support uh, teachers. And I will say there was live polling at the end. And the two questions that I found most interesting were, the first question was, did you active, and this was staff in the room, so educators, other staff members in our feeders. And the first question was, did you actively participate in supporting the bond mill measures uh, last November? And the numbers I saw were roughly 25% said they actively participated. And then the second question that was asked as a follow-up was, do you plan to participate in a bond mill measure if it's put on um, the ballot by the, the board this fall? And the numbers pretty much flipped. The lowest one I saw, I was only at three of the eight meetings but the lowest number I saw was 75% of our uh, staff that committed to active participation, and I believe I saw one number as high as 90. Um, so given the, super, or the uh, fiscal updates that we saw earlier, seeing some of the changes that are coming out in the School Finance Act, it was very encouraging to see all of our staff um, and that, that's everyone, that's union, non-union, licensed, um, certified admin pro tech commit to supporting what is best for the district, which is to support our students by supporting our staff. So I thought that was very good and I thank Superintendent Kane for going to eight consecutive back-to-back -back meetings in one day, uh, which was a, a hell of an effort. With that, I will turn it over to Vice President Williams for item number 43, Vice President items. Um, so we had a parent engagement, or I'm sorry, not parent engagement, community engagement, uh, board connections with business leaders within the community uh, on April 13th. And I, f I feel like we're getting a lot of really great feedback. I look forward to discussing, I'm assuming, at our board retreat, hopefully sometime over the summer. Um, MBEC is preparing for their final presentation that they'll, they'll be presenting at the May 9th meeting. So really looking forward to that. They've put a lot of good work into that. And also just wanna say thank you, Superintendent Kane, for hitting all those schools yesterday. I mean, I went to two and I was going, holy cow, how did she do this all day? So, so anyway, thank you so much. It was really great and it was fun to see um, 
our teachers and staff be so energized by that. So I'm hopeful that that will lead to really great things this, this year. I have, <laughs> I have no updates. Director Myers. Yes, it was great. Oh gosh, what is today? Tuesday, yesterday, and uh, three schools early in the morning. It was just, it was like a tag team, a relay race, going one after the other, and it was uh, very well done. So I was, it was a great morning. And last night, DCY, our Outstanding Youth Awards, always phenomenal, always a tearjerker, having to hear the stories and just knowing the support that these kids have and what it means to them to get something like this. It's, it's a great part of what one of those committees that I love. Director Weininger. Um, just that I'm looking forward to um, a board committee member, staff liaison, um, happy hour appreciation uh, on May 4th. Um, so for, to those of you on our board committees, look out for that invitation and looking forward to seeing you there. Director Meek. Yeah, I just want to thank the superintendent. I think those meetings were really effective and well received. I really appreciated the interactive technology at the end and engaging. It kind of got me thinking, I wonder if we use that with board meetings at times or we use that, that presentation in particular with some of our, our business partners or business chambers, but I wonder if we might even try using that kind of technology at a board meeting to help engage people and have people weigh in with their feedback. So I, I know I was a big advocate when we went out in the last election, you know, interactive technology can really help people come along and understand. And so I, I like that we're trying to tap into that. Okay, with that, um, we have adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. We have motion from Williams. Second. Second from Myers. I will take the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray is absent. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed six to zero. The meeting of the Board of Education is hereby adjourned.